Testing, testing, okay. Good morning, everyone. I know we're just a couple minutes away from starting. I just wanna make sure everybody can hear and see me and see my screen. Um, if you're having any trouble, please just send a message in that chat so that we can make sure everyone's ready to get started right at 9 a.m. We have lots to cover, so I don't wanna hold anyone up. And if you wanna let me know in the chat where you're tuning in from this morning, I always love to see where everyone is listening from. We have about um, 70, 75 people joining us from across the country. Um, I'm broadcasting from North Carolina. Let's see. Hi, Miriam. Got some California. Oh gosh, it's early in California. <laughs> oh man. Kudos to you for being on here at 6 a.m. More California, Maryland. Hi, Amber. Houston, Texas. I've always wanted to visit there. My parents live in Dallas, Texas, but we've never gone anywhere but Dallas. Good. All right. I've got um, 8 a.m. Central. That's 9 a.m. for me. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and roll right into this. Hopefully you guys have seen the schedule. If not, that is included in the handout panel so you can follow along with kind of where we're going throughout the day. So let's jump right in. Skip the slide already. Um, so if you could please stay muted just so there's no background noise. Like I said, we've got um, about 70, 75 people joining throughout the day. And if we all had our mics on, there would be a lot of noise. It would be hard to hear. Um, that being said, we do want to answer all of your questions. So just use the either the raise hand feature. I'll keep that pulled up. And if I see your hand go up, if we have time, I can try to unmute you. Or you can simply put your question in that questions or chat section. And then when I see it, I can answer at a time where it kind of fits into what we're going over. Um, we are going to take breaks throughout the course. This is a super long day. And if you need to step away and kind of regroup outside of those breaks, please feel free. Um, this is a rapid prep course where we are really trying to cram all of those high yield NCLEX topics into two days, which is a big ask. So if you need to step away, regroup, please do so. You are going to receive all of these videos, <clears throat> excuse me, 
after the recording is done so that you can go over this as many times as you need. You also have access to the slides in that handout section. Hopefully some of you have already either pulled that up or printed it out to take notes along the way. So all of this content is ready for you to be reviewed at any time. So if I'm going really quickly, don't worry about it. We're also going to break, break for lunch today. That'll be about uh, 1 to 1.30, but I do aim to try and finish this up a little bit early each time so that we have time for questions and longer breaks. Um, but we'll do our best. We'll see where we go. All righty. Um, so before we jump right in, I figure it's fair for you to know a little bit about me since I'm going to be talking at you for 10 hours today. Um, my name is Morgan. Um, I got my Bachelor's of Science in Nursing at a college here in North Carolina, UNCW. Um, I'm a critical care registered nurse. I love pediatrics. That's really where I um, always want to be. And I've worked on pretty much all different pediatric units throughout my career. Our PICU, we have a pediatric cardiac ICU, NICU, mother baby, the PED section of the emergency department, um, also a bone marrow transplant unit. But I currently work in a children's resource unit at Duke University Hospital here in North Carolina, where I get to go to all of our pediatric departments as a resource to those nurses. So I absolutely love that position. Uh, and fun fact, I got married this year in my backyard because of COVID. Um, so it's been an interesting, interesting year. I know for many of you it has as well. All right. So first off today, we're going to go through fundamentals. And I do have to warn you, the beginning of this morning is very, very heavy. We're going to go through a lot of those high yield concepts very quickly. So like I said, if I'm moving quickly and you need to hear this again, you are going to get the videos and have the slides. OK, so don't worry. And don't worry if you need to step away. Day one is definitely heavier than day two. So just focus on getting through this, keep, keep up with it, and it'll be downhill after here, okay? We're also gonna break for lunch in the middle of this section. We won't get into section two until the afternoon. So hang in there, guys. Okay, let me just make sure there's no questions or issues before we jump into our content. Looks like everyone can hear, okay. Wow, lots of Californias, kudos to you guys. I don't know if I could get up quite this early for all that. Okay, no other messages in the chat. I think we're ready to get started, okay. Fundamentals, our first concept is going through lab values. This section we're gonna hit all you need to know NCLEX number wise. So what I want you to do is save these slides and after today you need to make flashcards with all of these numbers. These are the numbers you just have to commit to memory for the NCLEX. Um, but let's talk about what they mean and why you really do need to know them, yeah? Okay, so first we're going through the numbers for a complete blood count or a CBC. This is the number one test that we run in the hospital. Something like 50% of labs or such is CBCs of some sort. So first up, your H&H, &H, your hemoglobin and your hematocrit. Hemoglobin is that protein in the red blood cells. It transports oxygen and the normal value is significantly higher in males than females. So you do need to know two ranges. Females 12 to 16, males 14 to 18. Low numbers, we're gonna be worried about anemia of some sort. Hematocrit is directly related to hemoglobin. That's the ratio of volume of red blood cells to the total blood. So like the percentage of red blood cells making up all of your blood. Again, slightly higher in males, 42 to 52%, and females, 37 to 47%. So you've got to remember both of those to be able to recognize anemia in different patient populations. All right, then you have your red blood cell count. Very simple, straightforward, the number of red blood cells in that sample. Normal is 4.5 to 5.5 million. And then you have your white blood cells. Again, number of white blood cells present in the blood. Um, low levels indicate that somebody is neutropenic or at risk for infection, maybe a cancer or a bone marrow patient. And then high numbers would be indicative of infection. Um, so normal for WBCs is 5,000 to 10,000. And lastly, we have our platelets, the count of platelets in our blood, those small little cells that help the blood clot. 
If we have low platelets, you're at risk for bleeding, not enough of those cells to clot. High platelets, you're at risk of clotting too much. So normal, 150,000 to 400,000. All right, make flashcards of that. Remember those numbers for your NCLEX. Next, let's look at a metabolic panel and what numbers you need to know there. Lots and lots of numbers on this screen, right? Hopefully you're already pretty familiar, at least with these numbers. Oh, let me get my pointer going here. These numbers over here on the left, your electrolytes, hopefully you're pretty familiar with those from nursing school. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, phosphorus, all of those are incredibly important for tons of vital functions. And we're gonna go over them very thoroughly in fluids and electrolytes. So I'm not gonna read you the numbers off of this slide but you do need to know those normal values. So make sure you put them in your flashcards. Glucose, although not an electrolyte, just sugar, is very, very important when it comes to our metabolism. As you know, it's affected by insulin, it's secreted by the pancreas and by the food we eat. So when you're evaluating this glucose number, you need to know if the patient is fasting or if they've just eaten something really high in carbohydrates. That's really going to affect um, how, what their glucose reading is. But it's very important to know that the normal range is about 70 to 100. Less than 70, we're pretty much always going to consider hypoglycemic unless it's a neonate. Greater than 100, mm, more like greater than 140 or so is, you know, not till we're going to call hyperglycemia, but that is patient dependent. Some of your diabetics may have sugars much higher than that. When we get into the danger zone is greater than 350. Then we have a critical hyperglycemia and are going to start to talk about things like DKA, which of course we'll get into in our endocrine section. So need to memorize those numbers. Next in our metabolic panel is our renal labs, our BUN, creatinine, and glomerular filtration rate, GFR. So what does all of that mean? Well, um, the BUN, the blood urea nitrogen, that's the amount of nitrogen in the blood, exactly what it sounds, right? So nitrogen comes um, from a waste product from something called urea. That's um, made when protein is breaking, broken down, we make urea, and then nitrogen is a waste product from that. The kidneys are supposed to do a really good job of filtering that nitrogen out, but if we have decreased kidney function, they don't, and that level of nitrogen in the blood goes up. So five to 20 is our normal range there. Increased BUNs indicate decreasing kidney function. The exact same thing can be said for creatinine. The level of creatinine in the blood is, um, creatinine is a waste product of the kidneys again, and the kidneys usually get rid of it. But if we don't have good kidney function, it builds up in the blood and we see high levels. So creatinines of 0.6 to 1.2 are what is normal in a healthy adult. And then your GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Um, the glomeruli, I can never say that word right. The glomeruli are those tiny, tiny little filters in the kidney. Um, so the GFR is actually just estimating how much blood goes through those filters every minute. That's why it's a filtration rate. So it can indicate kidney failure when it's getting low and they're not filtering enough blood. It does like change with age. So that's a little bit harder of a lab value to remember, but generally um, we want to see it greater than 60, greater than 60 liters of blood being filtered through those glomeruli every minute. Anything less than 15 is going to indicate renal failure because there's not enough blood being filtered through those glomeruli. All right, those are your kidney labs down here to memorize those numbers. And lastly, over here, we've got some GI labs. All of this is part of your metabolic panel. You'll either run a BMP, a basic metabolic panel, or a CMP, a complete metabolic panel. So these GI labs will start out with total protein right here, 6.2 to 8.2. That's just the total amount of protein in the blood that's made up of albumin and globulins. And it's gonna help, help assess both our nutritional status, our liver and kidney issues. That's a pretty broad lab and alterations can mean many different things. 
albumin is a little bit more specific. We want that number between 3.4 and 5.4, and that's the amount of albumin in the blood. So it's specific protein. Total protein includes albumin. Um, albumin is about 60% of that protein, and we're going to also be assessing nutritional status in liver and kidney issues with this level. Now, bilirubin, you probably remember this more so from your pediatrics class, right? That's a waste product primarily produced by the normal breakdown of heme. Now, what is heme? A component of hemoglobin, which we find in red blood cells. So that hemoglobin is only good for so long. It needs to be broken down, and bilirubin is a byproduct of that. So ultimately, bilirubin is processed by the liver, and that way we can remove it from the body. So when we measure our bilirubin levels, we're just measuring the amount um, that's left in the patient's blood and therefore kind of looking at their liver function, their ability to break down and excrete that bilirubin. Um, there are two types of bilirubin levels, and we'll get into that more when we talk about pediatrics and jaundice, but we have um, conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. So the nuances of that, again, will be discussed later. But in a healthy adult, you want to see a level of bilirubin less than one. We don't want to see bilirubin adding up or building up in the blood. That is indicative of liver failure. That's why our liver failure patients turn yellow when you get jaundiced. Next, we have ammonia. Normal levels here are 15 to 45. Again, that's very simple. It's just measuring the amount of ammonia in the blood. Ammonia is again a waste product, but this is formed from the breakdown of bacteria. That mainly happens in the intestines when we're digesting protein. But if we don't process and clear ammonia appropriately, it accumulates in the blood and high levels, high levels are indicative of liver failure or kidney failure. Um, there are some rare disorders as well that lead to high ammonia levels, but we need to keep a close eye on this because it can really alter the level of consciousness and cause pretty severe behavior changes in your patients when we have elevated ammonia levels. So again, 15 to 45 is what you want to remember for a normal ammonia level. Now, last but not least, we have our liver labs as part of this metabolic panel. Your AST, ALT, and ALP. Um, all of these normal ranges are hard to remember. I know it. You want to remember AST is 10 to 40, ALT 7 to 56, and ALP 40 to 120. For your NCLEX purposes, we don't need to get into the super duper nuances of the difference between your liver labs. But what, what you want to know is when you get all three of these, it's a liver panel. And it's often referred to as liver function tests or LFTs. So that group of tests is done together to evaluate liver disease or damage to the liver. The AST is aminotransferase, and that's an enzyme found on the liver. A few other organs too, particularly the heart and other muscles of the body. So when we have elevated levels of it, we suspect liver disease or damage. ALT is another enzyme found mainly in the liver. That's the best one to test to check for hepatitis. And ALP is an enzyme specifically related to the bile ducts. So elevated levels there can point to um, disease and damage to the bile ducts and bile building up in the body. You don't need to remember the super duper details of them, but you should be able to look at a question that has one of these values and tell if they are elevated or not and know that it's indicative of liver damage. All right, lots of numbers. Remember, you don't have to have them down pat right now, but make flashcards after this course so that you can recognize these normal values. Next, we have our coagulation panel. So just a few to go over here. The normal levels are very, very important. Um, okay, first our APTT, your activated partial thromboplastin time. That tests our intrinsic coagulation cascade. So when you're not on anticoagulants like warfarin or heparin, you want that to be about 30 to 45 seconds. If you're on heparin, you need a therapeutic level, which is gonna be like one and a half to two and a half times normal. And your patient should have a goal for you to know exactly where you're aiming for those levels to be. PT, your prothrombin time is similar, but it's testing your extrinsic coagulation cascade instead of the intrinsic. 
So the normal PT is about 10 to 12 seconds. Again, if you're not anticoagulated. Lastly, your INR, your international normalized ratio, is really what you're going to look at for those patients discharged home on something like um, uh, warfarin or Coumadin. It's just a number that's calculated from the PT test to monitor those anticoagulants that patients are discharged home on. If you're not on anticoagulants, it should be less than one. But if you are on warfarin, your therapeutic INR will be more like two to three. And again, the patient should have a specific goal and regular monitoring to make sure they stay in those ranges. All right, those ones were easy. Next, we're gonna look at cardiac labs. So the main one here is troponins. And I'm sure you've all heard of troponins. It's a group of proteins found in the skeletal and cardiac muscle fibers regulating muscle contraction. So we're testing for the level of this cardiac specific troponin in the blood to help us figure out if there's any injury to the heart. Troponin tests really help us when we're evaluating a patient for a heart attack. Um, because if you've had injury to that muscle, you're having angina, chest pain, ischemia, necrosis to the myocardium. And if it's worsening, we will see elevations in troponin, which make us suspicious um, for a myocardial infarction. The normal level is either zero to 0 0.4. So very, very low. Any elevations uh, indicate damage to the myocardium. There are several types of troponin and we will talk about that in our cardiac lecture. What you basically need to know is that you shouldn't have troponins in your blood tests and if they come back positive, be suspicious for an MI. The other one I wanna briefly talk about is a BNP, a B-type natriuretic peptide. So those peptides are produced in the heart and they're released when the heart senses that it needs to work harder. So for example, when there's fluid retention, the heart senses that as the atria stretch and it says, oh, I need to pump harder to move this fluid forward. And it releases BNP to do that. So this is a great test for congestive heart failure. It helps detect and diagnose that fluid retention and the fact that the heart is working harder. So we see those changes in our CHF patients. Normal BNP levels are gonna be less than 125. So if you have a patient come in and congestive heart failure with increased levels, you're gonna be very suspicious for that severe heart disease, including congestive heart failure. All right, we're gonna move on to one more slide, our lipid panels and our hemoglobin H1C. Our lipid panel, of course, is assessing the risk of developing cardiovascular disease that has to do with the accumulation of different types of cholesterol. So four numbers come back in our lipid panel, your total cholesterol measuring all the different lipoprotein particles in the blood. We would like that to be less than 200. Your HDLs are your high density lipoproteins. So I always was taught H for hero because H is the good cholesterol. Um, HDL takes up the excess cholesterol and carries it away to the liver to get rid of it. So I think of it like Pac-Man. Your bad cholesterol or your LDLs are like the little dots that they're eating up. And your good cholesterol, your HDLs, are the Pac-Man guy coming around and eating it up. So it's getting rid of those LDLs or bad cholesterols. So we actually want this high density lipoprotein level to be high. Um, greater than 60 is a negative risk factor or a good thing. Our LDLs, however, are the bad cholesterol. They deposit extra cholesterol all in your artery walls and blood vessels contributing to that atherosclerosis um, and all of those things that lead to coronary artery disease. We typically want that number less than 100. And lastly, we have our triglycerides. Less than 150 is our goal. That measures all of the triglycerides in the lipoproteins. Usually that's like the very low density lipoproteins or VLDLs. So again, um, total cholesterol less than 200, HDLs greater than 60, LDLs less than 100, and triglycerides less than 150. For your NCLEX purposes, you do need to be able to recognize when these numbers are elevated and the patient is at risk for cardiovascular disease. Last lab test that we will go over in this section is the hemoglobin A1C. 
Hopefully you've learned a little bit about this, but you know that it is a test to help determine your risk for diabetes and to help diagnose prediabetes and diabetes, as well as monitor the treatment in patients who are already diabetic. Diabetics really should have this checked about every three to four months. Um, the hemoglobin H1C or glycosylated hemoglobin is the percentage of hemoglobin in the blood that has a glucose molecule attached. In general, we don't want glucose latched onto our hemoglobin. That's not a good thing. Sugar kills your blood vessels. It's just as bad as fat. So when we have a lot of glycosylated hemoglobin, we're at risk for arterial damage and damage to all of your blood vessels. So by evaluating the percentage of your hemoglobins attached to a glucose molecule, we can measure kind of the efficacy of treatment in a diabetic or how at risk a patient is for diabetes over a long period of time. It's not a test just like a spot check glucose where we see right this second. It shows us over the past three to four, two to three months, two to four months, depending on who you ask. For the NCLEX, I'm gonna say two to three months. Um, and that's because hemoglobin has a lifespan of about two to three months. So it's really showing a bigger picture of how the overall health looks like over the past couple of months, right? So if a non-diabetic, uh, if we do this test in somebody without diabetes, we're hoping for it to be about four to 5.6% of their hemoglobin molecules that are glycosylated. A target level for a diabetic is less than 7%. So when we're monitoring the efficacy of their treatment, we want it to be about less than 7%. Anything greater than 6.5 is a diagnosis of diabetes. And again, diabetics should have this test done every few months. All right, that is all I have on uh, those labs. The last lab we're gonna go over is the infamous arterial blood gas. We need to review how to interpret that because you are going to get NCLEX questions about um, uh, about that. Let me just check to make sure we don't have any questions before we're moving on, guys. It looks like everybody is good. Everybody hearing okay. So far, so good. Feel free to pop anything in that chat. Sometimes it's easier to see in the chat than in the question. Um, just so that you know, check. Good. We've got about 70 people joining us today. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> All right, take a sip of water here. All right, so let's jump in to blood gas interpretation because I know that that is a difficult, um, oh good, now I can see these better. That can be a very difficult, um, good, okay. Couple of people having trouble with the audio, Susanna. Looks like most everyone is hearing okay. Doesn't look like I'm muted over here. And Rochelle, yes, you can use this as the chat box. That's perfectly fine. This is the question section. So I can answer questions either directly to you or address them to a group. And remember, don't be afraid to ask those questions because if you're having a question, somebody else probably is too. And I would love to address it for everybody so we can um, make sure that we're getting you the best review possible. Make sure everybody can hear. All right. Good. Good, good, good. All right, <clears throat> on to ABG interpretation, guys. Um, this is actually one of my favorite things to teach. I always in love inter interpreting ABGs and I have a pretty good method if I do say so myself. So you're gonna learn to get this right every single time from here on out. All right, normal values. You've gotta remember these. Hopefully they've already been drilled into your head. If not, after today they will pH 7.35 to 7.45, bicarbonate 22 to 28, and CO2 35 to 45. 
If you don't know those normal values, you're going to have a lot of trouble interpreting ABGs. So commit these to memories first. The other thing that you have to know before we move on is that bicarb is a base. Remember that with the B, B for base and bicarb. And on the contrary, CO2 is an acid. So more CO2 is going to turn our pH lower and make it more acidic. More bicarb is going to make our pH go higher or more alkalotic. All right. Step one, I'm going to take you through this in the stepwise fashion that I think through every single time. Is this gas compensated or uncompensated? That's the first question you have to ask yourself on the way to figuring out what type of ABG this is. Well, you're going to say, is the pH normal? If it's between 7.35 and 7.45, yes, the pH is normal, okay? Now, are the CO2 and the bicarb normal? Is that bicarb between 22 and 28? Okay, yes. And is the CO2 between 35 and 405? Yeah, it's normal, yes. Okay, well then your whole gas is normal. It doesn't need to be compensated or uncompensated because you do not have an abnormality. You have a normal ABG. And don't let the NCLEX fool you. Sometimes that is the answer, okay? You can have a normal blood gas on the NCLEX. So ask yourself those questions first. Look through those normals. Okay, now if your pH was normal, yes, but you come here and the bicarb and CO2, both or uh, just one, if anything is unnormal, abnormal, no, okay, then you have a compensated blood gas because your pH is in normal range, but something's out of whack with your CO2, your bicarb. You have a compensated gas. On the contrary, if you looked at that pH and it was outside of the normal range, well, automatically you have an uncompensated blood gas because the body hasn't done anything to get the pH back into the normal range. Compensation just means that you have a buffer mechanism putting your gas back into the normal pH limit, even when something is off. So that's how you figure out if it's compensated or uncompensated, step one. And usually people do this at the end when they walk through how to do ABGs. I like doing it at the beginning because I think it's much less convoluted. So that's your step one. Now step two, we have to figure out if this gas is acidotic or alkalotic. Hopefully you guys can already do this. You know the normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything greater than 7.45 is going to indicate an alkalosis, and anything less than 7.35 is going to indicate an acidosis. Okay, well, here's where things get tricky. <clears throat> what if the gas is compensated? We just said uh, if the pH is normal right here, but the bicarb or the CO2 is off, and we have a compensated gas. So how do I know if it's an acidosis or an alkalosis? Well, if the pH is normal and you've determined the gas is compensated, it'll be acidosis if the pH is less than 7.4. So right here in this range, 7.35 to 7.4. And it will be an alkalosis if the pH is greater than 7.4. So right here, 7.4 to 7.5. That's your compensated alkal alkalosis, and that's your compensated acidosis. It's essentially going to be whatever side of the spectrum that it's closest to. Okay, so you've determined if it's compensated or uncompensated, and you know if it's acidotic or alkalotic. Let's look one more time. I have a good slide here to kind of show you the normal numbers and the range here. So we've got normal at 7.4 your normal range 7.35 to 7.45 and this does a good job showing you where you're in that compensated alkalotic stage and compensated acidotic stage and when it moves outside of that normal range less than 7.35 or greater than 7.36 now you're in an acidosis or an alkalosis so save this slide make a flashcard with these numbers because those are key to being able to quickly interpret your blood gases. Okay, now you know, compensated or uncompensated, alkalosis or acidosis. So step three, we have to figure out, is this metabolic or respiratory in origin? How did, how did this person get into an acidosis or an alkalosis? Well, you're going to look at the bicarb and the CO2. So remember, CO2 is an acid, 
B -b bicarb is a b -b base, B for base, B for bicarb. So if we get more and more CO2, and remember the normal range, 35 to 45, we're getting more and more acid, too much acid leads us to an acidosis. If we have less than 35 for our CO2, we don't have enough acid and we'll become alkalotic. We're going the opposite way. So more CO2, more acidotic. Less CO2, less acidotic. It'll be the same for bicarb, which is a base. 22 to 26 is our normal range. So anything greater than 26, too much bicarb, too much base, and we're becoming alkalotic. If we have less than 22, we have not enough base, and we're becoming less alkalotic. We're going the other way towards acidosis. So you've got to look at those numbers for bicarb and CO2 to figure out if this is metabolic or respiratory in origin. All right, we've got to put it all together now. Step one, you figured out if it's compensated or uncompensated by looking at the pH and then the bicarb and the CO2 to figure out if anything is out of range. Next, you've looked at the pH to figure out if it's alkalotic or acidotic. And you know that if your gas is compensated, which way it leans shows you if it's alkalotic or acidotic in origin. And lastly, you've evaluated your bicarb and your CO2 to figure out if it is metabolic or respiratory in origin. Okay, that's my three-step method for interpreting ABGs. Let's practice it all together. Here's your patient. They have the following ABG values, a pH of 7.58, a CO2 of seven, uh, a CO2 of 41, and a bicarb of 38. Tell me what their blood gas is: compensated or uncompensated, acidosis or alkalosis, and metabolic or respiratory in origin. Type your answers into that chat so I can see when you've got it, and we'll review it all together. Good job, guys. Awesome, Rochelle. Good job, Emily, Jan. Fantastic. Yes. All right. You guys are awesome at this. You've already become experts. This is an uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. So step one, we looked at that pH. It was, I've got the wrong values up here. It was 7.58. That's out of normal range, so it's uncompensated. Awesome. Step two, you asked yourself, is this alkalosis or acidosis? Well, the pH was higher than 7.45. So yes, it was alkalosis. Now we just have to figure out if it's metabolic or respiratory in origin. And we see that there's a high amount of bicarb. The bicarb was 38 which is way greater than our normal of 22 to 28. So a high amount of bicarb, a high amount of base, that's alkalotic and our bicarb correlates with metabolic. Bicarb metabolic, CO2 respiratory. And that makes sense, right? Bicarb is produced by the kidneys, CO2 is exhaled by the lungs. So you can follow that. All right, so putting it together, we've got that uncompensated metabolic alkalosis. You guys knocked that one out of the park. Let's try another one together. Here's your normal, here's your values, pH 7.36, CO2 69, bicarb 37. Let me know when you've got it. Type it, type it in our chat. Let us know what the answer is. We'll review this one together. This is our last practice one before we move into our fluid and electrolytes. Great job, Susanna, yes. <clears throat> these are on the harder end of what you're gonna see on the NCLEX. So if you can do these, you're gonna ace this part of your NCLEX, guys. <clears throat> Yes, Emily, awesome. All right, you guys got it. 
So this was a uh, compensated respiratory acidosis. First thing you did was you looked at the pH, the pH of 7.36. Well, that was normal. So then you asked yourself, what about the CO2 and the bicarb? CO2 of 69, whew, super high. Bicarb of 37, also super high. So you know something is out of whack here. Um, so that's compensated. That's a compensated blood gas. Those ones are the hardest to figure out. So kudos to all of you guys that got that one. Number two, you asked yourself, is this acidosis or alkalosis? That pH of 7.36 is in the normal range, but which way does it lean? It leans more towards the acidotic side. So you know it's a compensated acidosis. And now all you have to do is step three, figure out if it's metabolic or respiratory in origin. So you look at the CO2 and the bicarb and they're both off. 69 is way too high for a CO2 and 37 is way too high for a bicarb. So how are you supposed to know where this is coming from, right? Well, we already established that this is an acidosis. CO2 is an acid and bicarb is a base. So CO2 is what's causing this acidosis. That's what correlates with what our problem is. That tells us this is a respiratory acidosis. And do you guys know why the bicarb is also high? It's because it's trying to compensate it. Yes, good. It's because the bicarb is a buffer and that base is trying to compensate for the high amount of CO2, the high amount of acid to bring our pH back into normal limits. So that's exactly why we have a compensated gas. If our bicarb was still normal, this pH would be way lower. It would be way more acidotic and we would have an uncompensated respiratory acidosis because the bicarb has kicked up production, the kidneys are trying to buffer these acidic CO2 from the blood, we've brought our pH back into a normal limit with that high amount of bicarb. So that's, that's why. Um, and it's confusing to figure out, I know, but you guys did an awesome job. All of you who answered in that chat got that right for your compensated respiratory acidosis. And I'm telling you that if you can do this one, you're gonna ace the NCLEX when it comes to these ABG questions. And they do ask a lot of them. So make sure you review this section and are comfortable before moving on from this topic. Okay, guys, so I've got 840 over here. We are gonna take five minutes to break, recoup really quick before we move on to our fluids and electrolytes. That's gonna be a pretty long and fast section. So I want you to take a sip of water, use the bathroom, and get ready to go back in. Let's see, 840, let's be back at 845 so that we can dive into fluid and electrolytes in our next section. I'll stay on here in case you guys have questions in the chat, just go ahead and let me know. Otherwise, enjoy your break. I'll see you back in five.
All right, everyone. Let's jump back in. I tried to answer everyone who had a question. Um, let me just review a couple of things. Um, so a lot of you are saying you can't see the chat. So where you guys are putting your questions is like a private message to me um, so that I can see your question and address it to the group. Um, and I can either type you back a message or answer it out loud here. So um, that's why you can't see can't see the chat. They're private so that if you wanted to ask me something, you could and not the whole group would see it. Um, so that was a common question. You can like send a message to the whole group. That's in a different little um, panel over on the GoToWebinar. If you it says chat, if you pull that down, you'll see where it says type message here. And um, you can say to all entire audience, volume not working. Hmm. The volume's still not working, everyone. Says that it's working. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm definitely not like a tech genius. So if something goes wrong, you guys do have to tell me. Excellent. Thank you guys. Um So, okay, so where is the chat box? So for me, when I see my GoToWebinar panel on the right, I have different little pull down options, dashboard, polls, handouts, and then the last option, yeah, the last option says chat. Um, so that is where you can send a message to the entire group. But where you guys are putting questions right now is perfectly fine. They come straight to me. I can see them all. I can type you back a response or just answer it out loud here because a lot of you have the same questions. So that's perfectly fine. Um, so that's that. And then we a lot of you are asking where the handouts are and about the recording. So the recording is gonna be sent to you guys when the whole class is completed. So after today and tomorrow is finished, you guys are gonna get all of this audio so you can watch it as many times as you want. So at the, like at the beginning, I said, we're gonna go really fast through a lot of this stuff. If there's a concept that's tough for you or you just need more review, don't worry because you are gonna be able to listen to this as many times as you would like. You also have the, um, handouts available to you to print, to save on your computer, to read as you listen to this now or in the future. So that's in the little handout section. If you pull down over there, you actually have four things. You have the syllabus, the schedule, the handout, and then you have a cumulative NCLEX test, which we're gonna do tomorrow at the very, very end of the day. So all of that is available to you at any time. So if you do need to step away, if you miss something, don't worry. You're going to get the video recording and you've got that slides. So I'm seeing a lot of you say maybe you guys don't all have the chat box. Don't don't worry too much about that, because remember, you can use this questions box. They're going to come straight to me. I'll address it to the group or type you back an answer. I promise I'm going to answer everything as long as I can keep up with all of you guys. Um, so I think that addresses um, everything that we were talking about. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we are going to move on. We're jumping right into fluids and electrolytes. This is a and same time, same scale, same clothes. And we're going to give them some IV fluids because they need some fluid resuscitation. But what type of IV fluid is going to depend on the type of a dehydration, the type of fluid volume deficit. I'm going to very briefly go over this, but hang with me because our next slides are going to break down each type of IV fluid. If we're isotonically dehydrated, meaning we've lost the same amount of water as we have solutes, we're just going to give isotonic IV fluid, normal saline, LR. If we're hypotonically dehydrated, we need to give hypertonic IV fluid. So we need to give fluid packed with particles to replace those really hypotonically dehydrated uh, people and help 
pull some water out of their swollen cells. So that's going to be D5 normal, um, D5 half normal, anything that has more solute than water. If we're hypertonically dehydrated, we've lost more water than solutes, we have lots of solutes in the blood already, we're going to give a hypotonic IV fluid, like half normal saline, with more water than solutes to help move the water into those shriveled up cells. All right. I know that's really, really confusing, and that's why we're going to break it down. IV fluids. You need to know the types. You need to know when to use them. So let's talk about what this whole isotonic, hypotonic shindig actually means. Embarrassingly to admit, it took me a long time as a new grad nurse to really figure this out. I don't know why it was like such a hard concept for me, but I just didn't understand what isotonic meant. Straightforward, isotonic means that your IV fluid has a similar osmolarity to the blood. Remember, osmolarity is measuring how many particles are in there, how many solutes are in that fluid. So when you give an IV fluid with a similar amount of particles, we're not causing any shifting. That fluid is going to go into the vascular space and stay in the vascular space. The fluids you need to remember that are isotonic, normal saline, LR. I, when I work in the emergency department, this is all we use. We don't even mess with hypotonic or hypertonic fluids. ICU nurses mess a lot more with that type of stuff. But when you need to fluid resuscitate somebody quickly, normal saline or LR is what you, what you want to do. And do remember that normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. That's sodium and chloride in it. All right. So what do we use isotonic fluid for? Increasing the vascular volume, blood loss, surgery, isotonic dehydrations, fluid losses, maintenance fluids, patients that are NPO and just need some extra hydration. If we don't want fluid to shift, we use isotonic fluids. Hypotonic IV fluids, on the other hand, have a lower osmolarity than our blood does. So when we give a hypotonic IV fluid, fluid is going to move out of the vessels into the cells and interstitial spaces. Remember, it's from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if we put um, iso a hypotonic IV fluid in the blood, it's got that low osmolarity, and it's going to move flood blood out of those vessels into the cells to balance out that osmolarity. So we give hypotonic IV fluids when we want that fluid shift to happen. The hypotonic IV fluid I want you to remember is half normal saline. But remember, anything less than that, quarter normal saline, third normal saline, all of that, that's also going to be hypotonic. Nine times out of 10, I would say the NCLEX questions use half normal saline as their hypotonic IV fluid. So remember that one. What do we use it for? Remember, we want to pull fluid out. So it's all of those diseases that have uh, high um packed with particles in the vascular space. So DKA, HHNS, hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome, and hypernatremia. In all of these diseases, the vascular space is packed with particles, lots and lots of solutes in there. So you need to fill it up with hypotonic to help shift some of that out of there, right? On the flip side, let's look at our hypertonic IV fluids. This is a little more common to use than our hypotonic. This IV fluid has a high osmolarity compared to the blood. So this fluid is packed with particles, and it's actually going to pull fluid out of the cells and interstitial spaces into the blood vessels. What is HHNS, Optawana? We are going to review that in our endocrine module, okay? So hang on, hang out till tomorrow, and we will go over that. Um, so when we have those uh, fluids that are just packed with particles, it's actually going to fill your vascular space with more particles than with fluid and help pull fluid out of the cells. So your classic example of a hypertonic fluid is 3% sodium chloride. But remember, anything greater than 0.9%, which is your normal saline, is going to be considered hypertonic. Sometimes when we're giving hypertonic to a patient, this 3% sodium chloride, we just call it hypertonic. Uh, so 3% uh, sodium chloride is what I want you to associate with hypertonic IV fluids. When do we use it? When we want to pull water out of the cells. 
hyponatremia, and cerebral edema. Cerebral edema is the main use for hypertonic fluids in the ICU because we have that swelling up of cells in the brain. We need to decompress. So we give some hypertonic fluid to pull fluid out of the cells and relieve some of that pressure. All right. That's all we've got for fluids, guys. We're bouncing right into electrolytes because this is a long topic and it's really going to help pull all of that information about the fluids together. And I will tell you, we are going through the hardest electrolytes first so that um, we can finish on the downslope, right? So we're going to go over sodium, potassium, and calcium. Those are going to be your really big three that I want you to focus on, and they have a lot to talk about. Um, so I'll give you just one second. Take a sip of water. Um, okay. okay, excellent. Starting off with sodium, we're first going to go, oh, let me answer one question first. Can you give isotonic to hypertonic? or DHN, oh, dehydration. Can you give isotonic to, uh, yes. Okay, so Rochelle asked if you can give isotonic fluid to a hypertonic dehydrated or a hypotonic dehydrated patient, or does it have to be the hypo or the hypertonic fluid like we discussed? That's a very good question, Rochelle. If in the emergency department, if somebody comes in severely dehydrated in shock, we will absolutely start isotonic fluid. You're not going to harm your patient by doing that. Once they're transferred to the ICU, they will likely be switched to the appropriate osmolarity of fluid to shift fluid either in or out of the cells as appropriate so that that therapy is more effective. But you can give them isotonic fluid that won't harm them. Great question, Rochelle. Okay, excellent. Let's jump right into sodium. This is probably eh, competing with potassium as the number one electrolyte that I want you to remember. Hyponatremia, low sodium level in the blood. Uh, talking about sodium itself, it's the most abundant extracellular cation. It's regulating water in the cells of the body. Water follows sodium. If there's anything I want you to remember about sodium, it's that water follows sodium very important in the brain, the nerves, and the muscle cells. So super big implications when sodium is out of whack anywhere. Lab values for sodium, normal 135 to 145. We already went over these in the lab value section, but just to drive home, these are ones that you are not going to get away with not remembering on the NCLEX. You've got to know your electrolyte values. Anything less than 135, hyponatremic. So just like when we talked about um, dehydration being isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic, the same thing happens with sodium because sodium and fluid are so interrelated. We have to talk about how we got to that point so that you understand what caused the hyponatremia. With euvolemic hyponatremia, you're losing both. You're going to have, well, you're not losing both. The water in the body increases. The sodium level stays the same. So you're kind of diluting out that sodium a smidgen. Causes of euvolemic hyponatremia. The important thing to know about euvolemic, what that prefix means, though, is that the amount of fluid in the body is normal. Anytime you see the prefix eu, that means like same or normal. We want to be euvolemic. We want it to be eunatremic. So we're euvolemic, normal level of fluid, but we're hyponatremic, low sodium. And it's actually happening due to an increase in water, but no subsequent increase in sodium. So it's dilutional. Causes SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, polydipsia, or excessive administration of those hypotonic IV fluids. Any of those things can cause an increase in water, same level of sodium, and therefore a dilutional euvolemic hyponatremia. Now, what about a hypovolemic hyponatremia? How can we get to that? That means that we're losing both of them. We're hypovolemic, low volume, and hyponatremic, low sodium. We're losing water and sodium. So these are going to be your typical causes, vomiting, diarrhea, and G-tube suction, 
diuretics, burn, excessive sweating. You have to be sweating a whole lot to lose enough water and sodium to become hyponatremic. But those are different causes where you lose fluid and you lose sodium, causing a hypovolemic hyponatremia. So lastly, hypervolemic hyponatremia is where the water in the body increases substantially to the point where we have a hypervolemic state. And that substantially dilutes out the amount of sodium in the body, in the, in the serum, which causes that dilutional or relatively hyponatremia. So it's very similar to that euvolemic hyponatremia, but in euvolemic hyponatremia, you haven't lost enough water to become hyper, hypervolemic. Um, in the hypervolemic, your body is actually increasing in so much water that you are in a hypervolemic state. You're in fluid volume excess, which has diluted out your sodium. Many, many causes of this hypervolemic hyponatremia. This is actually one of the most common types of hyponatremia that we see. Congestive heart failure, where you get a lot of fluid retention. Kidney failure, nephrotic syndrome, and liver failure all cause lots and lots of fluid buildup in the body, diluting out the sodium. Water intoxication or freshwater submersion or psychogenic polydipsia, all of those are large increases in the amount of water that goes into the body without adding any sodium into the body. So we become hypervolemic, we dilute out the sodium and have a dilutional hyponatremia. We can also do that by administering too many hypotonic fluids. If we don't give them enough solutes with their fluids, they can become hypervolemic and hyponatremic. So what are these patients gonna look for when we see hyponatremia? It will depend on how they became hyponatremic, but there's one thing in common that's an absolute NCLEX buzzword that you've got to know. Remember I said sodium was very important to the brain? Very low sodium levels put patients at risk for seizures. You've got to know that. Sodium, seizures, specifically low sodium. And that's not gonna be until you have sodium levels less than about 120, 125. So with severely hyponatremic patients, but you have to know to watch these patients carefully and put them on seizure precautions. They will have other neurological symptoms as well. Confusion, lethargy, stupor. They might have some cerebral edema and swelling, which increases their intracranial pressure, causing a lot of these neurological symptoms. So neuro is the main system that you're going to be assessing with hyponatremia. With the cardiovascular system, your signs and symptoms will depend on if it is a hypo or hypervolemic hyponatremia. If they're low, you'll see those symptoms of fluid volume deficit, a weak pulse, hypotension, tachycardia to try and compensate, and they might feel dizzy. With hypervolemia, you'll see more of the fluid volume excess signs, bounding pulses and hypertension. I mentioned that sodium is also very important to the nerves and muscles. So with musculoskeletal, you'll have some abdominal cramping, weakness. That weakness extends into the diaphragm and causes shallow respirations. You also see decreased deep tendon reflexes, muscle spasms, and you can experience some orthostatic hypotension. So as they go from lying to sitting to standing, they can have some really quick precipitous blood pressure drops. Lastly, for GIGU, remember you have some involuntary muscle in your GI tract. You're going to have some hyperactive bowel sounds going along with those abdominal cramping. Typically, they lose their appetite and decrease their urine output. The body recognizes that they're low on sodium, and they're kind of trying to hold on to all of that. So it's decreasing their urine output, which will also, of course, affect their fluid status. Sodium is so intertwined with fluid. Where, where sodium goes, water follows. So what do we need to do for these patients? Our treatment for hyponatremia totally 100% depends on their volume status. And we have to know their volume status to select the appropriate treatment. If they're hypovolemic and hyponatremic, they need volume and they need solutes. You got to restore them both. 
So just for mild, you know, maybe the sodium is like in the low 130s, we might just give them some isotonic fluid because remember 0.9% sodium chloride has sodium in it. If it's severe, they're very hypovolemic, very hyponatremic at risk for seizures. This would be a case where we would administer hypertonic, that 3% normal saline that we talked about. If they're hypervolemic though, we don't want to be giving them a whole lot more fluid. They're already fluid overloaded. They have a bounding pulse, the high blood pressure. So we actually really want to restrict their free water intake. Remember the reason that their sodium is low is that all of that free water is diluting it out. So we just don't want them to have any more free water intake. They're going to be on a fluid restriction. We will probably administer some osmotic diuretics to help get some of that fluid off without getting rid of too many solutes. And we're going to want them to avoid any high salt foods because remember water follows sodium. They eat a bunch of salt, water is going to follow. They're going to become more hypervolemic. So with this case, you're really looking at more how to get rid of fluid so that we're not diluting their sodium out so much and they can have a unitremic and euvolemic state. Now, lastly, if we have somebody in euvolemic hyponatremia, they've already got an appropriate fluid balance, we're probably going to do a little bit of both. We'll restrict free water. We might give them some sodium, maybe some sodium tablets, encourage them to eat high salt foods, not hard to do. Um, we can even give IV sodium supplements if we have to. These two medications are given to help with um, the, so the kidneys hanging on to more sodium in severe cases, but we don't want to give them tons and tons of fluid that contains sodium because they're already euvolemic. So we want to kind of do what we can to keep them in the volume state where they are and give them some sodium back. So mostly enteral sodium supplements will do. But as you can see, assessing the volume status is absolutely crucial because it's going to determine what your treatment is for the hyponatremia and kind of tell us why they became hyponatremic. By knowing the type, you will know the appropriate treatment intervention. I do just want to spend a couple minutes, though, talking about replacing sodium when we have to do it. You have got to replace your serum sodium slowly. Remember that I said when you're severely hyponatremic, you're at risk for seizures. Well, if you change the sodium level too quickly, you are also going to be at risk for seizures and serious neurological complications. So we don't want to raise the sodium by more than 0.5 milliequivalents per hour. That means if you have somebody severely hyponatremic, they're going to be in the ICU for a little while to slowly get that sodium back into normal range. When you change it too fast, it causes major fluid shifts because remember, sodium, water follows sodium. So if I take a sodium of 120, give them tons and tons of IV replacement, and all of a sudden their sodium is up to a normal 135, water is going to follow that and we're going to get edema. We're specifically worried about cerebral edema because if we pull all that water into the cells with that rapid fluid shift, our brain cells are going to swell. We get that cerebral edema, it increases our intracranial pressure, and we're at risk for lots of neurological complications. One of the big ones is this central pointine myelinolysis. You don't need to know everything about that disease. That's a really specific complication. But something that NCLEX likes to ask about is monitoring for numbness in weakness in the feet. That's because CPM causes ascending numbness and weakness. It starts in the feet and starts going up. So you want to monitor for that when you're replacing sodium to make sure it's not going up too quickly. And if your patient has sodium uh, go up quickly and they start to have numbness and weakness in the feet, you need to recheck a sodium level and make sure it's not rising too quickly and that you're not causing cerebral edema and increased ICP. We don't want to cause these complications. They're completely, completely preventable. So other nursing interventions to talk about in general for hyponatremia, ways to increase the oral sodium intake. Like I said, so not hard for most people. Bacon, butter, anything processed or in a can is high in sodium. 
cheese, again, anything processed, cheese, hot dogs, lunch meat, and plain old table salt. They can, you know, just add that on top of their normal meal, and that's going to help them increase in sodium very quickly. We can also give them tablets of sodium, and if your patient is also on lithium, one of the important things to know is that sodium levels affect lithium medication levels. That's because lithium is a very fluid dependent drug. So if we're hyponatremic, we can have either decreased or increased levels of lithium. So if your patient is dependent on lithium as a mood stabilizer, you do need to monitor that while they're while you're replacing their sodium. And like I said, monitor their neurological status. Neuro is your buzz word for sodium, specifically hyponatremia. We are at risk for seizures and you need to put them on those seizure precautions and monitor them very, very closely. All right, we're gonna do our first NCLEX practice questions. These are gonna be throughout the course when we get to important topics to do them together before we get to our cumulative test tomorrow. So here's your first question. I'm gonna let you read it, give you about two minutes. Um, if you would like to put what your answer is in the um, questions box so that I can see it, that would be great. Um, and then once I've gotten a few answers, I'll review the correct answer and why it was correct with everybody. Awesome job, Sally. That's correct. Yep, Golda. Good job, Susanna. Awesome. All right, guys. So A and B were your correct answers here. And this is how we're going to do NCLEX practice questions throughout the course. I like to go through every single answer choice so that you know why it was correct or why it was incorrect. I can't tell you how many times in nursing school our instructor gave us the right answer and I didn't understand it because they didn't review why the incorrect answers were incorrect. So at Archer Review, we will always go through every single answer choice and this is exactly how our test bank works, which you all have access to. So for this question, A and B were correct, confusion and abdominal cramps. First things first, you have to be able to look at that sodium level of 122 and know that it's hyponatremic. It's less than 135. And you know it's less than 125 even, so it's quite severe hyponatremia. Confusion is a very common neurological symptom of that severe hyponatremia because it plays such an important role in the brain and low levels are devastating. They, pro they produce symptoms ranging from confusion lethargy, stupor, seizures, all because of that cerebral edema. So good job. I think everyone put A as a correct answer. B was also a correct answer. Almost all of you did pick B. Abdominal cramps is another symptom of hyponatremia. Water follows sodium, and when there are decreased levels of sodium in the blood, there often is also decreased fluid. If they're in that fluid volume deficit with decreased urine output and muscle spasms, they're having those abdominal cramps. They typically have abdominal cramps even if they're in a hypervolemic hyponatremia. The GI system does not appreciate low levels of sodium. So good job to everyone. Um, now moving on to C. A couple of people did pick C, but that was um, incorrect. C was increased urine output, which is not a sign of hyponatremia decreased urine output would be a symptom. So that's because of the relationship, again, between sodium and water. When there's decreased levels of sodium, less water is pulled into the extracellular space and the intravascular volume is decreased, causing decreased renal blood flow and decreased urine output. Low sodium, urine, the kidneys are holding on, not gonna be putting out as much urine output. And then for D, I don't think anyone picked that. D was also an incorrect answer. Hype o, bowel sound, hype o active bowel sounds, not a sign of hyponatremia. You would be more likely to have hype or active bowel sounds. And that kind of makes sense with the abdominal cramping, right? 
um, with those low levels of sodium. Sodium plays a very important role in those muscle cells, both the involuntary and voluntary muscle cells, so causing cramps, hyperactive bowel sounds, spasms. Remember, the GI system just really does not love low sodium levels. So that is why D was incorrect. All right, so we're going to do one of these questions for every single electrolyte imbalance because this is just such a huge, huge topic on the NCLEX. Um, when we talk about electrolyte We are talking about the sodium in the extracellular fluid when we talk about this. Um, actually, excellent question, Rochelle. Um, so anytime I talk about an electrolyte level, and I will get into this a little more with potassium, all of these levels are extracellular levels. They're the levels in the vascular space. We're not talking about the levels in the cell. Very good question. Okay, so we've got 930. Awesome job. Okay, we're going to keep on trucking through hypernatremia. We've got a little bit further. It's time for a break. So hypernatremia, high level of sodium in the blood. And that level is going to be 135 to 145 again. So remember, greater than 145, we've got hypernatremia. And it's going to be very similar to what we talked about with hyponatremia in the way that it is caused. We can have hypervolemic, hypovolemic, or euvolemic. So let's go through each one. You are, you're starting to get this concept down now. In a hypervolemic, hypernatremia, our sodium gains are greater than our water gains. So we're gaining both, right, because we're hypervolemic, but we're gaining more sodium than we are water. And what causes that? Administration of hypertonic fluid, like 3%, giving administration of too much sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarb is primarily sodium. Increasing your sodium intake, corticosteroids, Cushing's, hyperaldosteronism, and cons. Those are all endocrine um, disorders that we will talk about tomorrow in our endocrine lecture, and they can cause hypernatremia and insufficient free water with our enteral tube feeds. If somebody's dependent on enteral tube feeds, those are rich in sodium, and we have to remember to give them some free water as well, or they will become hypernatremic. So on the other side, we have hypovolemic hypernatremia, where we're losing more water. Our water deficit is greater than our sodium deficit, though. So we lose water, we become hypovolemic, um, we, um, because we're hypovolemic, our sodium has a higher concentration in the blood um, so that we're hypernatremic even though we have a low um, fluid balance where our, our fluid volume deficits. So this can just be due to dehydration. Maybe our patient is NPO and unable to eat. They're having vomiting and diarrhea output from their fistulas. Maybe we've given them too many osmotic diuretics or they're having post-obstructive diuresis. For any of these things, we're having a huge loss of fluid that leads to a relative increase in the amount of sodium in the blood. So that water deficit is greater than the sodium deficit. They can become hypovolemic and the amount of sodium is relatively greater in the blood. Now, lastly, with euvolemic hypo, hypernatremia, we lose both fluid, uh, we, well, we don't necessarily lose fluid. We've got a normal amount of fluid, but a high amount of sodium. So that could be due just to insensible water losses. Like when somebody hyperventilates and they're exhaling, exhaling, you actually lose fluid as you exhale and you blow off um, some water, but not enough to change your volume status but you do um, change how much sodium you have so that you get a little bit, little bit hypernatremic. Your sodium becomes a little more concentrated. DI, both central and nephrogenous diabetes insipidus, can also both cause a euvolemic hypernatremia where our volume status stays the same, but our, hyper, but our sodium level goes up, causing that hypernatremia. And we will talk about DI in our endocrine lecture tomorrow. So we'll get a little bit more into the electrolyte imbalances of DI there. It's a very interesting disorder. So those are your three different causes of your hypernatremia. 
Assessment wise, like always, assessment type findings do depend on the type of hypernatremia, which is why volume status is so incredibly important. Again, though, neuro will be your main system for sodium imbalances. They might be restless, agitated, ranging to lethargic, drowsy, in a stupor, or even comatose if it gets so severe and goes untreated. Musculoskeletal, again, twitching, cramps, weakness. CV, it's really going to depend on the type, the volume status, their blood pressure up or down, their pulse is weak or bounding, depending if it's hyper or hypovolemic. Other symptoms, the kind of miscellaneous, they tend to have flushed skin, a decreased urine output, and a dry mouth. They're, they're really shriveled up because they're so high in sodium. So if just think about how you would feel, you know, after a whole day on the beach where you've got a lot of salt water in you and you're just hot and sweaty. Maybe you're kind of fluid volume deficit. You haven't been drinking enough, flushed not peeing enough, just feeling dry is generally what we think of for a hypernatremia. Treatment wise, again, it is 100% dependent on the type of hypernatremia that you have. If you're hypervolemic, you want to find the causative agent and discontinue it. Are you giving 3%? Do they have too many steroids on board? Uh, what's going on? What do you need to stop? so that we're not giving them so much fluid and so much sodium. You can administer loop diuretics to help get some of that off, and you can administer free water to try and dilute some of that sodium out. If they're hypovolemic, you actually will give them some isotonic fluid because that isotonic fluid will be relatively hypotonic to their body. Their body is hypernatremic, so it has a higher osmolarity right now, and just giving isotonic fluid will help balance that out and correct the fluid volume deficit. If they're euvolemic, you don't wanna mess with their fluid status too much. You might give them some free water based on their free water deficit. In general, if they're euvolemic, PO intake will be encouraged. Um, you don't really wanna do IV fluids in a patient that's already euvolemic. So just giving them some free water to dilute out that hypernatremia should correct the imbalance. As always, monitoring the neuro status is of the utmost importance. You need to correct the imbalance very slowly, like we discussed, to negate that risk for cerebral edema. All right, here is your hypernatremia NCLEX question. Awesome job, guys. Uh -huh. Very good, very good. A and B, lethargy and dry mucous membranes. So sodium super important in the brain, super, super important for neurological status. So first thing, you gotta look at the question. You see 152 and you know they're hypernatremic. So you know they're at risk for those level of consciousness changes, and that's why A was correct. B, again, you know they're hypernatremic. You know that water follows sodium. So with increased level of sodium in that extracellular space, water is leaving the cells, following sodium, and causing the dry mouth and dry mucous membranes. C and D were both incorrect for C, tachypnea, and increased respiratory rate. We don't see that with hypernatremia. It is very important in the brain and water balance, but the major things you're looking at are neuro, not respiratory. For D, cyanosis, once again, there are some cardiovascular signs and symptoms depending on the fluid status, weak or bounding pulses, hypo or hypertension, but they should not cause cyanosis. That's gonna be due to oxygen changes, which is not something we expect with sodium. Okay, next up is potassium, arguably one of the most important electrolytes. So let's talk about hyperkalemia first. Hyperkalemia, high potassium in the blood. Potassium is found mostly inside of the cells. It's the most abundant intracellular cation. 
Um, so that's from that question, Rochelle, she asked when we were talking about electrolytes, are you talking about extracellular or intracellular? Well, with potassium, almost all the potassium is inside of the cells. But what we measure is actually the serum level, which is outside of the cells. So we're not measuring the vast majority of it. But all of our electrolyte values that we report are serum levels. Potassium is responsible for nerve impulse conduction. It's very important for muscle contraction, both the heart muscle and the skeletal muscle. And it plays a huge role in the acid base balance. When we become acidotic, we typically associate that with hyperkalemia and vice versa. So here are those normal levels for potassium. Once again, 3.5 to 5, anything greater than 5 is hyperkalemic. Now let's look at the causes of hyperkalemia. Too much potassium moving from intracellular spaces to extracellular spaces can cause a hyperkalemia because our body is used to most of that potassium being inside the cells. That can happen with burns and tissue damage where we increase the capillary membrane permeability. It can also happen with adrenal insufficiency, renal failure, dehydration. If the patient has excessive potassium intake, if they're acidotic, such as in DKA, administration of ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, and potassium sparing diuretics can also all cause hyperkalemia. So what do our patients look like when we assess them and they have a high potassium? Lots of musculoskeletal symptoms, muscle weakness, twitches, numbness, cramping. Remember when your muscles get weak, your diaphragm is a muscle. So shallow respirations can also call, lead to respiratory failure in the case of severe hyperkalemia. It impairs the contractility of your muscles leading to weak pulses, bradycardia, hypotension. We tend to have hyperactive vowel sounds, decrease urine output, and diarrhea that goes along with those hyperactive vowel sounds and cramping. And most importantly, I'm sure you all saw this coming, are those EKG changes. We can't talk about potassium and not talk about the EKG changes in the heart. And there's a few of these you just have to know for the NCLEX. So here's an EKG with severe hyperkalemia. Wide flat P waves, prolonged PR interval, widened QRS interval, depressed ST segment, and tall peaked T wave. When you see tall peaked T wave, I want you to think hyperkalemia, okay? And you have to know that all of these EKG changes can lead to a heart block, ventricular fibrillation, or even asystole. So what's your first nursing intervention when you see a high potassium level in one of your patients? Put them on the cardiac monitor. You have to monitor that cardiac rhythm and be ready to intervene if it progresses to a rhythm like ventricular fibrillation. All of these treatment options and interventions, of course, depend on the severity of the hyperkalemia and what symptoms are present, but you have to monitor that cardiac rhythm. Watch out for the other complications, but monitor that cardiac rhythm first and foremost. Things you can do to decrease the level of extracellular potassium is discontinue any potassium supplements. Obviously, if we're giving them potassium, stop. Restrict their potassium in their diet. Those will decrease the extrinsic sources of potassium. We also often give IV calcium gluc or chloride, but that's just to protect the myocardium of the heart if we're seeing some of those EKG changes. That doesn't actually do anything to decrease their amount of potassium. Most of our treatments for hyperkalemia over here on the right actually have more to do with moving potassium from the intravascular space into the cells. Because remember, that's where most of our potassium lives. So a few different ways that we can do that. We can give D5W and regular insulin. Insulin with D5W helps drive potassium into the cells, but it doesn't reduce the amount of total potassium in the body. It just relocates it. Albuterol does the same thing. Those beta-2 agonists drive potassium into the cells. And sodium bicarbonate helps drive potassium into the cells. So three different medications you can give to help decrease the intravascular level of potassium. Now we have a couple of ways to reduce the total body level of potassium to actually get it out of the body. k is given either PO or via enema. 
to promote GI sodium absorption, which then causes potassium excretion. Diuretics can be given, such as hydrochlorothiazide or Lasix, and that might waste potassium to get rid of potassium in the urine. And last, this is really the last resort. If none of these other things are working, we can put the patient on dialysis to physically remove the amount of potassium from their blood, which sometimes you have to do in an acute emergency. Last thing we have to go over for potassium are foods that are high in potassium. The NCLEX loves questions about food. They love asking those education questions about what food would you recommend for your patient um, who's hyperkalemic. So make sure to have a general understanding of those foods. Kind of a weird thing to commit to memory, but you've got to do it. Key ones to know are avocados, bananas, potatoes, and spinach. Those foods are really high in potassium. So for a hyperkalemic, you would want to discourage these foods. For a patient that's hypokalemic, you would want to encourage them to eat those foods. So speaking of that, I'm going to jump right to hypokalemia. And then after hypokalemia, we will do NCLEX questions about potassium. So with hypokalemia, low levels of potassium in the blood, that would be less than 3.5. Um, causes of hypokalemia, uh, loop diuretics, like we just mentioned, those are potassium wasting giving laxatives, we keep lots of potassium in the gut, and if we're having lots of vomiting, diarrhea, giving lots of laxatives, that can decrease our potassium. Glucocorticoids, a potassium deficient diet, polydipsia, Cushing syndrome, ONG oh, tube to suction is another possibility for decreasing the amount of potassium via getting rid of those GI secretions. Um, let's see, wound drainage, sweating, alkalosis. Remember, acidosis is associated with a high potassium, alkalosis associated with a low potassium, and hyperinsulinism. Remember that we use D5W and insulin to move potassium into the cells. So if we have lots and lots of insulin, that's going to help move more potassium into the cells than what we want, which means uh, we could be deficient in our potassium and end up being hypokalemic, which is also quite dangerous. Assessment findings of your patients who are really low in potassium, decreased deep tendon reflexes, weakness, their muscles are flaccid, they have shallow respirations, neurological changes ranging from confusion to lethargy, they might have orthostatic hypotension, a weak thready pulse, polyuria, constipation. So diarrhea can be a cause of hypokalemia, but constipation is a symptom of a patient already hypokalemic. Nausea, vomiting, decreased bowel sounds, and of course, because it's potassium, the most important is those cardiac dysrhythmias. So what EKG changes do we see with low potassium levels? In this patient, we have a slightly peaked P wave, a slightly prolonged R inter PR interval, ST depression, a shallow T wave, and a prominent U wave. These last two are your NCLEX buzzwords for hypokalemia. So that shallow T wave, remember when it was hyperkalemia, it was tall and peaked. And in hyperkalemia, we did not have a U wave. So the prominent U wave is very specific to hypokalemia. And what's our first nursing intervention? place them on cardiac telemetry. We have got to monitor these patients on a telemonitor. Also monitor their respiratory and renal status and look at all their other electrolytes. Electrolytes are all interrelated, so they likely have other imbalances too. If you're giving a drug that wastes potassium, like an NSAID or Lasix, hold that drug. Hold digoxin because we can have increased digoxin toxicity with hypokalemia. Encourage them to eat a diet very rich in potassium. You can give oral or IV supplements. The oral supplements can really cause some GI upset, so give them with food. And for IV supplement administration, you never, ever, ever, ever give IV push potassium. You will kill your patient. That will stop their heart. It will absolutely put them into asystole. It will be very hard to get them back. So you do not push IV potassium. 
You give it slowly according to the instructions from pharmacy. And you watch that IV site like your life depends on it. It is very, very irritating to the veins. It can cause lots of phlebitis. And if it extravasates into the tissue, look at that poor baby's hands. All of that necrotic tissue, because an IV meant giving potassium, um, extravasated and killed the tissue. So we give it very slowly, preferably in central access, like a pick line, if we have it. All right, fast and furious through the potassium. Let's do an NCLEX question together. You guys can read this. Let me know the answer when you've got it. And I've got one question to answer once you guys do this NCLEX question. Good job, guys. These questions about who is most at risk are not the easiest, but this is a common question type on the NCLEX. So I wanted to make sure we got some practice in. So you're looking for the patient most at risk for hypokalemia, and this is not a select all that apply. It does not say select all that apply here. It says most at risk. So you wanna pick the number one, number one most at risk for hypokalemia. Awesome. Okay. A lot of you guys got this right. The answer is A, a patient with hyperemesis gravidarum. So you have to know what that is to understand that this patient is most at risk, um, but it is a pregnancy complication characterized by severe nausea vomiting. So this patient is very dehydrated. They're vomiting up a lot of stomach secretions. And remember all of that vomiting does put a patient at risk for hypokalemia. Gastrointestinal fluids are rich in potassium. Um, that um, stomach acid is made up of different um, components to make it acidic. And potassium is one of the things that's really rich in that stomach secretion. So if we vomit, if we have an NG tube to suction, lots of diarrhea, all of those things puts us at risk for hypokalemia. So B, our renal failure patient. They are more at risk for hyperkalemia because the kidneys aren't able to excrete as much potassium as they normally do, and it builds up in the blood. For C, your patient in DKA, more at risk for hyperkalemia. In DKA, um, there's no insulin going on. There's a huge lack of insulin, and it's unable to transport that um, potassium into the cells. So that means potassium is building up outside of the cells, causing hyperkalemia. And lastly, D, third degree burns. A few of you did put D. And we're going to talk about burns more tomorrow in integumentary, so don't worry. But third degree burns cause an increase in capillary membrane permeability. And it causes a lot of the potassium we keep in our cells to leak out outside of our cells into the vascular space. And that causes hyperkalemia since we're not used to most of our potassium being outside of the cells. That would be why um, burns put you at risk for hyperkalemia. Awesome job, guys. I'm going to go ahead and call break. Those were the two biggest and hardest electrolytes to get through. It's downhill from there. So we're going to take five minutes. Um, or we'll just, since it's 10 or 9.52, we'll come back at um, 10. It's 11 o'clock for me, 10 o'clock at central time. Um, take a good five to eight minutes, get some water. I'm gonna have a quick snack and then we'll keep on going. We'll finish out these electrolytes um, and then we'll take a super quick break before we bust into pharmacology. Um, I did have one question uh, asked here up here above that I'm gonna answer really quick if you wanna stay on. Oops, let me find it. It was about our treatments for hyperkalemia from Rochelle. So, oh wait, no, no, no. Out of the treatments for hyperkalemia, what is the first and what is the priority to give them in? So I'll scroll back to that slide quickly, um, just in case any of you have that same question. Um, so here's our hyperkalemia treatments. 
And the pri- there's not a good answer as to which one we would give first and what the first priority would be, because it really depends on the patient and if they are having EKG changes. If it's a mild hyperkalemia and they're not having EKG changes, we're just going to discontinue any potassium giving supplements and restrict potassium in their diet. If they're having EKG changes, we're going to be need to need to be more aggressive to get potassium out of their vascular system and into their cells. A lot of providers that I work with will do a combination of D5W with regular insulin and k or administering some Lasix. It depends on their fluid status, their other symptoms, what's available in your unit, what the protocol is. It really mostly is provider preference. You're not going to get an NCLEX question that says, choose the priority for your patient with hyperkalemia, and it's going to have four of these options. That wouldn't be a fair question. It really does depend on the patient's situation. You might get a question that says, you have a patient with a potassium of eight, which of these interventions would be appropriate? Um, And it's either a select all that apply, or it has a couple of these, and then some other interventions that wouldn't be appropriate. But you should not have to prioritize between these interventions. I will say that dialysis is the last resort, so we're really only doing that if none of these other treatments are effective. In my personal experience, D5W regular insulin, Lasix and k are kind of our first line, and I see those given first, but by no means is that textbook. That's just my facility. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. That was, you know, not, not a super straightforward answer on that one. So um, we're going to break here, go into calcium starting at 10 a.m. All right, guys. Good job hanging in there. I know this is a whole lot. This is a whole lot to go over. You're all doing awesome. Be back in five.
All right. Hopefully everyone got a little snack. I was getting a little hungry. So we will keep on going through our electrolytes just so you guys kind of know what's coming. Um, which, by the way, this schedule is in your handouts as well that I'm trying to stick to as close as I can um, in case you're wondering what's coming up. But um, we have another hour stretch of these fluid and electrolytes. We just have to finish up our last four electrolytes. And remember, we got the hardest two out of the way first. Um, then we'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll do our pharmacology section, which is a big section. And then we'll break for lunch. So I promise the first part of the day is the hardest, but these are concepts you just got to know. And hopefully this is a really, really great review for you guys to hit the ground running. So I'm going to jump into calcium, our next electrolyte to cover today. Let me pull up. Excellent. Okay. So hypercalcemia, high level of calcium in the blood. Calcium is stored in the bones, of course, we all know that, but it's absorbed in the GI system and it's excreted by the kidneys. So hugely important role in several areas of the body. Um, it plays a very important role to the bones, the teeth, as well as the nerves and muscles. It's also important in coagulation. Our blood really can't clot if we're very hypocalcemic. Um, and it's controlled by parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. So remember I said all of these electrolytes are very interrelated and they have relationships with hormones and other vitamins and minerals as well. So very complex system that our body has. An important electrolyte as far as calcium goes is phosphorus. Calcium has an inverse relationship with phosphorus. So calcium goes up, phosphorus goes down and vice versa. The lab values for, um, excuse me, it's lab values for calcium. Normal, it's 8.4 to 10.2. So anything greater than that 10.2 is where we are hypercalcemic. Causes of hypercalcemia are relatively straightforward. Hyperparathyroidism, because remember, parathyroid hormone controls calcium. So if we have too much PTH, we end up having too much calcium because PTH causes calcium to be released from the bones. If we have a cancer of the bones, um, that can cause too much calcium to leak into the bones. Thiazide diuretics cause calcium excretions with diuretics, renal failure, all of that can cause too much excretion of calcium um, from the bones into the blood, causing the hypercalcemia. Um, let's see, vitamin D toxicity, vitamin D you can think of as like the activator for calcium. So if too much vitamin D, too much calcium. Of course, if our patient has too much intake of either calcium or vitamin D, glucocorticoids is interesting because that suppresses calcium absorption, which leaves more of the calcium actually in the blood leading to the hypercalcemia. And immobility, if we're on bed rest for a prolonged period of time, our bones will start to break down and release that calcium into the blood, causing a hypercalcemia. So very important electrolyte. And our assessment findings for the hypercalcemic patient look, my slides are being a little slow. Come on. There we go. So assessment findings we see across several different um, systems. Neuromuscular, we're gonna be weak, have flaccid muscles and decreased reflexes. So in general, too much calcium, I think of as like a sedating effect. Calcium makes you weak, decreased reflexes. For cardiovascular, remember it's very important in contractility, including in the heart. So we'll have some bradycardia, that can even lead to cyanosis. And remember, too much calcium can make you hypercoagulable. So we can get some deep vein thrombosis going on if your blood clots too much. For gastrointestinal, remember decreased reflexes, weak, that's going to extend to the GI system. So decreased peristalsis, decreased bowel sounds, that leads to abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation. Of course, kidney stones are made primarily of calcium, so hypercalcemia can lead to kidney stones. Neurologically, too much calcium is sedating, so we're fatigued. 
decreased level of consciousness. Everything is slowing down, including some things in our EKG. Not as important as the EKG changes with potassium, but still worth noting that hypercalcemia can shorten our QT interval and prolong our PR interval right here, prolonged PR interval. So you do still want to look out for EKG changes in any electrolyte imbalance, not just potassium. What are we going to do for our patients with hypercalcemia? We want to encourage PO hydration. If we need to give them IV fluids, we prefer normal saline to help dilute out all that calcium building up. Um, if we need to reduce the dietary intake of calcium, if they're eating a lot of milk, cheeses, foods really high in calcium, um, loop diuretics can help us excrete calcium. We can also give calcium binders to help bind to the calcium and then get rid of too much calcium left in the bloodstream. Uh, calcium is often associated with dehydration, so it's important to adequately hydrate patients, and that's why you see the PO hydration, the IV fluids, all of those types of things. Um, corticosteroids can be useful if the cause of the hypercalcemia is vitamin D toxicity. That can decrease that. And then we have a few medications that are considered calcium reabsorption inhibitors. So they inhibit the calcium from being reabsorbed into the bones so that we can excrete the calcium and decrease the serum level of calcium. Those are phosphorus, calcitonin, biphosphonates, and NSAIDs. So all of those drugs can help us decrease serum calcium. An especially important one to remember is the phosphorus, because remember I said that calcium and phosphorus have an inverse relationship. So if our uh, phosphorus goes up, we're gonna drive our, our calcium down. That's why phosphorus can be given in hypercalcemia. A last resort, just like with potassium, can be dialysis. If our hypercalcemia is not responding to any of the above treatments, it's really, really high. Perhaps we're having some EKG changes, then we might just need to dialyze the patient and remove that excess calcium from their blood. And of course, because we're at risk for some cardiac changes, we need to do cardiac monitoring. All right, we're going to do a hypercalcemia NCLEX question that should pop up for you guys here. Go ahead and read through that. This is a select all that apply. Something I know you guys hate, but that you're going to see a whole lot of on the NCLEX. Good select all that apply there. I'll give you a hint. There's two correct answers. Good job, Jennifer, Golda. Good job, Rochelle. Two Jennifers, awesome. Good job, everyone. So A and B are your correct answers here, phosphorus and calcitonin. The normal serum calcium level, again, 8.4 to 10.2. So you need to know that to look at the question, see 13.2, and know you have a high serum calcium. So we can give phosphorus to treat that hypercalcemia. Phosphorus and calcium has that inverse relationship like we've been talking about. So we increase the phosphorus, we decrease the calcium. For B, that was another correct one. And we're going to talk about this more in endocrine tomorrow too, but a very important concept to remember Calcitonin is a medication um, that we would give to treat hypercalcemia. Calcitonin is a thyroid hormone that decreases the plasma level of calcium by inhibiting bone resorption and lowering the serum calcium concentration. So calcitonin is secreted when parathyroid hormone is secreted. It's one of those chain reactions. So the body is low on calcium. The, the thyroid senses that and secretes PTH, which, which causes the release of calcitonin. Calcitonin decreases the plasma level of calcium by inhibiting bone reabsorption. So the bones don't take back as much calcium 
they leave it in the serum in the serum and we lower the serum calcium concentration so we can administer calcium to patients who are hypercalcemic or I think I said calcium, we can, we can administer calcitonin to a patient who is hypercalcemic to help lower that serum calcium complication. And again, we will go over that a little bit further tomorrow in endocrine when we talk about that hormone loop with PTH. But this is an excellent example of how the endocrine system and hormones are very interrelated with electrolytes and the balance of fluids and electrolytes in our patients. For now, just remember calcitonin can lower the serum calcium concentration. So it was an appropriate drug for a patient with a serum calcium of 13.2. Now for C, vitamin D, I don't think anybody picked that. C is incorrect. Vitamin D really should be avoided if we have a hypercalcemic patient. Vitamin D enhances the absorption of calcium, so it actually increases the levels, which we don't want to do if they're already high. And for D, also incorrect. A few people did pick D, but IV calcium gluconate would not be given if the patient was already hypercalcemic. We don't want to give them any extra calcium for a level that's already high. We might give it if the patient had low calcium levels, and we might give it if the patient has very high potassium levels, and we're trying to protect their myocardium. That's a protective factor if we have EKG changes. So maybe that's what you guys were thinking of if there were EKG changes due to the hypercalcemia. But in this case, that would only further the damage because we have a high calcium level, so we want to avoid giving them any more calcium. All right, now on the flip side, it's time to talk about hypocalcemia. All right, low level of calcium in the blood, same different physiologic factors that we talked about. And you know that your normal calcium level is 8.4 to 10.2. So anything less than that 8.4 is going to be our hypocalcemia. All right, let's look at some causes for that. Renal failure, acute pancreatitis, malnutrition, malabsorption. I think it's important to distinguish between the difference there. Malnutrition might be things like bulimia, anorexia, starvation, where we're not taking in enough calcium. Malabsorption are going to be diseases like celiac and Crohn's, where their gut is not physiologically able to absorb the nutrients that it needs to. Remember we said calcium is absorbed in the GI tract. So GI problems with the absorption of calcium lead to very low levels of calcium. Alcoholism is another prominent cause of hypocalcemia. We'll see alcoholism as a cause in the next few electrolyte abnormalities. Typically it's because alcoholics forget to eat, they don't have a nutritious diet, and they don't have enough intake of several different important electrolytes. Our patients who are vitamin D deficient, remember vitamin D activates calcium. So if we don't have it, not enough calcium is activated and we can become hypocalcemic. And then hypoparathyroidism. I'll go through that loop one more time. Hypoparathyroidism, not enough parathyroid hormone. Not enough parathyroid hormone leads to not enough calcitonin and there is not enough release of calcium from the bones into the blood. So the bone holds on to all that calcium and our serum levels of calcium are too low. Hyperphosphatemia is another one that can cause hypocalcemia due to that inverse relationship between the phosphorus and the calcium. High phosphorus, low calcium. So those are your big causes for the hypocalcemia. Now, what are your patients going to look like when you go to assess them? Neuromuscular, they're going to be not sedated. So remember, with too much calcium, we were really sedated and tired and everything was slow. Now we don't have enough calcium and we're just like really hyper because calcium is sedating and we don't have enough of it. So if we don't have enough sedation, everything is irritable. Neuromuscular, we're irritable, paresthesias, tetany, muscle spasms, seizures, and our two classic signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia, Tosfex and Trosus, right down here. So I'm sure you guys have heard these in your med surge classes. Signs of hypocalcemia, 
Chosvex is the nerve hyperexcitability of your facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. So to elicit that response, you tap at the angle of the jaw and you see that those muscles contract momentarily, like the lips and the nose kind of twitch with it. And that's a positive Chosvex sign indicative of hypocalcemia. Now positive trosus, you put a blood pressure cuff on the upper arm, inflate it above the systolic pressure, wait three minutes and wait to see a carpopedal spasm of the hand. It'll go like this. And that is a positive trosus sign. Super specific and funny to memorize, but you've got to know those signs and symptoms for the NCLEX. They love to ask about Chosvex and Trosus. And both of those are indicative of hypocalcemia. So cardiovascularly, we have decreased contractility, bradycardia, hypotension, weak pulse. Gastrointestinal can kind of be kind of the opposite. Everything's hyperactive, we're cramping. Diarrhea, those muscles are moving too much because we are not sedated. We will also have some potential EKG changes when we have hypocalcemia. These are a prolonged ST segment right here. See how much longer that is than usual and a prolonged QT interval. So again, not the priority. Well, it is the priority if they're happening, but not the number one thing, of, thing I think of in my head. I think about the muscular skeletal complications. But important to know that it is possible to have EKG changes and that you have to take them seriously if they occur. Treatment wise for hypocalcemia is very straightforward. They don't have enough calcium. We need to give them some calcium. We can do that with PO supplements. We can administer them with vitamin D that will help increase the absorption of the calcium supplement. We can also give IV calcium supplements preferable to give in a central line and you have to go slowly. That's going to be the case with all of our electrolyte supplementation. Muscle relaxants can help. We want to decrease stimuli and encourage a calcium rich diet. So foods high in calcium, these are probably ones that you guys kind of already know, but buzz ones for the NCLEX are the broccoli, like all your leafy greens cheese, milk, and oranges. Those are all ones the NCLEX loves to ask about when you're educating your patient about what foods to either avoid if they're hypercalcemic or encourage if they're hypocalcemic. So let's do another NCLEX question about calcium. Here you guys go. And this is a select all that apply. There you go. This is, this is a relatively challenging question. Good job, guys. There's two correct answers here. All right, let's go ahead and go through it. This one was pretty hard. No one has gotten it yet. D and E are the two correct answers. Those are the patients most at risk for that lab level. So first things first, like with any of these questions, you have to look at the uh, lab level in the question. You see that calcium level of 7.2, and you know that that is lower than what you would expect. This patient is hypocalcemic. So then you're gonna go through each question choice and ask yourself, is this patient at risk for hypocalcemia? With select all that apply questions, you want to treat every single option as true or false. It doesn't matter how many are right. It could be one, it could be all five. They're not related to each other. So first we just look at A. Is the patient with breast cancer and bone metastases at risk for hypocalcemia? No, she is not. She is at risk for hypercalcemia do the destruction of her osteoclasts with that bone cancer leaking calcium into the blood. 
So A, incorrect. Now B, the patient with obesity. Obesity, not a risk factor for hypocalcemia. We talked about malnutrition and malabsorption, like celiacs and Crohn's, but obesity is not going to put somebody at risk for hypocalcemia unless they're like super immobile in bed rest, and that would actually put them at risk for hypercalcemia. So B is incorrect. Now we come to C, the patient with vitamin D toxicity. Like we talked about, vitamin D activates calcium, so we have more vitamin D, more calcium, so that is going to put them at risk for hypercalcemia. So once again, incorrect for that low level of 7.2. Now we come to D, the patient with hypoparathyroidism. Yes, that's your first correct answer. They are likely to suffer from hypocalcemia uh, because you know we've talked about that feedback loop. Hypoparathyroidism, too little PTH, PTH regulates that serum calcium concentration on the bones, the kidneys, the intestines. Too little PTH, too little calcium. This patient is at risk for hypocalcemia. And then you come to E, um, end stage renal failure. Is that patient at risk for hypocalcemia? Yes. I'm going to go through a little bit more detailed explanation because I have found that this is the trickiest answer from this whole question, which is a hard question. So congrats if you got it right. So end stage renal failure, two different reasons why we're going to see hypocalcemia with that. Number one is the increased phosphorus. Number two is the decreased renal production of vitamin D. So kidneys aren't able to get rid of as much phosphorus as they usually should. Our phosphorus levels increase. Inverse relationship with calcium, phosphorus goes up, calcium goes down, hypocalcemia. The other side of that is that the kidneys are responsible for activating the vitamin D. And in stage renal failure, they don't do that. Not enough vitamin D to activate the calcium, not enough calcium, hypocalcemia. So that's the basics of why end-stage renal failure can cause hypocalcemia. I know that's a little bit tricky, so I went through that a little bit longer there, but I find that that's the trickiest answer for people to get. So D and E were correct there. Almost everyone picked D, but very few people also picked E. So hopefully that gave you a better explanation. That is a high difficulty level NCLEX question. So once you're able to confidently get ones like this right, you know you're going to be ready for the NCLEX. All right, moving on to magnesium. I personally love magnesium. I don't know if that's weird to like have a favorite electrolyte, but magnesium is super cool. Hypermagnesemia, high magnesium levels in the blood. Magnesium is mainly stored in the bones and the cartilage, and it plays a huge role in the contraction of our skeletal muscles. It's also important for ATP formation. So our cells would literally not have energy if we didn't have magnesium to help form that adenosine triphosphate. Magnesium is also a huge activator of vitamins, It's kind of like the sidekick for a lot of good things that our bodies needs, necessary for cellular growth, and it has a direct relationship with calcium. So like we just talked about, phosphorus is inversely related to calcium. Magnesium is directly related to calcium. When they go up, they go up together. They're like the two best friends. They go up the hill together. One goes up, the other goes up. One falls, they bring the other one with it. Normal lab values for magnesium are that 1.6 to 2.6. So anything over that 2.6 is when we have hypermagnesemia. What causes this? Well, excessive dietary intake, if they're eating way too much magnesium, if they have way too many magnesium containing medications, we have a good number of meds that have mag in them. Antacids are a big one. Some people overdo it on the Tums. They can get too much magnesium going on. If we as healthcare providers overcorrect their hypomagnesemia by giving them supplementation beyond what they need and renal failure, unfortunately, renal failure can cause a lot of electrolyte imbalances and hypermagnesemia is one of them. So assessment findings, what are we expecting our patients to look like if they have high levels of magnesium? Well, sedated. They are going to be weak, have weak muscles, slowed reflexes, decreased deep tendon reflexes, 
Remember, whenever we have weak muscles, that extends to the muscles of the diaphragm, leading to some shallow breathing that can become very dangerous. Cardiovascularly, we have bradycardia, hypotension. They become very, very vasodilated, and it can lead to cardiac arrest if it gets high enough. Neurologically, very sedated, drowsy, lethargic, even comatose. So magnesium, another one is sedating, like calcium. Remember, they're two friends. They go together. Or they're both sedating. Too much magnesium, we're going to really suppress things. We also have some EKG changes to talk about here. Magnesium, I think a little bit more about the EKG than I do with calcium. We see almost like a flat P wave. With um, hypokalemia, we talked about um, a, a like shortened P wave, but with hypermagnesemia, it's pretty much flattened. A prolonged PR interval here, and it's hard to even see the PR interval with such a flat P wave. That QRS complex is widened, and we have a tall T wave. Now, I will say, even though a tall T wave is um, a tall T wave is associated with um, hypermagnesemia. If you see, quote, tall pe peaked T wave on the NCLEX, I want you to think hyperkalemia. Tall peaked T wave is your buzzword for hyperkalemia. It's just important for you to know that we also have these EKG changes with the hypermagnesemia. So treatment is going to be quite straightforward. Whatever the cause of the magnesium overshoot um, is, we want to treat. Did we overdo it with supplements? Are they eating too much mag? Are they taking too much um, magnesium-containing medications? Hold any of those things. We can administer loop diuretics. We can administer calcium gluconate to stabilize the myocardium. And if nothing else is working, we can dialyze the patient to physically remove the magnesium from their bloodstream. So treatments, we're going to go into our NCLEX question for the hypermagnesemia and then talk about the hypomagnesemia. So there's your NCLEX question. Good job, Jennifer. Awesome, guys. Very good on this one. So first things first, you look at that level, you see 3.2, awesome glory. Um, and you see, you know that that is a high level of magnesium. You gotta know that normal value. So then you look at each of the answer choices and think, would this cause a high level of magnesium? With A, renal failure, yep, that can absolutely cause a high level at magnesium. Um, renal failure can cause hypermagnesemia due to the fact that the process that keeps the levels of magnesium in the body at normal levels doesn't work properly in people with kidney dysfunction. Remember that kidney dysfunction throws all of our electrolytes out of whack. So now we come to B, alcoholism. That is actually going to be a risk factor for hype O magnesemia. I don't think anybody put this answer up there. Um, oh, it's not a risk that is a risk factor for hype O, not hyper. And this patient has higher levels of magnesium. So it's that um, hypo magnesemia is actually the most common electrolyte abnormality observed in our alcoholic patients due to a lack of eating, a nutrient-rich diet, and even just forgetting to eat. Um, so chronic alcohol abuse really depletes the total body supply of magnesium, and this patient has a high level, so we would not choose B. Next for C, anorexia. Again, that kind of follows with the alcoholic ex um, ex explanation that that is not correct. Um, patients who have anorexia and are not eating a sufficient amount of um, magnesium, they'll have this malnutrition and a lack of dietary intake of magnesium, 
puts them at risk for hypomagnesemia. And lastly, D, diarrhea. Once again, more at risk for hypo and not hypermagnesemia. Since that mag is absorbed in the GI tract, when we have diarrhea, there's going to be decreased absorption and not as many, um, not as high levels of serum magnesium. So that was the answer choice there. So this put, point, points out a good point about test taking strategies for the NCLEX. The answer was just A, and it was a select all that apply question. And Jennifer asked, so on a select all apply, would they normally just put one right answer? Yes, they can put one right answer, two, three, four, five right answers. None of these answer choices are related at all. Treat every single answer choice like a true or false question. If you know that only one of those answer choices is right, then only one is right. Select all that apply does not have to have more than one answer choice correct. And I think that messes a lot of people up because they think there needs to be another one. So they pick another answer even when they're not really sure that that's right. Do not do that. They are all independent of each other. Just choose the correct ones. All right. On to hypomagnesemia, everyone. Just a few more electrolytes to go before, our, um, before we take a break, right? So hypomagnesemia, we have our low level of magnesium in the blood. Again, same physiologic things that we went over for magnesium. And that normal level, once again, for you to memorize is 1.6 to 2.6. Got to drive all of those numbers home. Anything less than 1.6 is going to be hypomagnesemia. All right, so what can cause this? We've kind of hinted at this in earlier slides. Your buzzword is gonna be alcoholism. I want you to associate alcoholism with hypomagnesemia. So those alcoholics really do have a nutrient poor diet, forget to eat, chronic alcohol abuse puts them at risk for hypomagnesemia. Other things that go along with that, that malnutrition and malabsorption, hypoparathyroidism, hypocalcemia, and diarrhea. Some of these we just talked about on the previous question, but remember with hypoparathyroidism, that leads to hypocalcemia, and mag and calcium have a direct relationship. So when mag goes down, calcium goes down. And then remember that mag is absorbed in the GI tract, so with diarrhea, vomiting, and G-tube suction, we're going to be removing a lot of that electrolyte leading to low levels of mag. So we don't have enough mag. What will our assessment look like? Remember, mag is sedating. We don't have enough of it. We're going to be more excitable. So neuromuscularly, numbness, tingling, tetany, seizures, and increased deep tendon reflexes. From a neurological perfection, um, perspective, symptoms range from psychosis to confusion to irritability. And gastrointestinal, we have decreased motility of our GI tract, leading to constipation and anorexia. That anorexia is really secondary to the decreased motility and lack of things moving through the GI tract. That just makes people feel gross and not want to eat. So remember, not enough mag, we're not enough sedated, irritable, psychosis, tingling, tetany. And of course, I have to mention the couple of EKG changes that can go along with hypomagnesemia. We have a prolonged QT interval, you see from the beginning of the Q all the way out to this T over here, and a more flattened T wave. So with hypomagnesemia, we had the flattened T wave. With hypermagnesemia, we had more of a peak in our T waves. So what do we need to do to treat this hypomagnesemia? Again, pretty straightforward when we're talking about treating mag. Um, we wanna treat the cause. If we're giving diuretics or other medications that waste magnesium, like aminoglycosides or phosphorus, you wanna get rid of those, stop giving them. We wanna monitor the cardiac rhythm and we wanna replace their magnesium. We can give PO magnesium hydroxide, preferable to give with food, and we can also give IV. Again, preferable to give centrally and give it very, very slowly. All right, next NCLEX question's ready for you. Go ahead and do this one about hypomagnesemia.
Good job, guys. C, A, B, C. Good. Okay. Yep. This one is a little bit confusing. A lot of you got it right. The correct answers are B and C. A lot of you putting A as well. So let's talk about this because this is a way that the NCLEX will trip you up. So I want to go over that. So first and foremost, you see that level of 1.1, you know that's a low magnesium level. And so which of the following signs and symptoms does she closely monitor for? So this question is asking you, what are signs and symptoms of hypomagnesemia? Select all that apply. So you look at A, diarrhea, and a lot of you guys picked A. The reason that A is incorrect, ooh, ooh, Clicked too much. Sorry, guys. Okay, we're back. So the reason that A is incorrect is because diarrhea can be a cause of hypomagnesemia because it's um, um, the GI tract is where a lot of magnesium is absorbed. And if we're having a lot of diarrhea, then um, we're not absorbing as much into our bloodstream. We're getting rid of it and it's causing our hypomagnesemia, but it is not a symptom of somebody who is already hypomagnesemic. Okay. And once your levels are already low, you have decreased GI motility, which actually ends up leading to constipation. So very, very, very confusing. And I told, I probably as a student would have also picked A because we just talked about diarrhea causing low levels of magne magnesemia. The thing is the way this question tricked you was it asked you about the signs and symptoms, not about the causes, which are two different things. Something that causes hypomagnesemia is not necessarily a sign or symptom after they already have low levels. So that is very tricky, very, very tricky. At first when I was reading the question, I was like, did I forget to put A on there? Nope. We want to know the signs and symptoms once their levels are already low, not the initial cause. Okay. Almost all of you did pick B and C, your correct answers, psychosis and tetany. Mag is sedating, not enough mag, very irritable. And then D for decreased deep tendon reflexes. Most of you did not pick that one. That was incorrect. Decreased deep tendon reflexes would be more consistent with the hypo. Oh, wait, hold on. Decreased deep tendon reflexes is not consistent with hypomagnesemia. Rather, it is increased deep tendon reflexes. So remember, mag is sedating. So if we don't have enough of it, we're going to have increased reflexes, increased irritability. If we have hypermagnesemia, like in the previous question with a level of 3.2, we have too much of that sedating, so then we would have the decreased deep tendon reflexes. So easy to get that one flip-flopped. I had one question about mag that I want to answer, and that was about torsades de points, excuse me if I'm saying that incorrectly, with magnesium. Now, I didn't put that in our slides because it is a more rare complication that the NCLEX does not typically ask about, but I'm going to pull in a screen to show you what it looks like so that you guys can see it. Torsades de points means twisting on a point. It can have a pulse or not a pulse. If there are pulseless torsades, it is a shockable rhythm. 
Um, and magnesium is thought, it's not exactly clear of the mechanism, but the, it's thought that either very high or low levels of magnesium can be a precipitating factor for torsades. So we typically give torsades about two grams IV push to help stabilize the cardiac membrane when we have a patient in torsades. Okay, here's an acceptable photo. Let me show you guys what this looks like. So right here is where you see the torsades, the twisting on the point. So it, it goes almost like it looks V-tacky and it gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. That is your characteristic torsades de point rhythm. And we would give magnesium as a treatment to help with that rhythm. And it can be a potentially fatal arrhythmia. So you see it kind of smaller, get bigger, get smaller, and that twisting on a point is what is characteristic of torsades. I personally wouldn't worry too much about that rhythm. It's not frequently asked about on the NCLEX, but if you happen to get that hard NCLEX question asking you about torsades, magnesium would in fact be a treatment. So very, very good question. Um, all right. That was all of our magnesium questions. Let's move on to phosphate. We've just got two left, phosphate and chloride, and then we take a break. And these two are pretty quick, so hang in there with me. All right, hyperphosphatemia, high levels of phosphorus in the blood. Phosphorus plays a huge role in cellular metabolism and energy production. Remember, ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which means without phosphorus, our cells would not have energy. It also makes up the phospholipid bilayer of cell membranes, keep, keeping their shape, plays a large component in the makeup of bones and teeth. And as we mentioned with calcium, it has that inverse relationship with calcium. Hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia. Of course, you have to know your normal values. So 3.0 to 4.5 is your normal value for phosphorus. And anything above 4.5 is going to be considered hyperphosphatemic. So what causes this? Again, renal failure. We know that says that causes a lot of electrolyte abnormalities. Tumor lysis syndrome. This happens with some solid tumors. It's an oncologic emergency. If those tumors burst open, like you see happening in this picture, they release all of their cellular contents, one of which is phosphorus. And we have a huge spike in phosphorus, which can be quite dangerous. If the patient has an excessive dietary intake of phosphorus or hypoparathyroidism leading to hypocalcemia, leading to hyperphosphatemia. See how all those things are related and can cause the hyperphosphatemia. So assessment findings when you have this patient, the thing is it's not very common on its own and isn't going to produce unique symptoms. The symptoms that are gonna be produced are related to the secondary hypocalcemia due to the hyperphosphatemia. So I'm not gonna read you these signs and symptoms again because we just went over them when we talked about hypocalcemia. Remember we said calcium is sedating. We don't have enough of it. We're not very sedated. We have those spasms, those seizures, those cramping, et cetera. And really when we have hyperphosphatemia, the symptoms that we see are due to that low level of calcium that comes with it. So what do we do for our treatment? Well, phosphate binders bind to phosphate and help us excrete excessive amounts of potassium. We give those with food and then we manage the hypocalcemia. So we go back to that treatment for hypocalcemia. All right, quick and easy one. Let's do a quick and easy question just to check in on where you guys are at. I think you guys can all get this one. This is kind of a moderate difficulty level. You do have to be able to think through each of the different things and what their effect on phosphorus would be. So you're, again, you're looking at that level. You see it's 5.0. You know that's a high phosphorus level. Evaluate each of those answer choices and figure out which ones could cause high phosphorus levels. Good job, guys. 
Yeah, so far everyone has gotten that right. Good job, good job. All right, A, B, and D, guys. So we're looking for the things that are possible causes of high phosphorus levels. So first, tumor lysis syndrome. Yes, if that tumor lyses and releases its cellular contents, they spill out into the blood, increase phosphorus levels. For B, hypoparathyroidism, too little PTH, that's what regulates the serum calcium concentration. Too little PTH, decreased calcium, low calcium, high phosphorus. Now for C, hypercalcemia, mm, those have an inverse relationship. So if we have high calcium, low phosphorus. And this patient has a phosphorus level of 5.0, which is greater than the normal three to four and a half. It's not less. So that's why hypercalcemia was incorrect here. And then lastly, D, renal failure. Of course, we've talked about renal failure a lot. Possible cause of hyperphosphatemia due to that reduced kidney function. Phosphorus is not able to be secreted as it usually would and those phosphorus levels building up. Really good, guys. So if you, a couple of you just picked C, you just got it flip-flopped, right? So the question was asking you what could cause high levels of phosphorus, and you picked what could cause a low level of phosphorus. So commit that uh, electrolyte range, that normal value to memory, so that when you get these questions, you know which one it's asking about, right? If you don't know the normal value, you can't get the question right. All right, hypophosphatemia is next. There's not a lot new. Hold on. On that one, where does it say select all that apply? Oh, it should have said select all that apply here at the end, guys. I'm sorry about that. Slide 124. Yep, so on the, on the test, on the NCLEX, if it wants you to, well, there's two ways you're going to know it's a select all that apply question. Uh, luckily, it's a computer-based test that is either only going to let you pick one or it's going to have little check boxes where you can pick multiples and the question will say select all that apply at the end. They won't, they won't mess it up like I did. I apologize. Um, but the good thing about that computer-based test, right, is you're going to easily be able to see if you can even click on more than one answer. If you can't, then you know you have to pick just one. If it's those check boxes, of course, you can pick multiples. Um, okay. Moving right along so we can get to our break. Hypophosphatemia, there's really not too much like new to tell you here. Low level of phosphorus in the blood, same physiologic properties we discussed. Our normal value again, 3.0 to 4.5 for phosphorus. So what can cause low levels of phosphorus? Um, malnutrition, starvation, we're not having a good intake. If we're giving TPN and it doesn't have an adequate concentration of magnesium, refeeding syndrome, if somebody has been starved for a prolonged period of time and you go to refeed them, they can have that um, side effect. Hyperparathyroidism leading to hypercalcemia leads to low levels of phosphorus. And again, we see alcoholism and renal failure with the alcoholism. Remember, we talked about low mag levels, also low phosphorus levels. They're going to have a lot of low electrolyte levels. With renal failure, that can cause high or low phosphorus. We talked about that on the previous slide. Renal failure is one of those things that's quite complex. It depends on the patient. It depends on the stage of renal failure they're in, but it can cause either abnormality. Assessment findings for hypophosphatemia uh, are really going to be related, once again, to the calcium. This is the exact same slide we went over when we talked about increased calcium levels. Low calcium, excuse me, low phosphorus, high calcium, your signs and symptoms are coming from the calcium. There are a couple of a little bit different ones that I just want to point out just in case you were to ever get a question about. Rhabdomyolysis is specific to low phosphorus levels and decreased bone density and fractures. That has to do with, you know, phosphorus being stored in the bone and cartilage, breaking down, 
low levels not giving your bones enough structure so you start to have that osteoporosis osteopenia this happens over a very prolonged period of time it would not be an acute drop in phosphorus levels it would be a long period of deficient levels of these vitamins and minerals that you would have decreased bone density leading to those fractures um cardiovascularly again this is all about the contractility of calcium, having too much calcium due to the low phosphorus levels. And then treatment is gonna be quite simple. Anything that decreases phosphorus, well, we wanna stop that. We wanna treat whatever the cause is. So antacids, calcium, and osmotic diuretics are all driving down the amount of phosphorus in our blood. So if a patient is on those, we want to stop them. We can also quite simply replace phosphorus, giving it PO, or given an IV very slowly. We can encourage a phosphorus-rich diet. And we want to have a diet low in calcium because remember, calcium goes up, phosphorus goes down. So if we're having lots and lots of calcium, then we're driving our phosphorus down and we can have hypophosphatemia. So low calcium, high phosphorus diet. And I do wanna go over phosphorus-rich foods because I think that's a little less common. We kind of all have some sense about foods with potassium and calcium in it. I didn't really know a lot of phosphorus rich foods before nursing school though. Nuts is a big one, nuts and seeds, mushrooms, garlic. I remember the mushrooms, the seeds, and the nuts as being really high in phosphorus. So you want to encourage those for hypophosphatemia. All right, our last phosphorus NCLEX question coming up. And I did have a question pop up in the question box about repeating rhabdomyolysis. I skipped over that quickly because we have a whole lecture on rhabdomyolysis tomorrow. So we're gonna go into that more in depth when we have more time. You don't need to focus on it for your electrolytes. There are other things to focus on for the fluid and electrolytes. So hang with me, to, um, hang with me tomorrow and um, we'll go over the rhabdomyolysis. And then garlic and nuts. Oh, okay. People are answering the question. Awesome, guys. I was like, what does he mean in the chat? Garlic and nuts. All right. So this is one of those classic NCLEX education questions where it wants you to educate your patient about good foods to eat for phosphorus. Awesome. Awesome. We just went over this, guys. Garlic and nuts. Really, really awesome. Whole wheat, uh, whole, wheat whole milk and leafy greens are those calcium rich foods that we would rather our hypophosphatemic patients avoid because um, they're gonna actually drive the phosphorus down. All right, we're into our last electrolyte and this one is super quick, chloride. Chloride is like the forgotten electrolyte, but it is actually important. Hypochloremia, or we're doing hyper first. So high levels of chloride in the blood, Chloride itself is the most abundant extracellular anion. So before we said sodium is the most abundant extracellular cation, and chloride is sodium's little unsung partner. It's the anion, which means it has the negative charge and sodium has the positive charge. So it's really working with sodium to maintain the fluid balance, which is why it is, in fluid, it is important in water balance, just like sodium is important in water balance. It's also really, really important in um, the stomach acid because stomach acid is hydrochloric acid. Chloride is literally half of it. So without chloride, we wouldn't have the acidic environment of the stomach. It's inversely related to bicarbonate. Remember, bicarb is a base. And with our, with our um, hydrochloric acid, that stomach acid, chloride is acidotic. And so they are inversely related and it plays a role in acid-base balance, just like we talked about with our ABGs. It has a direct relationship with sodium, remember they go together, and with potassium. So sodium, potassium, and chloride go together, and then it has an inverse relationship with bicarbonate. Lots of relationships, important to know. Normal values for chloride, also gotta memorize these. That's gonna be 96 to 108, so anything greater than 108 is our hyperchloremia. What can cause this? It's really going back to the beginning when we talked about sodium. A lot of this goes together. So dehydration, metabolic acidosis, renal failure, 
and Cushing's. All of those things are increasing the sodium and increasing the chloride. You rarely see one without the other. When you look at assessment, you're not getting a whole lot of signs and symptoms on its own. I'm gonna refer you back to that hypernatremia slide. Our vessels are packed with particles. They've got lots of sodium, lots of chloride, and that is what is producing our symptoms. So what do we do to treat the hyperchloremia? You wanna treat whatever the underlying cause is and correct the imbalance. We can give bicarbonate since they have that inverse relationship. We can discontinue any medications that have sodium, that have chloride in them. Remember that includes normal saline. Normal saline is sodium chloride. People forget that it has chloride in it. It gives sodium chloride all day, all day. And then they wonder why the chloride is like 120. It's because of the normal saline. Consider using LR if your patient is hyperchloremic. And you wanna monitor all of those electrolyte imbalances. I promise you it's not gonna be the only one. Chloride is not gonna be an electrolyte abnormality without something else going with it. Quick NCLEX question before we move on to hypochloremia. Then we break. And this one should also say select all that apply. I got to add those to the slides. If you were taking the test, it would have little check, check mark boxes for you. So select all that apply. There are two right answers. Good job, guys. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you guys are so smart. You're learning so much. A and C. All right. So you see 115, you know, they are hyperchloremic. So we need to do something to bring that chloride level down. Bicarbonate is inversely related to chloride. So yes, it's appropriate to administer bicarbonate. For B, normal saline, sodium chloride has chloride in it, guys. Don't give normal saline to a patient that is hyperchloremic, okay? Consider using LR. We don't want to give chloride to the patient with high levels of chloride. C, lactated ringers. Ding, ding, ding. That's the fluid I want you to think about using in a patient with hyperchloremia. Uh, normal saline should really be avoided because that's going to make it go up even farther. But we do have to address hydration. So lactated ringers was the correct choice. C was correct. And lastly, D, Lasix. That's potassium wasting. Um, and we don't typically use it to lower the amount of chloride. Remember, potassium and chloride are um, related together, but it's not a typical treatment to give Lasix to get rid of potassium to get rid of chloride. That would cause more harm than good. But I'm impressed none of you picked D. I would have, uh, back as a student, I probably would have thought, oh, if Lasix and chloride are, in, are directly related, I can give Lasix to decrease the chloride. And while that logic follows, it is not appropriate to give Lasix and alter normal potassium levels to bring chloride down. If you have to pick a more dangerous electrolyte abnormality, is it hyperchloremia or hypokalemia? Or hypo hypokalemia or hyperchloremia? I'm getting, my tongue's getting all twisted. It's definitely low potassium is more dangerous. So giving Lasix to lower potassium to lower chloride is not appropriate. And good job. None of you guys picked that. You didn't even let me trip you up. All right. Last electrolyte imbalance is that low chloride level, guys. Uh, hypochloremia, normal chloride, 96 to 108. Anything less than 96 is when you have that low chloride level. It's going to be similar causes to the hyponatremia where we get volume overloaded and we dilute the amount of chloride in the vessels. CHF, water intoxication, metabolic alkalosis since chloride is an acid, salt losses like burns, sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, in cystic fibrosis, patients lose tons and tons of salt, and we're going to talk about that in our pediatric lecture, and in Addison's disease, which we talk about in endo. Both of those are salt-wasting disorders that can cause the hypochloremia. Again, on its own, you're not going to see a ton of signs and symptoms. You're going to want to look at this hyponatremia signs and symptoms, like the neuro changes, level of consciousness changes, and seizures.
All right, so what do we do for hypochloremia? Whatever has caused it, we try to treat the cause, correct the imbalance. For these patients, it is awesome to give normal saline to replace some of that chloride and monitor all of those electrolytes because I promise you it's not the only one. Okay, last NCLEX question, and then we take a break, my friends. We take a good 10 minute break before we jump into pharmacology. Everyone's favorite lecture. Select all that apply. And this time we're talking about causes, right? What can cause a low chloride level? Awesome, awesome, awesome. A and C, yes guys, you see that low chloride level and you know a fluid volume excess can dilute out the amount of chloride present and cause a dilutional hypochloremia. For B, metabolic acidosis, Remember acidosis, acid, chloride is an anion. So that's actually gonna be associated with the hyperchloremia versus metabolic alkalosis being associated with the hypochloremia. So that one was incorrect. For C, vomiting. Yes, that can absolutely cause hypochloremia. Hydrochloric acid is half chloride. That's our stomach contents. And when we're vomiting up all of that acid, vomit up lots of chloride, become hypochloremic. That's correct. And also D was incorrect, constipation. That's not gonna cause hypochloremia. You're not losing any chloride from being constipated. Diarrhea, on the other hand, if you're losing lots of stomach contents, that can um, excrete too much chloride and cause that hypochloremia. All right, phew. You made it through fluid and electrolytes. I promise those labs, those fluid and electrolytes, and next, our pharmacology lecture, they are the backbone. They are that core content for your NCLEX success. You guys are doing so, so, so great. So let's break until, let's see, it's 11 o'clock. We're gonna break until 11.15, and then we're gonna come back for about an hour and a half on pharmacology before it's lunchtime. So we're gonna knock out this hardest part this morning while you guys are fresh, and we're gonna build on it throughout the course. All right. Log off, get, get a snack, walk away from your computer. We'll be back at 11.15, 12.15 Eastern time, 11.15 Central time. This time change is messing me up, guys. All right. pharmacology. This will be a long but important lecture. And when we are done, we will break for lunch and it will be the halfway point for the day. And I promise you the day is going to get easier after this. We packed a lot of intense stuff into the morning. The afternoon, we're going to finish up fundamentals and then start our part two system by system lecture. So <clears throat> if you can make it through farm, you're at the halfway point for day one. I know you can do it. We will do some NCLEX questions, but not nearly as many. And that is because very rarely on the NCLEX is there just like a straight up farm question that has no other components to it. There's usually something that you have to know with a system, a disease process, a treatment. So these questions are more going to be incorporated as we go system by system. So what I'm gonna do is review each classification of medication, the meds that you should know in it, the nursing intervention side effects. I'm gonna highlight a lot of buzzwords that I want you to associate because the NCLEX lady asks a lot of the same things when it comes to pharmacology. I will not be going over every single med in your Davis drug guide. Nobody does that. And you don't need to know all of those drugs. Okay. I'm going to hit the highlights of what you absolutely must memorize 
and those buzzwords that are really going to help you when you get to your NCLEX, okay? Um, here we go. Must know meds. Our first class is anti-anxiety agents. So obviously, Ativan, lorazepam is going to be your kind of key med that we're going to go more in depth with. Other ones are alprazolam, midazolam, diazepam, uspirum. As you can see, PAM or LAM is kind of the suffix of a lot of these drugs. And that's a great NCLEX tip is to group these drugs together by similar sounding names so that you can kind of remember the gist for all of them. So what we're about to go over for Ativan, a lot of that can be applied to midazolam or diazepam in case you were to see that medication on the NCLEX. So this is what we go over for each drug in our farm section for Ativan. Class is an anti-anxiety agent. Its indications are anxiety, sedation, and seizures. What it does is actually suppress the general ner um, central nervous system, general suppression of the CNS, so it's not selective. So it hopefully works on anxiety, it sedates, it calms. When the brain is super extra excitable during a seizure, it calms that down. Nursing considerations that you have to know. If I put something in red, you need to memorize it. That's kind of your buzzword. Avoid alcohol when you're taking any benzodiazepine, including Ativan. Monitor for respiratory depression. We are depressing the central nervous system, and we can overdo it. If we overdo it and they're not breathing enough, they're going to need adequate ventilation. We might have to provide that for them. So buzzword for you to know is that the antidote is flumazenil. Anytime a medication has an antidote, I recommend that you know it. It is really one of the NCLEX's favorite things to do is ask about antidotes. So you do need to know that the antidote for Ativan is flumazenil. All right, that's Ativan. So then we move on to our next category, antiarrhythmics. That's kind of how it's going to go for all of these. If you have questions about the drugs, go ahead and put them in that question box. And I'm going to answer them all at the end. First, we're just going to go through all of the anti, um, all of the different classes to kind of get a comprehensive look at everything. And I've got to have a sip of my coffee from my Christmas mug. My house is full on Christmas already. I couldn't wait any longer. All right. And my goal is to get you guys to lunch no later than one o'clock central time. Hopefully 15, 20 minutes earlier than that. So you can have a bit of a longer lunch break. Just depends on how things go. All right, so let's do this all through pharmacology. Antiarrhythmics, amiodarone, odenosine, and procanamide are your main antiarrhythmic drugs. Adenosine is nine times out of 10 what you were going to see on the NCLEX. Some super important things to know about this antiarrhythmic. It is invocated in supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, a very specific arrhythmia that we will be reviewing later today in our cardiac lecture. And when we give adenosine into a patient with this rhythm, what it does is called pharmacologic cardioversion. So it slows conduction through the AV node, interrupts the reentry pathway through that AV node, and hopefully restores normal sinus rhythm, getting them out of this dangerous arrhythmia. Nursing considerations. There is going to be a period of asystole after we give this drug. Their heart is going to stop. You are going to see a flat line, and then hopefully it resumes a normal sinus rhythm. So you need to warn everybody. You need to warn the patient because it's going to feel like somebody kicked them in the chest. Their heart is stopping. You need to warn the family because they are going to see a flat line on the monitor and freak out. If you work somewhere, like in my emergency department, we have people at a monitor station watching everyone's telemetry. So we need to call the monitor station and say we're giving adenosine so that they don't freak out and think that the patient has just flatlined. Um, so that's the big thing with adenosine. One other thing with adenosine I didn't put on the slide that I've seen the NCLEX ask once or twice is how it's administered. Adenosine has a very, very short half-life so we have to give it rapidly for it to work. It's like two seconds to get from the syringe all the way to the patient's heart. So you have to give it via rapid IV push with a strong flush afterwards. If you have an option about where to administer it, either a peripheral IV or a central venous catheter, 
give it in the IV closest to their heart to increase your chances of getting it to them ASAP. Because if it takes even just three or four seconds, you're not going to have the pharmacologic cardioversion effect. It's going to be completely ineffective. It won't do them any harm, but it won't work. So that's a good thing to know about adenosine as well. Next class is our anticoagulants. We already talked a little bit about these when we did our labs this morning, but heparin and warfarin are two that we'll need to review. Clopredogrel and anoxaprin or Lovenox are also very common anticoagulants. So first let's dive into heparin. I have a few heparin slides because this is a key drug for the NCLEX. Classification is an indirect thrombin inhibitor. So what that does is anticoagulate. It does this by converting fibrinin. Well, let me start over. Okay, here's the physiology. Thrombin is converted from fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin is the actual white little substance that forms the clots, like when you see those microscopic picture. So without thrombin, we can't convert fibrinogen to fibrin, and then we don't have the fibrin for the clots. Well, there's this substance called antithrombin-3 that inhibits thrombin. So heparin enhances antithrombin-3, which inhibits thrombin, which stops it from converting fibrinogen to fibrin so that we don't have fibrins for clots. So long pathway, but it essentially stops the thrombin from being activated and stops clots from forming, hence why it is an anticoagulant. This is the intrinsic coagulation pathway, by the way. Heparin works on the intrinsic pathway for the end result of simply slowing the clotting process down. Basic information you have to know is that you're using it to prevent blood clots, specifically in things like strokes, chronic AFib, or post-op patients. Anytime you've entered somebody's body, put a foreign object, a stent, a valve, they're going to be prone to clots and need to be anticoagulated. For our patients living in chronic AFib, those atria are quivering and not getting a good ejection of blood into the ventricles. So blood tends to sit in those atria and can clot. And if those clots are ever dislodged, well, pff, they could be sent anywhere. They could sent to be sent to the brain and cause a stroke, to the lungs and cause a massive PE, to the coronary arteries and cause an MI. It's, it's a catastrophe. So we have to anticoagulate a patient if they're in chronic AFib which yes, some people do live in chronic AFib. And we're gonna talk about that in cardiac later today. How do we give heparin? It can be given subcutaneously. I have always given heparin intravenously as an ICU nurse. It is titrated based on those APTT levels that we talked about this morning. Because remember your APTT is monitoring the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Heparin works against that cascade to ca cause anticoagulation. So every four to six hours, you draw that level, you see where it is, and you titrate your heparin drip. So what do you need to know for your nursing considerations? What's the biggest side effect of any anticoagulant? Well, bleeding. Obviously, obviously bleeding. If we anticoagulate too far, the PTT is too long, then we could be causing excessive bleeding. But it's not always just, you know, flank, frank blood spurting out of a chest tube or a gushing wound. We Bleeding can be sneakier, and we as nurses need to use our assessment findings to monitor for bleeding in other ways. Is there urine turning pink, hematuria, or they're bleeding renally? Uh, bloody vomitus, hematoemesis, there's bleeding in the GI tract. Do you just, you know, take their pulse, you press a little too hard and leave a bruise? They have hematomas very easily. Maybe you're watching their hemoglobin hematocrit and you slowly see it inching down and down. That's a sign that they're bleeding internally somewhere. So you have to be good at investigating all of these signs and symptoms and monitoring very closely to make sure there is no bleeding happening in your anticoagulating patient. Now, heparin has an antidote, so you know I'm going to tell you that we have to know that antidote. It's protamine sulfate. If they are bleeding tons and tons, heparin is out of control, APTT is way too high, you can give the protamine sulfate. They also give it frequently in the operating room to reverse heparinization if that's indicated depending on the procedure. Now, one thing I want to talk about as a side effect for heparin that's very important as nurses to monitor for is HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. 
So thrombocytopenia is low platelets. Thrombosis is clotting. So we have bleeding and clotting. This is a very complicated ICU level disorder. You don't need to know the million different ins and outs, but we do need to talk about the basics so you can monitor for it in your patient and get help if they develop it. This complication of heparin therapy usually happens between days five and 10. So anytime you see a patient on heparin with a platelet drop, you know, they go from 350 to 100, you need to be suspicious for HIT. Clinically, you're going to see bleeding due to the thrombocytopenia and clotting due to the thrombosis. So skin lesions at the injection sites, chills, fever, dyspnea, chest pain, those are symptoms clotting, like get CBTs, even a PE, and that's a very serious indication hit. So treatment is very, very complicated because we have two opposing forces, bleeding and clotting. So we need to treat the bleeding by discontinuing heparin and starting a different anticoagulant. And then we need to treat the clotting with that different anticoagulant and then treat the bleeding with things like FFP, fibrinogen, uh, factor eight, all sorts of different expensive and complicated products that you would be giving in an ICU. Um, it is a balancing act where you're walking the tightrope between treating the bleeding, treating the clotting. You are not expected to know the management of this disease. A lot of physicians struggle with the management of this disease. What I want you to know is that it's a complication of heparin, usually occurs days five to 10. You're going to monitor for it and you're going to suspect it if your patient on heparin has an unexplained and it is composed of both bleeding and clotting. That's how complicated it is. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about another anticoagulant because heparin, we don't really send people home on heparin. And what if they're in chronic AFib or they have a new valve and they need to be anticoagulated at home? Then they need to be on something different, such as warfarin, also known as Coumadin. So this anticoagulant is used for like venous thrombosis, PEs, AFibs. It's easy because we can discharge you home on it and our lab monitoring is a little easier. We can monitor your labs every few months instead of every four to six hours. That's obviously not realistic for real life. What warfarin does is works totally, totally different than heparin. Instead of working on that thrombin, fibrinogen, fibrin pathway for the intrinsic coagulation cascade, it disrupts liver synthesis of vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Vitamin K is synthesized in the liver and is necessary to make certain clotting factors. If we don't have vitamin K, we can't make the clotting factors, and we're anticoagulated. So for nursing considerations, it's going to be very similar. We want to monitor for bleeding, but we monitor a different lab. We monitor the PT and INR. Remember, we went over that international normalized ratio is the standard calculation of their PC value that we look at on a patient discharged on warfarin. We want them to have a therapeutic INR, which is going to be about two and a half to three and a half. For you and I, unless any of you guys are on warfarin, we're looking at more like one, less than one is going to be our INR. But for those patients that we need to be anticoagulated every few months, they've got to get lab follow-ups, make sure their dose is correct, and follow that INR. The antidote for warfarin, because it disrupts the liver synthesis of vitamin K, we want to undo it. All we have to do is give some vitamin K. Our body can make those clotting factors again, and they will stop anticoagulating. So again, most important to monitor for bleeding and um, know that anticoagulant in case there were to be excess bleeding. All right. Those are the two big anticoagulants for your NCLEX knowledge. Next, we're going to talk about a very common category, anticonvulsants. This is especially... Um, prevalent in our pediatrics population that deal with seizures a lot. Um, there's tons and tons of anticonvulsants. We could spend a two-hour lecture on different anticonvulsants. The one that is most commonly on the NCLEX is phenytoin or Dilantin. And the way that they all work can be slightly different, but they all have similar nursing interventions and side effects to monitor for. Other ones on this list, I would recommend you just kind of knowing what they are, are Levisutrasum or Keppra and Gabapentin. 
So for phenytoin, and remember a lot of this applies to those other anticonvulsants, the main indication is seizures. What it does is block those sustained high frequency repetitive firing action potentials that are causing those seizures to hopefully stop our seizure activity. We need to monitor the therapeutic level for phenytoin because we can have serious side effects if we're outside of that range, if it's too high. And if it's too low, our phenytoin really won't be effective. So the therapeutic level is 10 to 20. Now, therapeutic levels are another thing that you really do have to memorize for the NCLEX. Just like lab values, you want to make a flashcard with those therapeutic levels so that when you get a question and it says, a patient has a phenytoin level of 32, you know if that's normal or not, because that's going to clue you into what the correct answer is. The side effect that I want you to remember with phenytoin is a weird one. I don't know why the NCLEX likes to ask about this side effect so much, but gingival hyperplasia is the major side effect that the NCLEX asks about. So that's just overgrowth of the gum tissue. It's very important for patients on phenytoin to get regular dental checkups and use like a soft bristled toothbrush so they're not too hard on their gums. Okay. Next category for us is our antidepressants. Now, I actually broke this down even further into a few different types of antidepressants, and we're going to go through each of the um, highlighted ones. Bupropion, fluoxetine, paroxetine, and seratlin are different examples of specific antidepressants. And then MAOIs, SSRIs, and TCAs are subcategories of depressants, antidepressants that all work in different ways. So I want to go through each of those because the NCLEX really does ask about antidepressants a good bit. And we'll tie these all in on our last day with our mental health lectures as well. But important to know how they work and some very specific side effects. So first, I'm going to talk about MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. I'm not going to even attempt to say all of these names right here. I am not good at that. But these are your monoamine oxidase inhibitors right here. And you want to have a general idea that those are what they are. They're only indicated in very severe depression. What they do is block monoamine oxidase enzymes. And what that does it is increase the levels of all of your neurotransmitters. Your neurotransmitters are your dopamine, your norepinephrine, your epi, and your serotonin. So we're going to get a boost of all of those, um, all of those neurotransmitters to help with a very severe depression. But there are a lot of side effects that go along with a medication that, that's that serious. So the biggest one is a hypertensive crisis. So that's a blood pressure above 180 over 100 very severe, very acute, needs to be treated right away. And you'll need to be discontinuing the MAOI if they have a severe hypertensive episode. The other thing that I'm sure you guys remember from nursing school they talk about all the time are avoiding foods high in tyramine. Tyramine interacts with MAOIs and causes all sorts of nonsense. We cannot have patients taking MAOIs also eating foods with tyramine. And most patients aren't even going to know what that is if you tell them to stop eating tyramine. So you need to educate them that it's in things like aged cheeses, wine, and pickled meats. Remember that because I have seen so many NCLEX questions where it's like listing a bunch of different foods and asking which one should your patient on isocarbazid avoid. So you need to know that that's an MAOI and you need to know that those foods high in tyramine need to be avoided. So that was really for very, very severe depression. Let's draw it back to an SSRI. These are going to be kind of our first line antidepressants. And these are ones that you've probably heard of more, right? Fluoxetine, seratolin or Zoloft, escaltosalopram, catalopram. You can tell I'm really not good at um, pronouncing these. Um, so again, indicated for uh, depression, but more of a first line treatments, um, they just prevent the reuptake of serotonin. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So instead of that serotonin having being reuptook at the synapse, 
it prevents the reuptake, increasing the bioavailability of serotonin. So we just increase one neurotransmitter to try and lift up that depression. Two things that you need to remember for SSRIs are serotonin syndrome. We need to monitor for that, especially if you're adding a second medication that alters serotonin, because they can have a synergistic effect where you have a large increase in the amount of serotonin. Signs of serotonin syndrome are hypertension, confusion, anxiety, tremors, ataxia, and sweating. It'll be a very acute onset, and the SSRI will need to be discontinued. The other thing that goes for all of these antidepressants, but I'm going to mention it here, are suicide precautions. They are really important in the first two to three weeks of starting an SSRI for depression. That's because when patients are in a really, really deep depression, even though they might not want to live, they typically don't have enough energy to carry out a plan with ending their life. You know, to do that, you have to think through what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? But when you start taking that SSRI or MAOI or TCA, and then you feel a little bit better, you start to have some energy with that improving mood, and they now are able to carry out any plans that they've been thinking of. They have the energy to go buy a gun. They have an energy to pick up a knife. So you want to watch out for that suicide risk in the first two to three weeks of starting an antidepressant. Our last category is our tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, protriptyline. So there's that, that suffix of triptyline means to clue you in that it's a TCA. Indicated for moderate depression, what the TCAs do is prevent the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. So we're getting more of two of those neurotransmitters. So we've got the SSRIs, the TCAs, the MAOIs. Considerations for TCAs are monitoring for anticholinergic side effects. That's going to be things like a dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, uh, and blurry vision. They're getting really dried up. That's what an anticholinergic side effect is. And if we start to see considerable anticholinergic side effects with TCAs, a different type of antidepressant should be considered. Okay, so antidepressants is a big one to know for the NCLEX. Next, we're going to go through antihistamines. So you guys probably have a pretty good understanding of these. Diphenhydramine or Benadryl is your major one. Promethazine, I would also kind of recognize that name. Famotidine and ranitidine are also different antihistamines and gastrointestinal drugs that are prescribed quite frequently, especially in children. So we'll go over diphenhydramine. That is a must know for the NCLEX. It is indicated in allergies, anaphylaxis, and we can give it for some sedation. Many antihistamines have a calming effect and can be used for um, mild anxiety to sedation, depending on the indication. Um, so what it does is actually just antagonize the effect of histamine, antihistamine, which causes a little bit of CNS depression, which is why we can use it for that sedation. Nursing considerations are quite simple. You just need to monitor for drowsiness and watch out for those same anticholinergic side effects that we just went over. You know, blurry vision, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, all of those things where the patients get really kind of dried up are those anticholinergic side effects that happen when we antagonize histamine sometimes. Next category is a big one, our antihypertensives. I broke this down further into our different types of antihypertensives because these are really drugs that the NCLEX asks a lot about. I would recommend a thorough review of your antihypertensives. We have ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and then beta blockers are also sometimes used for um, antihypertensives as well. So if you look, these are ones that I can kind of remember the differences with, the, um, with their names. So the ACE inhibitors all end in this PRIL, ARBs end in this ARTIN, SARTIN, 
in calcium channel blockers and in this peen, amlodipine, nifedipine, there's a couple outliers there, but that can kind of help you group some things together to remember a lot of the meds. The beta blockers mostly end in lol, propranolol, metoprolol. So we'll go class by class as far as how the antihypertensives work, because I really think that when you get an understanding of how they work, um, you're able to grasp a lot better. So ACE inhibitors, enalapril is my example there, indicated for hypertension, CHF. What, and what ACE inhibitors do are block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. That increases renin levels and decreases aldosterone, leading to vasodilation. So we have our vessels getting bigger to decrease our blood pressure. The nursing consideration that is important to remember is the dry cough. ACE inhibitors can cause a dry cough, and if it persists, they do need to be discontinued. And then with all of our antihypertensives, a main nursing consideration is going to be monitor the blood pressure. I know that kind of seems dumb to even say out loud, like, of course, if you're giving a blood pressure medication, you're going to monitor the blood pressure. But a lot of NCLEX questions really are straightforward. They're going to go through this whole scenario where they tell you about a nurse giving an allopril, and they're going to ask you what you're looking for. And it might be kind of hidden in the answer choice, but what they want is that you're monitoring the blood pressure. Anytime you give a medication, you have to monitor for the expected outcome. And in the case of antihypertensives, it's a decreased blood pressure. So our next class of antihypertensive is the angiotensin II receptor blocker, or the ARB. These are the ones that end in, in AN, losartan. The indication, of course, is hypertension. Sometimes we give it in diabetic nephropathy or congestive heart failure. And what it does is just inhibit the vasoconstrictive properties of angiotensin II. So whereas before with ACE inhibitors, it converted, it stopped the conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Here we've let that conversion happen, but we're stopping the vasoconstrictive properties of that angiotensin 2 to allow some vasodilation and decreased blood pressure. So of course, monitor their blood pressure, monitor their fluid levels, monitor their renal and liver status. Next, we have our calcium channel blockers. These are like the amlodipine and nifedipine. They are indicated for hypertension as well as angina, that uncontrolled chest pain. What calcium channel blockers do is exactly what it sounds like. They block the transport of calcium into muscle cells by inhibiting excitation and contraction. So remember we said calcium is excitatory. We're gonna block the calcium from going into the muscle cells so they can relax. They can relax, they won't contract, they won't be as excitable, and that will help lower our blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers are another group of medication that can cause that gingival hyperplasia, that and phenytoin. So watch out for that. Advise them to visit a dentist regularly and use that soft bristled toothbrush. Next, we have our beta blockers. So these can be used for hypertension, but they have some other indications as well. And they end in those lol, propranolol, atenolol, metoprolol, esmolol. So you can kind of remember if you see any of those lols, you'll know you're working with a beta blocker. We actually classify them as an antiarrhythmic, but one of their indications is hypertension. We also give it in angina, cardiomyopathy, alcohol withdrawal, and anxiety. Large range of different indications. Let's talk about why. What it does is, again, a beta blocker does exactly what it sounds like. It blocks beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Those are receptors on the heart and lungs, beta-1 on the heart, beta-2 on the lungs, that deal with um, vasoconstriction and heart rate. So they control how fast the heart beats and the blood pressure. So we can do a lot by blocking those adrenergic receptors. We can slow the heart rate, cause some vasodilation, increase venous blood flow, and vasodilate enough to decrease hypertension. So that's why it's, it's indicated for all of these things. Anxiety, I always thought, was kind of a funny thing to give a beta blocker for, but if they get really tachycardic and flustered, um, then a beta blocker can decrease their heart rate and make them feel much more calm. So nursing considerations are that you do not want to discontinue it abruptly. You need to um, titer this drug downward to wean them off of it. 
And a really important one, especially if you have a diabetic patient that's then prescribed propranolol for hypertension or cardiomyopathy, is that it does mask some of the signs of hypoglycemia. Because it decreases the heart rate, they won't get that tachycardic, flushed, sweaty feeling that they often get when they're hypoglycemic. So it can be dangerous if they don't know that and then they don't feel any signs of hypoglycemia and then they pass out because their blood sugar is 20. So you need to make sure that they know that and regularly monitor their blood sugar even if they don't feel like their blood sugar is low. Our next class of medication is one we're going to go through very thoroughly because the NCLEX loves it. Digoxin. Digoxin is a cardiac glycoside, and it's the only cardiac glycoside that I want you to remember. I can almost guarantee that all of you are going to get a digoxin question in some way, shape, or form in your NCLEX test. So again, it is a cardiac glycoside. Indications are heart failure, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, CHF, and cardiogenic shock. What digoxin does is actually increase how strong the heart pumps, its contractility, and how fast the heart beats, the rate. So we can really increase some cardiac output. Don't worry, we're going to talk about cardiac output a lot during cardiac today. What it does is act on the cellular sodium potassium ATPase and it makes the heart more efficient. It beats stronger and faster to improve cardiac output, which is exactly what we need in heart failure, arrhythmias, CHF, and cardiogenic shock. In all of those states, the heart isn't moving blood forward enough like we want it to, and digoxin just help, it helps it work better. But we have a lot of nursing considerations. Toxicity is a huge problem with digoxin. You've got to know to monitor for these vision changes, blurred vision, and greenish yellowish looking vision. Let's talk even more about toxicity. Therapeutic levels, remember I said you've got to remember those, are 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter. That's a really narrow range, right? That's only like one and a half nanograms that we have for this drug to be effective, but not toxic. So patients on this drug have to have their levels monitored closely and they have to monitor their electrolytes closely too. Remember how we talked about sodium and potassium can really affect digoxin toxicity. They also need to know what the early signs and symptoms look like so that they can watch out for them before they become super, super sick. Nausea and vomiting, not feeling hungry, not wanting to eat, anorexia, and vision changes. They describe these like red, um, yellow and green halos around their vision. So make sure they know that and that they know it's serious, that they need to talk to their healthcare provider early if they start to have those signs. Like we've talked about, certain people are way more at risk for digoxin toxicity. A lot of it has to do with the electrolytes we just went over. Hypokalemia, if they're on a loop diuretic and digoxin, they're way more likely to become toxic because of their um, inclination towards hypokalemia, especially if it's like morosamide that weights potassium like crazy. Um, hypomagnesemia and hypercalcemia can all predispose a patient to digoxin toxicity. And of course, the poor elderly. Elderly patients really do have decreased liver and renal function, which means for all drugs, they just don't clear it as effectively as a younger kidney and liver does. That means it's faster to build up in their bloodstream and faster for them to become toxic. So they might start out on a tinier dose and we just have to watch them really, really carefully. Important nursing considerations are knowing when to hold the digoxin. So in general, and you should always check your patient's specific order and parameters. But in general, if you take your patient's pulse and it is less than 60, you need to hold the digoxin. So different for different age groups, definitely different for kids. But as a general NCLEX knowledge, if you get a question, you take the pulse, the pulse is 48, and one of the uh, options about your priority nursing action is holding the digoxin, that is the right answer. And I can't tell you how many times I have seen some variation of that NCLEX question. They definitely want you to know it's dangerous to give that digoxin if their pulse is too low. So, all right, that's my spiel on digoxin. 
Our next category is another big one, our anti-infectives or our antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals. This is another one that we could just spend hours going over every single one in the book, but I've never even met an infectious disease physician that knows every single antibiotic in the book. There are thousands and thousands of them, and the NCLEX tends to ask about the same ones. So we're gonna review them in those categories and go over the names of the ones that I really want you to make flashcards for to remember. Aminoglycosides is a very common category. That's the myosins, gentamicin is a common one. Fluoroquinolins is another important category. These are your fluoxetins, ciprofloxetin, levofloxin, macrolide antibiotics, erythromycin, azithromycin, Vancomycin is kind of in a class on its own over there, but we do need to go over vanc. Then you have a big one, your penicillins, your cephalosporins. So your amoxicillins, your ampicillins, so on and so forth. We're not gonna go over them here today, but it is important to know that we also have antifungal and antiviral um, anti-infective medications. Over on the right here, these are only good for bacterial infections. If we have a viral infection or a fungal infection, it is going to do absolutely nothing for these. So antivirals are like your acyclovir, remdesivir is popular right now. And then your antifungals are amphotericin. They often end in azole, um, metronazole, that's um, brand name Flagyl. Niastatin is an antifungal cream and powder. So having a general idea of those names and that they're an antifungal or an antiviral is good. You really don't need to know anything further for those specific drugs. Antibiotics though, I do feel warrant a little bit more discussion. So let's talk about the aminoglycosides, gentamicin. We typically use aminoglycosides for gram negative infections. And what they do is inhibit the bacterial protein synthesis. So bacteria just aren't able to reproduce and then they die off and you get better. Nursing considerations for aminoglycosides are that they cannot be administered with penicillins, pick one or the other, and that we should monitor for tinnitus. They can be autotoxic if we get the dosing wrong. So monitor for that ringing in the ears when you give an aminoglycoside. Next up, we have the fluoroquinolins. So ciprofloaxin is your key example here. What cipro does is inhibit the synthesis of the bacterial DNA. So just another way to stop the bacteria from reproducing and growing. You're gonna um, want to monitor for QT prolongation when you're administering fluoroquinolins. And you should know that those drugs do decrease the effects of seizure medications like phenytoin. So lots of complications, side effects, interactions when patients are on multiple drugs, and you wanna make sure that you are aware of that. Next, we'll go into vancomycin. Its technical fancy class is a glycopeptide antibiotic. You do not need to know that. What you need to know is that vanc is what you are gonna give if you suspect sepsis. Very serious infections require a big gun antibiotic like vancomycin. It's gonna kill the bacteria specifically in your intestines. So although it's a really good antibiotic, it unfortunately has many, many consequences. You need to monitor for both autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So monitor those kidney labs, BUN, creatinine, GFR. If you start to become nephrotoxic, you will have to discontinue the vancomycin and red man syndrome. I know plenty of you have heard about that. That's kind of your buzzword for VANC. A lot of patients we know get red man syndrome with VANC. It'll be listed as an allergy at the top of their chart and we'll pre-medicate them with Benadryl and Tylenol if we have to give them vancomycin. Hopefully we don't though, because they, their whole body turns bright, bright, bright red. They're very, very itchy, very uncomfortable. And if it goes untreated, it can start to cause some anaphylaxis and can lead to an anaphylaxis reaction. Another thing is that vancomycin cannot be given quickly. It has to be administered over at least 60 minutes, sometimes even two hours in a central line. If we give it peripherally, it has to be diluted in a lot of fluid because it can cause a lot of phlebitis and discomfort. 
All right, our last antibiotic is our um, uh, penicillins. Amoxicillin is your classic example there. Anything that ends in that suffix cillin, you can feel pretty good about being a penicillin and all of these things apply. We give penicillins a lot for like skin and respiratory infections. And what it does is inhibit the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall, which then causes the bacteria to die and be unable to reproduce. We do need to monitor for a rash when you're on penicillins and it can be nephrotoxic in high doses. So you also want to monitor those kidney functions, your BUN, your creatinine. It's a good rule of thumb to monitor kidney function on any antibiotic, antiviral, or antifungal. They can be a little bit rough on the kidneys. So knowing to keep a trend on those patients' labs is really, really smart. All right, lots of antibiotics, lots of names of drugs to remember. Just know, guys, you can go back and listen to this time and time again. I would recommend making flashcards of the drugs just like making flashcards of the lab values because it does take repetition to know all these guys. And remember that as we go through system by system, we're going to be practicing with these drugs and doing NCLEX questions with them too. So we're just we're just building the basic the basic blocks here of those must know drugs. All right, antipsychotics is our next group. Haloperidol, cutapine, and onzalapine are the different antipsychotics that I see commonly. Haloperidol is probably the most common. However, the NCLEX doesn't ask a ton of Haldol questions. So I just recommend knowing that it's an antipsychotic. The next system of medications or uh, class of medications is autonomic nervous system medications. So these are different medications that have some sort of effect on your autonomic nervous system. And a lot of them are our inotropes that we deal with when we're keeping somebody's blood pressure up. So butamine, dopamine, atropine, benzotropine. Atropine is absolutely the most important one to know. So we're gonna go into that a little bit more here. Atropine is considered an anticholinergic, and we also use it as an antiarrhythmic. So it has a couple of different um, indications based on the different things it does. If a patient has tons of excessive secretions and can't handle their secretions, that happens in babies like with a TE fistula or something like that. We can give atropine because it will inhibit acetylcholine and cause that decrease in secretions, kind of dry them up. Remember when we talked about anticholinergic side effects with drugs like TCAs? Well, that was causing things like um, vision changes, constipation, and dry mouth as a side effect. But with atropine, we actually want it to do this. That's what it is. It's an anticholinergic. The other indication is sinus bradycardia and heart block. So sometimes we'll have atropine ready at the bedside if we're intubating a patient and we're thinking, oh, their heart rate might go down and down and down. We can give it because it inhibits that acetylcholine and increases their heart rate. So if they've got heart block and sinus bradycardia, atropine can help boost that heart rate up. What you want to know is to monitor for those anticholinergic side effects. If it goes too far, we've dried up their secretions and then it continues to dry up more and more. It can cause urinary retention and constipation. And we want to avoid it in patients with glaucoma. That's very important to know because the anticholinergic effects of atropine on a patient with glaucoma can lead to them losing their vision. So we absolutely don't want to give them atropine. Next, I want to go over some different respiratory medications. And again, we'll weave this into respiratory this afternoon. But I think you need a good basis of theophenylin, albuterol, guanifepsin, and montelukast. Those are all different medications. Typically, your respiratory therapist is going to help you out if you're in a big institution where you have RTs. Uh, a lot of them are given via nebulization. We see them a ton in kiddos who have asthma and other upper respiratory um, infections and issues. And kids have lots of respiratory issues that we'll talk about in depth tomorrow. So albuterol, I want to talk about more. That is a bronchodilator. It's your classic bronchodilator that we give in asthma and in COPD. 
what albuterol does is bind to your beta-2 adrenergic receptors that are in the airway. Remember beta-1 in the heart, beta-2 in the lungs. And it leads to relaxation of the smooth muscles. Um, it's going to be, remember, bronchodilator, make busy, make bigger, relax those airways so that we allow some more airflow in and out, which in, when in an asthma attack, it's exactly what you need, more airflow. We do want to be cautious when we give albuterol to patients with heart disease, diabetes, glaucoma, or seizures, because it can have some pretty serious interactions. But in general, if a patient comes into your emergency department in an acute asthma attack, albuterol is going to be one of your go-to medications. All right, next up, diuretics. This is another big class, and we've already talked a little bit about some of these diuretics today. We have different types of diuretics that work in different ways, all to decrease the amount of fluid in the vascular system. We have our loop diuretics that we've talked about a lot with our different electrolyte imbalances. These typically end in mide, bumetanide, furosemide, torosemide. By far, furosemide is the most commonly one used on the NCLEX. You have your potassium sparing diuretics. Spironolactone or spironolactone is definitely the most common one for you to know. And lastly, your thiazide diuretics that typically end in thiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is the example I'm going to use that I see most often on the NCLEX. Just remember, you can kind of remember the groupings of these drugs and how they sound and apply all of our nursing intervention and side effects that we're about to talk about to those medications. So first, loop diuretics. Remember, furosemide is your classic example. And what it does is act on the loop of Henle to increase urinary output by affecting sodium reabsorption within the nephron. So it actually inhibits what's called the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter, causing sodium to be excreted in the urine. And remember, water follows sodium. So water follows the sodium, it goes out in the urine, and the patient is therefore diuresed. We use it to increase the urinary output, treat edema, any, any situation where we have too much fluid, fluid volume excess, so congestive heart failure, uh, blood pressure management in a hypertensive patient, a diuretic can decrease their blood pressure. The biggest nursing consideration that I feel like I've already said so many times is to monitor those potassium levels. It does waste potassium, and it's really, really important to know that you need to watch those potassium levels so they don't become hypokalemic, and that it affects other drugs like digoxin and phenytoin. We need to monitor all those levels. All of these things are interrelated. Loop diuretics are typically considered like the most effective of the diuretics. So a lot of times we go straight to Lasix is the first thing we use, but not all patients tolerate it. So we do have some other options. Our potassium sparing diuretics, for example, spironolactone or aldactone works differently. What it does is just inhibit sodium and potassium exchange via those sodium channels. And it works in the distal part of the nephron instead of that loop of Henle. So that spares the potassium. We don't get rid of the potassium. We keep it. We get rid of fluid. We get rid of sodium. We use this again, hypertension, edema, swelling. We also use it in hypokalemia. So maybe we put somebody in CHF on Lasix. They wasted a ton of potassium and now their potassium is uh, 3.1. And we're like, oh no, they're hypokalemic and we need to stop this madness. Well, we could switch them to a spironolactone and they'll hang on to more potassium and get back to that normokalemic level. Nursing consideration again, because we're messing with the potassium, monitor the potassium. If you have any inkling that it's off, put that patient on a cardiac monitor to make sure they're not having AKG changes with changing potassium levels. All these things are related. Um, potassium sparing diuretics are typically not considered as strong as a loop or thiazide. So sometimes we combine. Sometimes we do a loop and a thiazide or a potassium sparing and a thiazide if they're not tolerating the loop, any of those combinations, depending on the patient. So thiazide diuretics, remember, these are going to kind of end in the thiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide or diuryl is the most important to remember. What it does, it acts on a different part of the nephron on the distal convoluted tubule. What it does is inhibit the sodium chloride co-transporter, 
which increases sodium in the filtrate, which causes water reabsorption and therefore increased urinary output. Water follows sodium. It's amazing. All of that is how these medications work. So again, we give it for hypertension. We give it for congestive heart failure, edema, swelling, all of those things where we have increased fluid and we need to diurese some. Considerations are to monitor those electrolytes and monitor that blood pressure. You've just got to do it. Oops, scrolled too far. Next, I'm going to go into some GI medications. A lot of these you guys have probably heard of before and are pretty straightforward, but they're worth mentioning. Biscadel suppository to increase um, bowel movement, cause a bowel movement after constipation. Lactulose can be given for a couple of different reasons, but it is considered a laxative. It can also be used to decrease ammonia. Metochlorpromide, I can't say that one, but it's Reglan is the brand name, uh, is given Reglan, given for regularity to help with GI motility. On Zancitron, Zofran, we're going to talk about more. Omeprazole, we're going to talk about more. Pantoprazole, again, um, an anti-acid medication. So let's talk about Zofran and Omeprazole, just because even though you guys probably know most of these things, there are a couple of uh, nursing considerations the NCLEX loves, and they're pretty commonly used. So on Zancitron, is that anti-emetic, first line for nausea, vomiting, um, you can give it IV or a disintegrating tablet if the patient can tolerate that. It's cool the way it works. It blocks the effects of serotonin on the vagal nerve and the central nervous system to actually stop the brain from realizing you're nauseous and stop you from throwing up. So very, very effective for many patients. The thing that you have to remember that's like all over the NCLEX is that you need to give it slowly. By slowly, I mean about two to five minutes. Because if you just slam it all in there, it causes QT prolongation and can send the patient into VTAC, which is the last thing they need. You certainly don't want somebody who's just nauseous and vomiting to all of a sudden be in a shockable rhythm. So give it slowly, two to five minutes, watch their EKG for any QT prolongation. The other one that's given just all the time that I think we should talk about is a meprazole. This is what we call a protein pump inhibitor. We use it for GERD, for peptic ulcers, because what it does is stop hydrogen ions from being transported into the gastric lumen, which means that they can not produce stomach acids. So we decrease gastric stomach acid production, helping with GERD and helping with ulcers. It's best to give it like 30 to 60 minutes before a meal. That's when it will work best. But it's also really important to make sure you monitor for any occult bleeding that's going on. Because if we're masking the pain that comes with those ulcers and one of them starts to bleed, the patient might not realize it. And one of the ways that we see occult blood in patients with ulcers is in melana, which are those black, thick, tarry stools. And that's because upper GI blood has been mixed into those stools. It's been digested, and now it makes this yucky, black, gross stuff, um, which is indicative of blood, of a GI bleed. So we need patients to kind of monitor for that and know that if they see that, it's actually quite bad and they need to call their doctor. Um, so that's a good, good nursing educational point for you to remember. All right, moving right along, guys. I think we've got about 10 more drugs less, and then we'll hopefully break for lunch early so that you guys get a well-deserved longer lunch break. Um, let's see. We're going into some pain medications now. I'm going to start with our non-opioids and work our way up to those more intense pain medications that we so often see. Non-opioid analgesics, you always want to try this first before you go straight to opioids. We've got acetaminophen, Tylenol is in a class of its own. And then we also have NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Aspirin is a really common one. Ibuprofen or Motrin and naproxen are all NSAIDs. There's tons of different brand names and um, even generic names for these NSAIDs. So important to kind of know what they are. And I bet a lot of you already have a really good handle on these. For Tylenol or acetaminophen, 
it is considered both an antipyretic and a non-opioid analgesic, which means it can treat pain and it can treat fever. Those are your two indications for Tylenol. I promise you're going to give it a million times over your nursing career, but it's wonderful. It does really good things for our patients. The way it works is inhibiting the synthesis of prostaglandins, which play a role in the transmission of pain signals and fever responses. That's all you need to know as far as how Tylenol works. Inhibits prostaglandins, inhibits pain and fever. You do have some very important nursing considerations that are your responsibility. The max daily dose is four grams, four grams total for an adult patient. Now, Tylenol is a combo ingredient in a lot of cold and flu remedies, like I can't even, uh, NyQuil off the top of my head, things like that, that have a couple different types of medications in them. So if you don't specifically educate your patient on that, and they're taking Tylenol on top of taking NyQuil, and they're taking it as frequently as they can, they are going to overdose on Tylenol. They're going to have too much acetaminophen. They're going to overshoot the four gram daily maximum. So you want to be very clear with your patients that in total, in 24 hours, they cannot have more than four grams of Tylenol. Tylenol is processed by the liver. And so we need to monitor liver function when we're worried about Tylenol. Not BUN and creatinine, that's for kidney function. For liver function, you want to keep an eye on those AST, ALT numbers. Because if those shoot up, the liver is having trouble processing the Tylenol. Um, the Tylenol also has an important antidote for to remember, and acetylcysteine is the antidote for Tylenol. It's also unfortunately becoming more and more Tylenol more and more common that uh, suicides are being attempted by overdosing on Tylenol. So sometimes those patients will end up in the ICU on an acetylcysteine drip. So important to know that antidote and educate patients about the max doses. All right, our other very, very common um, non-opioid analgesic are our NSAIDs, our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Tons of different names for this. Aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen are a few of the most common. Um, definitely important to educate people that ibuprofen, Motrin, brand names, generic names, they are the same. They shouldn't be taking two of these NSAIDs together because they definitely can overdo it. We give NSAIDs for pain, inflammation, and fever. And they work also by blocking prostaglandins. They do block a different prostaglandin. So they're more effective when it comes to inflammation than Tylenol is. And they also can treat pain and fever. I will say we usually turn to Tylenol for fever and NSAIDs for inflammation. But as you can see, they both work in somewhat of a similar mechanism and are effective um, non-opioid choices for pain and fever. Nursing considerations for NSAIDs. The most important is that it can cause prolonged bleeding. So if you have a trauma patient come in, a patient that might have to go to the OR, a patient that for any reason you suspect bleeding, you do not want to administer NSAIDs. For example, I had a young man come in with a headache. We suspected it could be a brain tumor. He wanted to take Motrin for his headache, but until he got his CT scan and we knew that neurosurgery was not going to operate, we could not give him NSAIDs because it would be dangerous for him to go to the OR if he was anticoagulated and had that prolonged bleeding. So important to know that that is a side effect of NSAIDs. NSAIDs can also cause peptic ulcers. So we do try to avoid them in people with GERD on PPIs who have all that already going on. Um, I also want to talk specifically a little bit more about aspirin because aspirin has some other little nuances to it. It's still a non-opioid analgesic, antipyretic. It is an NSAID, but it has another indication. Stroke and MI prophylaxis. That's because in addition to aspirin inhibiting the production of these prostaglandins, reducing fever, reducing inflammation, Aspirin also decreases platelet aggregation. So that leads to a decrease in ischemic diseases like MIs and strokes and PEs and DVTs. It's some prophylactic anticoagulation that's really minimally invasive 
easy to do at home, very affordable. So our patients that are being discharged home after a stroke, after a heart attack, usually go home on one baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. Uh, very, very common to see. I think less and less people use aspirin for pain and fever, and more and more it's like a prophylactic ischemic disease um, situation. But you and I can still absolutely take aspirin for a fever or take aspirin for pain and inflammation. There's no downside to that. That's perfectly fine. It just also has that additional benefit of decreasing platelet aggregation. So of course, the nursing consideration we can assume is that risk of bleeding. We don't want to give it with other anticoagulants if the patient is on warfarin or heparin, and we want it to be DC'd prior to surgery. So say, for example, somebody uh, had a stroke and is at home on um, 81 milligrams of aspirin a day for prophylaxis, um, and they're coming in to have an elective procedure done, their surgeon is going to let them know when they want them to stop taking that aspirin. It's usually seven to 10 days prior to the procedure. And if they don't stop taking that aspirin and they're still anticoagulated, when they get into the OR, you can get into some serious trouble actually had this happen to my grandfather earlier this year. He didn't understand he needed to stop taking his aspirin before a surgery, and he majorly hemorrhaged during the surgery, and it was very scary. So it's a serious complication and a very important educational point as nurses to make sure patients know they need to stop taking that aspirin before their surgery. Another really important kind of buzz NCLEX word thing is Ray's syndrome. That can occur when you give aspirin to a pediatric patient that has a concurrent viral infection, and it is super, super bad. So as a rule, do not give aspirin to a pediatric patient for fear of Ray syndrome. That's um, kind of a buzzword for a random NCLEX question is Ray's syndrome. So I would remember that one. All right. We're moving into opioids. We went through Tylenol, we went through the NSAIDs. None of that's working for our patient's pain. So now we need to talk about opioids. I'm sure you guys have heard of all of these drugs, morphine, fentanyl, hydromorphone or dilaudid, methadone, oxycodone, all work very similarly. I'm gonna use morphine as the example, but I would recommend absolutely knowing all of those names of drugs and knowing that they are opioids. One to kind of pull out of there is methadone. Methadone is used as people are being weaned off of an opioid medication. You don't get the same high feeling that you do from morphine, fentanyl, dilaudid, but it does bind to those same receptors to reduce pain. So we can help wean people down with that methadone without causing super intense withdrawals. So let's go through what these opioid analgesics do. Major indication is really pain, severe pain, 7 to 10 out of 10. They bind to opiate receptors in the central nervous system, which is what alters their perception of pain, and it generally depresses the central nervous system. Um, so because it's a central nervous system depressant, we want to monitor their respirations. It can decrease their respiratory rate decrease their heart rate. They can even go into respiratory arrest and just stop breathing if we way overdo it on the morphine or the dilaudid. So have a good baseline of what their respiratory status is and monitor your patient very closely. If they do go into respiratory distress, respiratory failure, or you have a patient come in who has overdosed, maybe an oxycodone or the, of the like, the antidote for opioids is Narcan. So that's true of morphine, dilaudid, fentanyl, all of our opioid analgesics, the antidote is Narcan. You absolutely, absolutely need to know that one in case you have a patient come in who has OD'd and needs emergency rescue with Narcan. I'm sure you guys are all quite familiar with that as that becomes more and more common. All right, we're getting pretty close to the end here, guys. Th guys, four or five more drugs. We're gonna briefly touch on these obstetric medications, although we'll talk about them much more thoroughly tomorrow in our specialty maternity lecture. These are two that I see time and time again on the NCLEX, so worth going ahead to put on your radar. Oxytocin and mag sulfate are very important um, OB medications when we talk about labor and delivery. 
Oxytocin is a hormone. It's a natural substance in our body. Um, what it does is stimulate the uterus muscle to contract. It causes that positive feedback loop. We have contraction, we get um, oxytocin, it causes more contraction and it goes and goes and goes until we have a baby, hopefully. So we, we can use it to induce labor and cause those contractions, but we can also use it in postpartum hemorrhage when the um, mother is hemorrhaging and hemorrhaging and we need contraction of the uterine muscle to stop that hemorrhage. So two distinct but important indications for oxytocin. It is so, 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 so painful. Those contractions are like none other. Um, so nursing considerations are to monitor those contractions, monitor the fetus, and make sure to warn the mother that it's really going to hurt after she gets that oxytocin. The reason you really need to monitor that fetus is if we overdo it and our contractions are either too strong or too long or too frequent, when the mother is contracting, that fetus is not getting oxygen. They're getting oxygen during the breaks from contractions, which is why they happen cyclically. So if we're getting them really, really, really frequently, it's going to be so, so distressing on the fetus. They're going to start having what we call D cells or fetal heart rate decelerations. And we'll talk about all of this in our maternity lecture. But those are the nursing considerations you need to know for oxytocin. Let's talk, too, about magnesium sulfate as a drug. We already talked about it as an electrolyte. There's tons of different indications for giving mag sulfate in patients. I think it's very interesting. So if their mag is low, we can replace it with magnesium. If they're in torsades, we talked about mag, two grams IV push being a potential treatment. We can give it for preeclampsia and seizures to relax the central nervous system. And we can give it an asthma exacerbations as it causes bronchodilation. So MAG does all sorts of cool things that help us in different scenarios. What you need to monitor for after you give MAG is hypermagnesemia. If we've rebounded and gone too far, that can cause the confusion, the dizziness, the weakness, those decreasing reflexes, all of those bad things that go along with high magnesium. And you need to give it IV push slowly. I know we already went over that when we talked about replacing magnesium in our fluid and electrolyte lecture. Next up, we have steroids. And I do believe that this is the last group of medications that we're going to go over before lunch. So hang with me. And I know you guys know steroids. A lot of these drugs end in that zone, beta-methasone, dexamethasone, cortisone, flucosone, methylpregnazone, or solumedrol. This is the one we are going to talk about, but steroids all have similar actions. Betamethasone is more commonly used in obstetrics. Dexamethasone is more commonly used in like an acute allergy or inflammation. Cortisone and flucosone are more so used for endocrine disorders that are deficient in steroids. And we'll talk about those tomorrow in Indo to kind of give you an idea of what those look like. But methylpregnazone or solumedrol is by far the most common corticosteroid that we see administered to patients. We give it for inflammation, for allergies, for autoimmune disorders. And what it does is suppress inflammation and suppress the normal immune response. So we want to monitor for too much steroids when we give this, because if we give some steroids due to a deficiency in steroids and then we rebound and have too much steroids, we can start to see things like Cushing syndrome. We can start to see that buffalo hump. That would be really serious if we've overdone it there. And then we also have some standard side effects that happen with any steroids, immunosuppression. Remember, it suppresses the normal immune response. So they're more likely to have infections. Hyperglycemia, it's suppressing also the normal glucose regulation, and it's common to have some rebound hyperglycemia. We also see osteoporosis and delayed wound healing. Our bones start to break down. We have higher serum calcium levels, and our wounds don't heal as well with that high glucose level that's in our blood. Bacteria love glucose, so if we're hyperglycemic, it's really hard for our wounds to heal because bacteria just tends to hang out in there. 
So lots and lots of complications that happen when we're on steroids, which is a good reason to be hesitant to give them. If there's something else we can do for our patient, we try not to do long-term steroids. But in an acute allergy attack, you definitely will see either solumedrol or dexamethasone. If we've got lots of inflammation and swelling, specifically in the airway, you're almost certainly going to be giving steroids to help combat that. All right. Whew, I know that was so rapid fire. Tons and tons of info, guys. Great job for hanging in here. Remember, this is just the building blocks, okay? You've already gone through the hardest part. You're about a quarter of the way done with the course, and for sure, you've done the hardest part of it because we've really packed your core content into this morning. So when we come back from lunch, we're going to continue to build on that content. We're going to go over some basic core content, including lines, tubes, drains, um, isolation, restraints, EKGs, some easier stuff to kind of round out our fundamentals. We'll take another break and then we'll start going system by system. Today, we're doing cardiac, respiratory, and neuro. So arguably your three biggest systems. I told you day one is for sure the harder day. You've already got great building blocks, though, so we're going to continue to work on that. We're going to weave that through systems and do lots of practice questions together before we wrap it up for today at 6 p.m. Um, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, so you guys have a choice. We can either take a full hour lunch break and come back at 1.30, which is when we were scheduled to come back. Or if you would prefer, we can just do a 30 minute lunch break in hopes that we can wrap it up 30 minutes early today. It's totally up to you guys. Um, I'll just give you guys a few minutes to think about it. Let Go ahead and type me a message to let me know what you would like and we'll just go with majority rules. I'm totally fine either way. Sometimes it's nice to decompress for a whole hour. Uh, some people wanna just get it over with, you know? <sighs> 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. All right, 30-minute 30, 30 break is like overwhelmingly the most. Okay, so we're going to come back. It's 12.30, so we're going to come back at, oh my gosh, this time change. It's 1.30 for me, so 2 for me. 1 o'clock for Central Time is when we're going to come back, okay? Uh, so take a good 30 minutes. I'm going to go outside and see the sun, drink some water, have some lunch, so that we can um, get right back to it. Um, if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in I'll, and I'll come back and answer them after I take my lunch break. Um, so thanks for hanging in there, guys. You're doing fantastic. Um, and I will see you in 30 minutes.
got our pictures taken in front of the house for the Christmas cards, and that's all that matters. Um, I told Brad that this year we were for sure going to do Christmas cards. We are notoriously horrible at getting these done in time. But um, with us not seeing our families from Christmas, with COVID and moving across the country, we for sure put that at the top of the priority list. Um, um, Bo 15 will get you 15% off your artifact uprising order. Not only do they have holiday cards, this is currently the only place I have internet. <laughs> the kids are playing football out here while I make our Hey everyone, <clears throat> we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes to get back from our quick 30 minute break, regroup, just so you kind of know what's coming. We're going to do about an hour to an hour and a half to wrap up fundamentals or part one. That's going to go over first, we're doing lines, tubes, and drains. Uh, then we're going to talk about EKGs for 30, 45 minutes. Look at all the different ones that you're expected to know for the NCLEX. Um, we'll do some growth and development. I know everybody like really doesn't like growth and development, but the NCLEX asks like a crazy amount of questions of it. So we've got to go over it. 
Um, and then some basics, isolation precautions and restraints that you've just got to know um, before we move on to systems. Um, so then we'll we'll break and then we'll go system by system. We'll do cardiac, take a break. We'll do respiratory, take a break. And then we'll do neuro. And I will try my hardest since we took that 30 minute break to get us done by 530. Um, and of course, I'll hang around just in case there are any outstanding questions when we finish up to make sure that they all get answered before we um, break for the evening and go eat dinner and <laughs> come back here tomorrow morning. You guys are doing awesome. It is so hard to pack all of this into two days. And I know that a lot of other companies do it over three or even four days, but I've just found that it's so hard to find time in our schedules to actually have four or three days to take a class that it's almost better to just cram it into these two days, really focus on all of these high yield concepts, knowing that you can watch this video over and over, that you have these slides um, to review your weak points and continue practicing until you are ready to pass. Um, so hopefully everyone's back on. It looks like most of you guys are logged back in. I am gonna jump into lines, tubes, and drains. Here we go. It's a funny topic, but one that we've got to talk about. So I'm just gonna go by each type of line, tube, or drain that you need to know and talk about it briefly. NG tubes are the first and foremost. I'm sure you guys have all at this point either inserted one or taken one out or seen a patient rip one out of themselves but it is just a tube that goes into either nair and terminates in the stomach. So you can see it in this photo, in the nose, down to the belly. So what do we use an NG tube for? Enteral nutrition, decompression, meaning taking contents out of the stomach, giving meds, or removing contents of the stomach. So maybe somebody has overdosed and we are trying to take out that toxin from their stomach. Lots of different uses for that nasogastric tube. You do need to know the steps to insert an NG tube. Unfortunately, you could almost definitely get a question that has um, put these steps in order or select all that apply for correct actions. They're coming up with all sorts of different ways to test this. And all of these, or not all of them, but several of them, you do really need to know step by step how to put it in. So of course, you're always starting with your hand hygiene and talking to the patient. You know, guys don't need that to be explained. Uh, the way you measure is from their earlobe to their nose and then the nose to their xiphoid process. That tells you about where the belly is and how far you're gonna insert the NG tube. Mark it on the tube where it's at, put a little bit of lube on the tip of the tube and then you're gonna insert. As, once you hit resistance at the back of the nasopharynx, You'll ask the patient to swallow and tuck their chin to your chest. And that's going to help it pass down the esophagus because what else is back there? Their trachea. And we would prefer not to have an NG tube coiled up in their airway. That's going to be very uncomfortable. And if we deliver any medication or feeds into their lungs, we're going to have a horrible case of aspiration pneumonia on our hands. That's our fault. Which is why we always check for placement, right? But if they swallow and tuck their chin, hopefully it will go down the esophagus into their stomach. You keep advancing until you get to that predetermined depth, depth that marker that you put on there. And then you verify placement uh, and, of course, secure the tube. So let's talk about verifying placement because you need to know the correct way to do that. Gold standard right here, buzzword, is x-ray visualization. You want to see that tube in the tip of the stomach down here. What has happened in this x-ray is that we've dropped an NG tube. It's gone down into the airway, and we've fed their lungs. And look at this horrible case of aspiration pneumonia. That is just disgusting. <laughs> that patient is going to need to be on a lot of antibiotics. Um, and can swallow be sips of water? Yes, they can absolutely swallow sips of water while you're getting them to put that tube down, um, as long as they are not NPO for any reason. Sometimes we'll put, be putting an NG tube in because a patient is NPO. We need to decompress their stomach or whatnot, but if 
if their diet order allows sips of water, then you can do that to help them swallow. Or they can just kind of swallow without anything. Um, other ways that you will definitely read about and hear of people checking for NG2 placement is aspirating gastric contents. So pulling back with a syringe on that NG tube and seeing what you get out of the belly. And if you're getting uh, stomach juices, then you can feel, feel pretty good that you are in the stomach. Um, a older practice that you'll probably still read in textbooks, but is no longer best practice is auscultating air over the epigastrum. So using your stethoscope over their belly and putting like five, 10 cc's of air with a syringe into the belly and listening to hear it, Psh. especially on neonates. They're such small real estate that it's easy to hear that over even if it is over the lungs, you falsely think you heard it in the belly. So at least at my facility, that is no longer best practice. And 100% on the NCLEX, your gold standard is going to be x-ray visualization. A lot of facilities now don't allow you to put anything down it until you have confirmed with a chest x-ray. So those are your big things to know for NG tubes. Nothing too crazy. I'm sure you've worked with them. Just know how to insert it and that placement verification. Next, we'll talk about one with a little bit more ins and outs, our chest tubes. Uh, if you ever work in a cardiac ICU, you'll have so many, so many chest tubes. And all chest tubes are not created equal. So it depends on what you are draining. We can put in a chest tube for air if we have a pneumothorax or blood or fluid if we have a pleural effusion or a hemothorax. So a chest tube is simply a tube put into the pleural space of the lungs. You can see that right there, that chest tube going into that pleural space, that cavity surrounding the lungs. It can help remove air or fluid that has caused the lungs to collapse. If we're removing air, the chest tube's gonna be placed higher because gravity's gonna, um, air is gonna be floating up higher and we'll want to drain it from higher. In this picture, we have a pleural effusion. We've got some fluid that's collected um, in that pleural cavity and fluid and blood because of gravity sit lower. So our chest tube is going to be placed lower to help drain that. We have tons of chest tubes after cardiac surgery, not because we already have an effusion, but to help drain any blood or serosanguinous fluid from around the heart where we've just done surgery and prevent um, a buildup of fluid or pressure around the pericardium causing the heart to work really hard. So several reasons we could have a chest tube. Most of the nursing considerations you need to know are about this drainage system or atrium is what I've always been taught to call it. So let's talk about kind of the different components and things you need to know. There are all sorts of examples of NCLEX questions that have like uh, safety, what's your priority um, with these certain points. So save this slide, put a star by this one because I would I would put money on you getting a question about one of these things. Um, you want to keep the drainage system below the level of their chest. Now that just makes sense because we want it to drain out of them. If it's up here, it's just going to be draining into them. It's not going to go anywhere. You want to ensure the tubing is free of kinks and draining freely. Again, it makes sense. If the tubing is kinked, that fluid cannot escape. There should be no dependent loops in the tubing. Same thing, if we've got a dependent loop, meaning a loop like this that's hanging below and the fluid has to go up and over, it can't freely drain. So there shouldn't be loops, it should just be straight draining. And then of course you want to monitor the drainage. Um, COCA, C-O-C-A, is um, the acronym that I was taught for all fluids, all bodily fluids. You want to look at the color, odor, consistency, and amount. So color of chest tube drainage, is it serous, serous sanguinous, sanguinous? Why does the patient have a chest tube? What should it look like? Know that before you start taking care of them. Does it have an odor? You really shouldn't smell an odor from chest tube drainage. If you do, there is high suspicion for some sort of infection going on, and you would want to let your provider know right away. Consistency, usually thin to thick uh, blood. It could be thicker if it's sanguinous or thinner if it's starting to become more serous. And amount, that's what I really want to drive home about chest tube drainage is monitoring the amount, especially after a cardiac surgery. There should be no more than 100 milliliters per hour of chest tube output. 
If there is more, you need to call the doc and let them know. You should be marking it hourly. Very important to monitor the amount of drainage coming out of there. They may need blood product replacement if they lose too much blood. They may need monitoring for all sorts of different things, depending on why that chest tube is in and what they're expecting to come out of it. So now let's look at that atrium, like I said. Um, first, we're going to look at the water seal chamber. So that is right here. You see that blue little water seal, and that is what is keeping this as a closed system. So air is not entering this atrium. It can just flow right out of the patient into here without any outside forces. The suction control right here, if you have it to wall suction, you'll be setting what degree of suction based on what the surgeon has told you. If you just have it to water seal, there won't be any suction set up there. And then of course the drainage chamber right here, this is where it plugs into the patient and we mark the amount of our output hourly. Now in that water seal chamber, the water is going to fluctuate as the patient breathes. It's going to increase during inspiration and decrease during expiration. That is something that people always get confused about and the NCLEX loves to throw questions about what is normal and not normal when you're looking at this water seal chamber. So normal, so fluctuations as they breathe, normal. Bubbling, is that okay or not okay? Some bubbling is expected because air or fluid is leaving that pleural space. So as it comes in here, this is a closed system, there's going to be a little bit of bubbling. If there is vigorous or excessive bubbling, that means there's a leak somewhere and excessive amounts of air are entering this water seal chamber. So vigorous bubbling, not okay. Very, very small amount of bubbling expected. Now, if there's no bubbling at all, you wanna look into it further. That could be fine, it could indicate a problem. There could be that the lung is re-expanded, we're not draining any air or fluid, and the trust tube is ready to come out. Or there could be a kink, there could be a dependent loop. This could not be uh, below the level of the chest and it's not draining. So when it is draining, we expect some bubbling. If there's excessive bubbling, we know that there's a leak somewhere. And if there's no bubbling, we're either good to go or um, there's some sort of kink or occlusion that we need to address. So you need to look at it further. Now, the other thing that you need to know as far as nursing interventions is what you're going to do if that chest tube gets dislodged. That can definitely turn into an emergency situation and you need to know how to handle it. So you're gonna cover that site with a sterile dressing and tape it on three sides. Okay, why three sides? That seems really weird. Well, if we add a piece of tape over here and it's totally occlusive, if there's air that's trying to come out of there or fluid and we block it all off and it builds up and builds up, it could end up pushing the lung over and causing a tension pneumothorax. That is a medical emergency. It requires needle decompression and you do not want to be the person who has caused a tension pneumothorax. So you want to cover it with a sterile dressing so that no bacteria can enter into there, but you want to leave that one side open so air or fluid can escape and call the provider. Also, you want to stay with the patient. You don't want to slap that on and walk away and go get your healthcare provider. This is an example of an unstable patient because they're supposed to have a chest tube and it's just come out and we don't know what's going to happen. They could end up getting attention to pneumothorax. So it's imperative that you stay with your patient. When it comes to NCLEX questions, um, it's you always want to be wary of leaving your patient. You want to do anything you can to keep your patient safe. All in all, the NCLEX is a public safety test to make sure that you guys are safe to care for your patients. They don't expect you to know everything, but they expect that you won't do anything that will harm the patient. And this is why this is such a commonly tested NCLEX question, because if you tape it on all four sides, walk away and get the provider, you're harming the patient. So they need to know that you know, just to tape it on three sides, stay with your patient and call the provider. 
Another NCLEX testing strategy that I think goes really well with this certain situation is priority action. So if you were to have a question that said your patient's chest tube came out, which of the following is your nursing priority? And you have either cover with a sterile dressing and tape on three sides or call the healthcare provider. Which option are you going to pick? Which one of those is the priority action just between those two? Uh-huh. Yep, Jennifer. Cover cover with the sterile dressing. Exactly. You guys are awesome. That's because you're doing something to help your patient. If there is ever something you can do to physically help the patient, do that before you call the healthcare provider. That's going to be your priority action. Only choose call the healthcare provider if none of the other actions are going to be able to help your patient. So, We'll go over all those test tips at the very end of the course, but I feel like this is a good scenario to highlight that because covering with that dressing on three sides is totally your um, totally your priority action. Rochelle asks, how do you fix an air leak? So like an air leak in the system, it would be dependent on where that's coming from. So it's probably either a cracked atrium or tubing and you need a new system. Or if the tube is kind of coming loose, it's not sutured in, the doctor might have to fix that at the site. Um, more than likely, you're gonna have to get a new system if there's a leak and it's defective. But find out where that leak is coming from and then you'll know how to fix it. All right, our next line tube or drain is the Foley catheter. Of course, a uh, very common one that you guys will need to know and you'll use many a time. Foley catheter is just placed into the urethra and up to the bladder. It's left indwelling so that the urine can drain into a bag. Maybe they're requiring strict I's and O's, post-operative monitoring, whatever the case may be. They <clears throat> need to have that catheter to drain their urine. So this is another one that you need to know the sequence of how to insert the Foley catheter. Um, it's definitely could be an ordered sequence question, a select all that apply or something of the like. Of course, you'll wash your hands and don your sterile gloves. This is a sterile procedure. You'll put, you'll lubricate the tip of the catheter. How to clean with the betadine is a really commonly asked question. So make sure you know the difference between males and females and which hand to use. That seems to be asked a lot. For females, you, of course, use the non-dominant hand to spread the labia, and then you do three swabs, right, left, and the last one goes down the middle. That's with the betadine. For men, you need to make sure to also do three swabs. You need to retract the foreskin, and then you need to clean right, left, down the middle. This hand has remained sterile, your non-dominant hand is no longer sterile, so it cannot touch the catheter or your sterile field where you've set everything up. So you're going to continue to hold, use the dominant hand to um, insert the catheter, and um, continue to advance until you observe urine. Once you observe urine, you do advance about another one to two inches and inflate the balloon. Then you collect, connect it to the drainage system, secure it per whatever your facility's protocol is. The see, this sequence to me, I feel like it makes sense. You guys have either done this or seen this before, so I don't think you'll have trouble. The, the trick is just really knowing what hand they want you to use and how they want you to clean. That's very specific. And because we have so much emphasis around preventing these caudies, that seems to be something that NCLEX is asking a lot. So a few must knows when it comes to Foley's and that sterile technique, don't ever let there be dependent loops. Just like with the chest tube, urine wouldn't be able to drain if there was a dependent loop. But with a catheter, if urine is backing up in the bladder, we can then get an infection, a caudy a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. That's why it requires sterile technique to insert to prevent those infections um, because caudies are caused by us and the hospital's not reimbursed for them because we have caused them. That's why there's so much emphasis on how to prevent them. And most facilities actually use what they call like a bundle, which would be um, um, 
uh, like washing your hands, putting on gloves, Foley care every day, checking that there's no dependent loops or kinks. And somebody just asked what a dependent loop is. So I'm going to pull up a photo because I think that'll do better than my words can describe. Um, it's just a loop in the catheter that's unable to drain. So when it's unable to drain freely like that, then um, you can get urine backing up um, and that causes urinary retention and it's no good. So let's, here's a good picture. This will hopefully explain better than me just once you see it. Oh, it's very small. Okay. Might be a little bit hard to see. Let's see. So... This is just a fake patient and their urine bag up here. And you see this catheter goes down, 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 and then it has this loop right here. It has to go up to the, to the Foley bag. This right here is a dependent loop because it's, it's dependent because of gravity. It's hanging down and the urine isn't going to be able to overcome gravity and go up into this bag. So it's going to stop draining right here at the um, valley of this dependent loop and back up into the patient and that's going to cause urinary retention, uh, infection, all sorts of stuff that we really do not like. So that is the dependent loop. Now I've got to get this to go away. Oh my goodness. We're stuck on dependent catheter loops now. <laughs> no, go away. Okay, so, yep, so most of them have that bundle, which includes checking that there's no of those um, dependent loops, cleaning, always removing as soon as possible. So um, almost every day on rounds, if you have a patient that has a catheter, they're going to talk about why do they still have it and can we take it out? And sometimes the answer is no, but you do want to try to take it out when you can. Okay, okay. Next up is a Blakemore, a little less common, um, but these ones are kind of interesting. So a Blakemore is a tube that we put um, through the nose and into the esophagus down to the stomach like an NG tube, but it has this balloon that can be inflated to try and stop the bleeding of esophageal varices. It's also called a Stinson Blakemore or sometimes a Minnesota tube. I always just call it the Blakemore. Um, and it, what it does is just by inflating this balloon over here, it's putting pressure on any bleeding varices to try and hold pressure and stop the bleeding. If you've ever seen an esophageal varices bleed, it is intense. These patients are vomiting liters of bright red blood and can very quickly exsanguinate. The nursing must know if you get a Blakemore question on the NCLEX, this is what it will be. Keep a pair of scissors at the bedside in case of emergency. That's like the nursing must know action. And that's because if for whatever reason the gastric balloon becomes displaced, this gastric balloon here goes up and gets displaced in the esophagus, it's going to compress the trachea and cut off the airway. So then the patient is going to be in respiratory failure. So we need to be able to release that balloon and restore their airway. And you have to cut that gastric balloon inflation port. You cut that port, releases the balloon, you release the pressure on the airway. So you have to know that in your safety checks, if you've got someone with a Blakemore, you need to have a pair of scissors at the bedside. All right, a couple more tubes to go. Endotracheal tubes or ET tubes, very common in the ICU. You'll have probably more patients with them than without them. All an ET tube is, though, is an invasive artificial airway that we use when a patient can't protect their own airway. So it's this blue tube right here inserted in through the mouth and into the trachea so that we can ventilate for them and maintain their airway open and patent. Um, it can make, uh, deliver oxygen, positive pressure, and it's often just referred to as a breathing tube. Is what we always say to families. 
So this is exactly what it looks like. They can be cuffed or uncuffed. That cuff is right here. It can be inflated to keep it into place. The sides of the tube is right here. So this is a 7O and that's the diameter. And then these markings show you how far it is inserted. So you can make sure every shift that is inserted at the correct depth. Things that you just have to know about the ET tube is that you're always verifying your placement with a chest X-ray. Absolutely, absolutely have to verify with a chest X-ray. But after it's inserted very quickly, the first thing that you want to do is assess for equal breath sounds bilaterally. That is what lets you know, okay, I think this is in the right place. Let's get a chest X-ray. If you auscultate and breath sounds are more prominent in the right or they're absent over the left, it's probably because that tube was displaced into the right main stem bronchus. The right main stem is just a little bit wider than the left main stem, so it's not uncommon that it accidentally gets snaked down that way instead of staying midline. So that's why you want to make sure they're both heard bilaterally. There's no gurgling heard over the stomach. It's not unheard of to accidentally intubate the stomach, which is not what we want. If it's too far or not far enough, and you see on that chest x-ray, they can reposition from there. So that's your ET tube. Equal breath sounds bilaterally is what you've got to know. And lastly, we'll talk about a tracheostomy. So that's our more permanent artificial airway. We're gonna be using that for long-term needs. A stoma or a hole is made in the neck and the tube is just inserted directly into the trachea. So where the ET tube went in through the mouth and all the way down here, we bypass that whole thing with the tracheostomy and insert it surgically right there. Um, we use it when there's tracheal obstruction, maybe there's blockage right here and we can't pass the ET tube. If we're really having a hard time weaning the ventilator, sometimes inserting a tracheostomy helps. Maybe there's damage to the trachea or neuromuscular damage that doesn't allow the patient to support their own airway. A tracheostomy can give them um, that patent airway and allow them to live a higher quality of life. So this is what the trachea looks like. There's a few different pieces here. This is the trach itself. Just like an ET tube, it can be cuffed or uncuffed right here. This is the port to inflate and deflate that balloon. This is called the obturator. And this is another, this is an uncuffed tracheostomy here. But this obturator is placed right here so that it's easy for you to insert. And then as soon as you've inserted the tracheostomy, you have to remove the obturator. Otherwise, their airway is occluded, right? It's just easier to thread it in if you um, have that obturator in. So the nursing must knows for tracheostomies are really centered around infection prevention. Um, and we have one question about how long will ET, the ET tube stay inside? Great question. It totally depends on the patient. The longer that they are with an ET tube, the less likely it is they will ever be successfully extubated or have that breathing tube stay out. I have seen kids have a breathing tube for three months, but that is not the norm. I would say in the adult world, if you have a breathing tube in for longer than two weeks, we're going to start talking about a tracheostomy because it's really not good for your vocal cords and your throat to have that ET tube in. At some point, it's a little bit more beneficial to go ahead and proceed with the tracheostomy. So on average, I would say one to two weeks, but that's by no means like a rule of thumb. It depends on the patient and it definitely can be for way, way longer. When we are talking about a tracheostomy, after that ET tube has maybe been replaced with a tracheostomy, the nursing care is centered around infection prevention because, you know, usually when we're breathing in and out, you've got the nose, you've got the mouth, they're filtering out particles and all of these natural defenses that our body have are just totally being bypassed, which puts this patient at a hugely increased risk for respiratory infection. So we need to do daily tracheostomy care, cleaning the stoma, changing their trach ties, and closely monitoring for respiratory infection. Cough, runny nose, green, yellow tinge sputum, anything that makes you think they could have an infection, they should be evaluated for and antibiotics started because an infection can start quickly and become very bad. Another nursing, nursing must know is suctioning just to the pre-measured depth of the catheter. The um, 
surgeon will let you know exactly how far in that trach is once they've created it. And then you'll know how far to insert your suction catheter. If you go way too deep, you're essentially poking the back of your their throat. And that can cause not only tissue damage, but it can cause a laryngospasm and be very dangerous. Some kids will bear down and have bradycardia due to that vagal response. So you really, really want to avoid that. You just want to suction to that pre-measured depth. All right, those are all the lines, tubes, and drains that the NCLEX will ask you about. Are there any questions before we do our EKGs? So thoracentesis is a procedure. We will talk about that a little bit in cardiac if for a thoracentesis um, emergency, but that is not a line or a tube or a drain. We could do a thoracentesis and then put a chest tube in, um, but that itself is a procedure. Thoracentesis allows us to drain some fluid off of there temporarily, but they often do put a chest tube in afterwards. All right. Ooh. Time is sectioning PRN. Is this prescribed? That again is going to depend on the patient if they prescribe a certain amount of suctioning or it's PRN. I would say suctioning can always be as needed. You can use your nursing judgment. If you see secretions, you don't need to ask for a doctor's order to go suction them. Go suction them. That's part of your daily care is in maintaining their airway. Some patients might have a like you every four hours, you're going to do this. You're obviously going to be suctioning with trait care and whatnot. But 100% that is a nursing care that you can do um, at your discretion. Never forget to suction. And never forget the mouth too. Even if you have a trached patient, you still want to make sure you're cleaning their mouth. Some people kind of forget that they still have a mouth and it's yucky. Okay, next up, we're going through our EKGs. So we're going to spend give or take about half an hour here. I'm going to go through each of the rhythms that you need to know for the NCLEX. Please know there are tons of other rhythms. This is by no means every single tracing that you would ever see. That would take forever, and we're not cardiologists, but these are the rhythms that the NCLEX tends to ask about. So I'll start off really easy. We'll kind of work our way to the more dangerous ones, and we'll just start with looking at what normal sinus rhythm looks like. This is definitely something that you need to know what it looks like because they could show you a strip and say, what rhythm is this? And it's totally normal. That's not off the table. And not normal. So these are the different, the five different uh, traits that you're going to use to evaluate your EKGs and figure out if you're in normal sinus rhythm or not. First, you're going to look at your P waves, okay? That's this wave here before your big QRS complex, and you want to have one P for every QRS. Next, you're going to look at your PR interval. So that is the interval between the end of the P wave and the beginning of this complex. It should be 0.12 to 0.2. Next, you'll look at your QRS complex. It should be nice and peaked like this, pretty narrow. You want it to be less than 0.12. You don't want a really wide QRS complex. Next, you will look at the rates. You will count the rate for these rhythm strips. Six, and I want it to be 60 to 100. So this strip is 10 seconds long, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beats. So this heart rate is 70, right? So anything between 60 and 100 for an adult, a normal adult, is what we consider normal. Now, there are well-conditioned marathon runners that have a heart rate in the 40s, and that's okay for them. There might be people who typically live with a bit of a higher heart rate, and this is totally, totally age-dependent. For my little babies that I take care of, uh, totally different heart rates, and we're going to talk about those normal vital signs for peds in our pediatric section. But when the NCLEX throws a strip your way, you can assume, unless they give you a different age, that it's an adult. The last category is looking at regularity. So we want to see that these QRX complexes are at regular intervals. We don't have one and then a long pause and then another two. 
they're coming at very regular intervals. So this is textbook normal sinus rhythm. And you're gonna use these same five criteria to evaluate every other rhythm. So let's move on to our next one and we'll do the same thing. All right, so for sinus bradycardia here, you see that we still have our normal P waves, one P for every QRS, our normal PR interval, our normal QRS, but our rate is less than 60. Our rate here is 40. It's regular. The QRSs are marching out at a regular rhythm, but it is less than 60. So this is sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia can be caused by really deep sleep, inactivity, somebody who's very athletic, that well-trained marathon runner that we talked about, certain drugs like propranolol, those beta blockers that slow the heart rate, or a myocardial infarction can slow down the heart rate. So many different causes, some benign, some not. You'll want to investigate why this patient is in sinus bradycardia, if it's normal for them, if it's a benign cause or a symptom of something more serious. It doesn't always have to be. On the flip side, we're now going to look at the heart rate being too fast. So what does sinus tachycardia look like? Again, all of these parameters are normal except for the rate. Our rate is just greater than 100 in this patient, right? So we see a P for every QRS, a normal PR interval, those normal T waves, the regular rhythm, they're marching out at the same time, but the rate is greater than 100. So they're in sinus tachycardia. Many, many different causes of sinus tachycardia. It could be caffeine, exercise, fever. One of the first things I do when my patient is tachycardic is take their temperature. A lot of times they get tachycardic before they actually spike that temp. Sometimes they're working on a temp. Um, if they're very, very anxious, having a panic attack, certain drugs can increase the heart rate. A patient in pain typically has a higher heart rate. Hypotension, like you guys said earlier, that heart's working hard to compensate, so it might become tachycardic. Um, and volume depletion, that kind of goes along with our hypotension. Maybe we're having lots of vomiting, diarrhea, fluid volume deficit, hypotension, heart rate increases to compensate. So again, tons of reasons why we could be in sinus tachycardia. Not necessarily a bad thing, could be benign could be a lot more serious. So you need to investigate the cause. Um, if you see a strip like this on the NCLEX and they're asking you, is it sinus tach? Is it SVT? Is it VTAC? Don't freak out. Just remember to evaluate it by these five different protocols. Look at the P wave. Is it normal? Is there one for every QRS? Look at the PR interval. Is it 0.12 to 0.2? Look at the QRS. Is it less than 0.12? Look at the rate. Is it greater than 100? Sinus tack. Um, and then look at the regularity. So if you ju just simply follow that um, pattern of evaluating them, you'll quickly be able to determine what rhythm this strip is in. So those were our easier ones. Now we're going to move on to our atrial rhythms that the NCLEX asks about, a fib and a flutter. Those can be a little bit trickier to determine the difference between, but I've got some tricks. So in atrial flutter, your NCLEX buzzword here is sawtooth. And you guys can probably see why they call it sawtooth. Look at this. It's like the sawtooth on a serrated knife or a, a, what do you call that thing uh, that you cut down a tree with? Uh, you know what I'm talking about. That's sawtooth saw, I think. <laughs> it's a saw. So you see that sawtooth, that serrated edge, and that should key you into atrial flutter. And sometimes the NCLEX will even say sawtooth. If they do, you for sure know you've got atrial flutter. So what's happening here is the atria are just irregularly fluttering. They're fluttering at a rate of 250 to 400. And the rate looks like that. That's not actually how fast the ventricles are beating. It's the atria is what that lead is picking up on. It's fluttering so fast um, that it really can't fill with blood well. It's not relaxing enough to fill with blood. So you're losing a lot of cardiac outputs. There's really no PR interval here because it's just like P, 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 
and then a complex. There's not a good way to measure our PR interval. It can be regular. In this case, it's pretty regular. We see three flutters, a QRS, well, two flutters, a QRS. So a little bit irregular. It can be either way. The key is that you're looking for these sawtooth flutters. What causes atrial flutter? Either heart disease, ischemia of the myocardium, a myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, or pericarditis, where that pericardial sac surrounding the myocardium is inflamed. All of that inflammation can make the heart do funky things, and the atria might just be fluttering, not knowing what to do. So atrial flutter is not necessarily an emergency. A lot of patients tolerate this. And what do I mean by they're tolerating it? Because I'm going to use that phrase a lot in the upcoming slides. If I say a patient is tolerating a rhythm, what I mean is their blood pressure is remaining stable. Their perfusion is okay. They have pulses, they're warm, they have brisk, brisk cap refill. All of those assessment findings that tell me about their perfusion are fine. They're tolerating that arrhythmia. When their blood pressure starts to tank, then they're no longer tolerating it and we have an emergency. So that's what I mean by that terminology. So some people tolerate atrial flutter fine and we still, we wanna think about how to get them out of it, but it's not an emergency, we have some time. And some people don't, some people immediately, blood pressure gone and we have an emergency on our hands. Most people I would say tolerate it at least for a brief period of time. From there, we progress to atrial fibrillation, AFib. And you've probably heard more about this one it's relatively easy to identify because all we have are these wavy little lines. We don't have P waves anymore. In a flutter, we had those sawtooth P waves. Now the atria are just quivering. They're not doing any sort of contracting. You're losing all of their atrial kick. They are not really helping with cardiac output. The ventricles are still working and you see that represented by these QRS complexes. They're still, the ventricles are still kicking. They're doing exactly what we want them to do. So they're contributing to cardiac output. But in between, these atria are just quivering. It's, it's described as like a wavy line. So there's no P wave. There's no PR interval. The machine is reading this rate as something insane, like 400, because all it's seeing is just those quivering atria and it's counting each of those as a rate. So it's, it's, not, it's not an accurate rate. The ventricles are not beating 400 times a minute. Very, very irregular. You can't see anything regular about this because we've just got wavy atrial lines between ventricular beats. So again, some people tolerate this. Some people don't. Some people live in atrial fibrillation. And we talked about the need to anticoagulate those patients because as their atria quiver, blood pools and clots. And if it dislodges into the ventricles and is sent out to the body, we could have a PE, an MI, a stroke, any number of complications on our hand. So patients being discharged in atrial fibrillation do need to be on an anticoagulant. Now, a lot of times patients are not tolerating atrial fibrillation and we need to get them out of it. We need to do an ablation. We need to do cardioversion, um, any of those things that can get him out of that rhythm. Causes of atrial fibrillation are heart disease, disease to the actual muscle of the cart, causing it to quiver like that. Pulmonary disease can be really detrimental to the heart, specifically the right side of the heart. It puts a lot of pressure on it. Intense amounts of stress, alcohol, and caffeine also unfortunately can induce atrial fibrillation. That would be over a long period of time. That wouldn't just come on one day randomly, but for very long periods of time, the body does not like that. It really does not appreciate high, high levels of stress, alcohol, and caffeine, and it can cause arrhythmias. All right. Those are the atrial rhythms that you could see on the NCLEX. So next we're gonna move into our ventricular rhythms. First up, we have superventricular tachycardia. So this is a super important one to know for the NCLEX. We talked about this in um, FARM when we talked about giving adenosine. Adenosine is sometimes given to convert patients out of superventricular tachycardia. So what, how do we know this rhythm is SVT? Some people get this confused with sinus tachycardia. There are P waves, but they are hidden. They're really hard to see. That's not the P wave. That's actually the T wave of the last complex. 
they're hidden in the T wave of the last complex. So we can't measure the PR interval. It's immeasurable. QRS is normal. The rate is going to be in adults. The textbook says 150 to 250. At my hospital, we will not count um, it to be SVT for adults until they're above 180 and for children but until they're above 220. So check your facility policy, but the rate is going to be quite high when we determine that it's supraventricular tachycardia. It is a regular rhythm. The distinguishing characteristic is this lack of P waves. When I evaluate an EKG to try to determine if a patient is in SVT, I'm looking for those P waves. And if you can easily find a P for every Q and a good PR interval, it's probably sinus tap, depending on the rate. Whenever you can't find P waves and you've just got these jagged, these are the T waves from the previous complex and they're jagged like that, that's going to be SVT. To get them out of it, sometimes we use that adenosine. Sometimes we have them bared down. Vagal ice to the face works, especially in babies sometimes. Sometimes patients need to be cardioverted or long-term get an ablation if they're having a lot of trouble with this arrhythmia. Again, some patients tolerate it for a little bit of time. This isn't really something we would send a patient home in, whereas with AFibs, sometimes we would. SVT, you're probably not going to leave the hospital in SVT if we have anything to do about it. Um, we're going to try to get you out of it. But sometimes it can be very, very emergent, can be totally life-threatening. Their blood pressure can tank. They can lose pulses, or they can tolerate it for a period of time before they start to kind of lose their pressures. Causes of SVT, again, can be intense use of caffeine, congestive heart failure, fatigue, hypoxia. The heart does not like any hypoxia or lack of oxygen. And if there's something wrong with the pacemaker of the heart, that sinoatrial node, if there's something defective, they have some sort of heart disease going on, that can send you into that supraventricular tachycardia. All right, that's one of my favorite ones. And we do see that in the cardiac ICU a good bit. If you ever get the chance to work there, I'm sure you will see it. So three more to go. We're getting into the more serious life-threatening arrhythmias, and you need to be able to identify these for the NCLEX. These are fatal arrhythmias. So if they show you a strip and you're not able to determine what it is, they're worried that you would miss this on a patient, which could lead to their death or harm. Remember, this is a public safety test, so you want to make sure you can pick out those things that are fatal and call for help. Ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, is a super big emergency that you want to call for help right away. So when you go to evaluate it, there's no P waves. There's no PR interval. The atria are done at this point. First they were fluttering, then they were quivering. They're gone. The atria aren't doing nothing anymore. Now the ventricles are having dysfunction. You know, before we were still seeing good QRSs. Now this QRS is greater than 0.11. Remember we wanted it, or less than 0.11. Remember we wanted it to be between like 0.12 and 0.2. Sorry, I scrolled. Um, now it's wide and bizarre. That wide and bizarre is your key word for ventricular tachycardia. When you see wide and bizarre, you want to think VTAC. Rate, again, is going to be super high, 150 to 200, and this time it is the ventricular beats that they're counting. It's 150 to, 150 to 250 beats of the ventricle every time, but it's this wide and bizarre QRS complex, and it is regular. It's like these tombstones that are marching out at a regular rate, but wide and bizarre. It can be caused by myocardial infarction, ischemia, digoxin toxicity, hypoxia, acidosis, hypokalemia, hypotension. Um, the causes moving forward of VTAC, VFib, asystole, there's a mnemonic that they will teach you if you ever take advanced cardiac life support, ACLS. When we get to this point where we've had a cardiac arrest or a patient has entered one of these rhythms and we're not having success following the algorithm to treat it, we have to think about what is causing this rhythm. And the mnemonic that they'll teach you are the H's and T's. The H's are hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion excess, which means acidosis. Too many hydrogen ions means acidosis hypo or hyperkalemia, and hypothermia. 
temperature irregularity. The T's are attention pneumothorax, tamponade, thrombosis, so that could be your MI, a PE, a stroke, and toxins, like digoxin toxicity. So you want to run through those H's and T's in your head and think if any of those could be happening to your patient and try to reverse that cause. That's going to be your best bet of getting them out of this rhythm. You can have a pulse with VTAC. If it is sustained and with a pulse, they will likely lose their pulse in you know, the coming minutes. They don't usually sustain this for a super long period of time. Although I have seen some patients hang in VTAC for longer than I would have liked. It's kind of a weird rhythm to see somebody in when they're awake and looking around. But you want it, the algorithm for ACLS will diverge between pulseless VTAC and VTAC with a pulse and what you need to do. Pulseless VTAC is a shockable rhythm. These are both life-threatening arrhythmias that you need to be able to identify the EKG strip for. So from here, we've got the ventricles, the atria are gone, ventricles are beating with this wide and bizarre tachyarrhythmia, and then we progress to ventricular fibrillation. So at this point, the atrias are doing nothing and the ventricles are just quivering. They're just fibrillating, just like an AFib. So all you've got is this wavy line, no P wave, no PR interval, no QRS, no rate, totally irregular wavy line. Same things that can cause it, same H's and T's, okay? It is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. It is always a life-threatening arrhythmia. It is always a shockable arrhythmia. Luckily, it's pretty easy to distinguish what it is on the EKG because you need to know this one for the NCLEX. If this shows up, you definitely need to know that this is VFib or the NCLEX is going to say they're not safe to take care of patients. VFib can look a little bit different. It can be flatter than this. It can be bigger than this. It just depends on how much the ventricles are quivering or fibrillating. But anytime there's just waves, 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 totally irregular, then you've got your ventricle fibrillation. And last but not least, we have to round it out with asystole. Absolutely nothing going on here. We've usually had either a VTAC or VFib arrest, and then the heart has stopped. We're in asystole. You can have like some random P waves pop up as the atria kind of sputter. That's not considered um, a return of spontaneous circulation or any purposeful cardiac activity. That's just the heart kind of sputtering as it gives out. Obviously, none of this will even be applicable because you have no activity. You want to um, be addressing all of the H's and T's that we talked about, the hypokalemia, hypoxia, acidosis, toxins. Think about all those things that could be reversible causes of the cardiac arrest. There will be no pulse at this point. And I think it's really important for everyone to know what is your immediate priority nursing action. If you just walk into a room and you have a patient in asystole, you get to choose one thing to do. What are you going to do? Good job, Jocelyn. Yes. I'm glad you know that. Good job, Louis Dean. Yes, Rochelle. Good job, guys. Absolutely. You're going to walk in the room. You're going to spend no longer than 10 seconds feeling for a pulse. There's no pulse. You're going to get on the chest. Compressions. Compressions is what you want to do. You want to start compressions and pull that code bell. I used to be super confused as to why we didn't shock asystole. To me, it seemed like it should have been a shockable rhythm, but it's not. There's no electrical activity happening here. This patient is completely flatlined. And if we shock them, it's going to do us absolutely no good. We can shock VFib or VTAC because there's electrical activity happening and we're trying to get it synchronized into normal sinus rhythm. With asystole, there's nothing to shock. So you just need to start CPR and call for help. So awesome job, guys. You guys are way smarter than I was in nursing school. <laughs> All right, the next thing we have is growth and development. I'm gonna pause here. There was one quick question when we were back in the atrial um, arrhythmias, AFib and a flutter. Afwana asked, is it counting atrial or ventricular beats at 400? So that was for atrial fibrillation. And Afwana, that was counting the atrial beats. It's not, and they're not even really beats. The machine is just picking up on all of that quivering 
and calculating it as a rate of 400. The ventricles are not beating that fast. There's not a rhythm where the ventricles are beating 400 times a minute. The fastest ventricular rhythm would be that VTAC with like 150 to 250. Are there any other EKG questions before we do our growth and development? I know you guys are so excited for growth and development. It's just the best. <laughs> All right, well, we'll power through it. We only have about 30 minutes to go, and then we're done with part one fundamentals. And we'll take a good long break before we dive into our systems to kind of round out the day. Um, do we need to know the meds for the EKGs, Golda asked. Um, do you mean like the, your, um, like give epi every three minutes type of thing? Probably. Um, yes. So at a very, very basic level, you should know that epinephrine is given in a code. Do you need to know the dose and the frequency? No. You're not expected to have taken advanced cardiac life support at this point in your career. You are expected to have BLS, basic life support. So you need to know the compressions, the depth and rate of compressions, um, breathing to watch for chest rise, how quickly to bag. Those are things that you are expected to know as a new nurse. The NCLEX thinks that you are a new nurse with two general weeks of nursing knowledge. Those nurses do not yet have ACLS. You typically don't take that for a one to two years into your career. And if you don't go into the ICU, you might never take it. So giving code drugs like epinephrine is not in your scope as you start out as a nurse. So should you know that it's given in a code? Yes. Do you need to know the specifics? No. All right. Into growth and development. Onward we go. Easy seems like something that you shouldn't have to spend much time on, but there seriously are so many growth and development and CLEX questions that it's worth going over to help you guys remember some of the key concepts. I won't dive into it too much. I'm just going to hit those highlights that I know there are NCLEX questions on. Two theories of development that they ask all the time. Erickson's stages of psychosocial and Piaget's stages of cognitive development. Yes, there is also Freud. They ask about that less, so I would focus your time on these two. Having a general idea of Freud isn't going to hurt you, but definitely put your focus on these guys. Erickson especially is asked all the time. They want to know that you know the general stages, what ages they're for, and what happens in those stages. So we're going to break down each age group, talk about it quickly, and talk about some of the highlights that I see questions asked about all the time. So first, we're doing infants. So for Erickson, infant stage is trust versus mistrust. That's his stage of psychosocial development, and it goes from birth to 18 years. So that focuses on mom as a caregiver, their needs being met. Um, they have to learn to trust others, like those who care for their basic needs. So it's focused on forming that relationship with their mother and father. Um, he says that small babies view the world as threatening because they're depending on others for their survival. So how they're treated by their caregivers develops that sense of trust and mistrust. So if a caregiver is sensitive, they respond to the baby's need, they change their diapers promptly, that baby will develop trust. On the other hand, if the caregiver is totally unresponsive, they let them, you know, cry all day in a dirty diaper, those, in, those infants will develop mistrust and they'll be stuck in that stage. The whole premise is you have to develop one of those stages of psychosocial development to move on to the next or you get stuck in the current stage if you're not able to achieve that. Um, so then for Piaget, he's focused on the cognitive development. So his actually goes from birth to two years, a little bit longer than Erickson, and it is sensory motor. So it's children gaining knowledge through their senses and their motor movements, which makes sense. You know, all the, the babies are exploring, they're sucking on their thumb, they're feeling things, putting everything in their mouth. They're learning about the world through those basic senses. 
um, some milestones that kids typically hit in the infant age. A social smile is developed at like six to eight weeks. So that's just when, you know, they know to smile in a social situation. And object permanence is developed around nine months. So that's when, you know, you hold the pencil in front of them, you put it behind your back, they know it's still there. They know that the object still exists, it didn't disappear. And then stranger anxiety is also developed around nine months, which I'm sure you've all experienced with pediatric patients. If you've had clinicals at that point, they really don't like you coming in the room and are very anxious around people who are not their mom and dad. Um, so typically around my, nine months is where they gain that. If they don't hit these milestones, then you want to kind of ask why and investigate what's going on. Okay. So next stage. There you go. Next stage is toddlers. So for Erickson, toddlers is um, autonomy versus shame and doubt. That goes from the 18 months old where infancy ends all the way up to three years. And during autonomy versus shame and doubt, what children are doing are trying to develop a sense of personal control over physical skills and like a sense of independence. They want to feel independence that leads to feeling of autonomy. And when they're not sex successful, they feel more like a failure. And that's what's resulting in their shame and self doubt. One of the major tasks that we use to kind of explain this stage is the toilet training task. They're learning to go to the bathroom on the toilet. And if they're able to gain that independence, they'll feel autonomy. And if they fail at that, they'll feel shame and doubt. Um, they're really struggling with like the personal control, establishment of self, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the main thing for them to progress through the autonomy versus shame and doubt phase. For Piaget, focusing on their cognitive development, he is in the pre-operational stage, starting at age two. So after they move into toddlerhood, um, where they're in the sensory motor stage, just exploring the world through their senses, they move into the pre-operational stage where they start to think more symbolically. They're using to learn words and pictures. You know, they start pointing to an apple in a book. They start to talk and say apple. They are very, very egocentric. They struggle to see things from anyone's perspective but their own. And they're getting better with language and thinking, but they're very, very concrete. Um, for example, if you're doing an eye test in a two or three year old and you say, OK, cover your right eye and you're reading the arch eye chart. And then you say, now cover the other eye. They'll probably go like this. They they are not going to be able to abstractly think that by you saying cover, OK, cover the other eye. You want them to uncover that eye and move their hand over. They're just going to cover them both very concrete terms. You don't want to use abstract thinking or generalizations to uh, communicate with them because they really will not understand. Now, two different types of play that happen in the toddler stage are parallel and symbolic play. Parallel play is they're like next to each other or in the same area, but they're not interacting. They're not trying to influence each other. They're still in their own bubble playing. They also use symbolic play, make-believe, where they use objects or actions to represent things. You know, they pretend that the fairy wand can make them fly or whatnot. That magical thinking and symbolism starts to come into play. So that's the toddler stage. And remember, maybe write these different stages and ages down on a flashcard with all of your other stuff, because just knowing what stage the different ages are in really comes in handy on the NCLEX. So after toddlerhood, we move in to the preschoolers. For Erickson, this is the three to five year olds. Um, and they are in the initiative birth, um, initiative versus guilt. So initiative versus guilt. Um, they, um, have started to develop that sense of purpose when they're toddlers, they're exploring, they're doing on things on their own. And now they're starting school. 
So they're learning some new concepts, they're learning social interactions, games, their imagination, and they start to assert themselves. They're developing a sense of being purposeful and actually achieving something. You know, hey, I did this drawing. Hey, I did this project at school. They like acting out different family scenes and roles. Uh, you know, I'm going to be the police officer, or the doctor. They make up stories. Um, and they're exploring their environment. They're asking why and, you know, diving into bigger and bigger tasks. As they do that, they're kind of learning the importance of um, being approved in a social environment. Um, you know, five years old, kind of around the age they're starting kindergarten and making friends and exploring the social interaction of that. So you do need to set some guidelines, have them explore, but within limits. You don't want to be too strict. You don't want to be too lenient. It's a difficult stage for these kids. Success is really hinged on them feeling purpose. So them being able to make decisions, come up with new ideas, and like work and play with other kids. Um, so it's all about taking that initiative, especially in the school atmosphere as they start to go to school. Um, Piaget um, has them still in that pre-operational phase that we talked about on the last slide, beginning at age two until age seven. So a little bit of overlap there where they're still, you know, able to think about things in a concrete fashion, but very egocentric. They're really unable to see things from another person's perspective yet. Um, a few just key points. They do kind of start cooperative play at this point instead of parallel play. So they're able, able to kind of work together, divide efforts, role play, teach each other a common goal, um, you know, capture the flag, tag, things like that. Um, they have magical thinking, meaning that they kind of think that their own thoughts can influence the ex, um, external world. So by them thinking, you know, uh, mom's going to make pizza tonight, maybe they can make her make pizza tonight. Um, that's kind of a silly example, but an example of how this really importantly plays out in the healthcare arena. Um, I had a, a sibling pair, they were like five and seven, and the seven-year-old had cancer and was terminally ill. And the five-year-old told me that she got mad at her sister one day and in her head hoped she would get sick and now she's sick. And she felt she thought that she had made her sister sick. Um, so it sounds like a silly thing for us to talk about magical thinking, but it can have serious implications when you're dealing with these pediatric patients because the way they view the world is just totally different. They haven't got into that concept where they can abstractly think yet. It's still so concrete. And they think that their thoughts can influence the outside world because they don't know otherwise. Um, so in that preschool age is kind of where you have that magical thinking. They also don't have a concept of time. Not one bit. You can say, all right, we have to wrap up in five minutes. Five minutes go by and you tell them it's time to wrap up. And they, they have no concept of that. Um, so that becomes important as an inpatient nurse when you're saying like, okay, we're going to take your medicine in five minutes. That really means nothing to a preschooler. Um, so you'll want to, you can educate them about the concept of time. You can show them on a clock or say, okay, we're going to count to 10 and then I'm going to get your medicine ready to give them some guidelines. But just basically going off of five minutes, 10 minutes, isn't going to get you very far in that preschooler age group. All right, so now we're moving on up, the preschoolers growing up, going off to school. So at school age, Erickson puts them in the industry versus inferiority stage. And this goes all through their school up until teenage, so five to 13 years. So industry versus inferiority. It's how kids are developing as they become more competitive. They wanna do all the things that their peers do. They're learning tons at this age, how to read, write, do math, play sports. Um, teachers are really playing a big role. Peers are really playing a big role. They're expanding their social network and getting to know, oh, you know, so-and-so is really good at this and I'm not really good at that. They're comparing themselves to validate themselves and make themselves feel competent. So they'll develop industry if they feel proud and confident of what they can do. But if they don't measure up, they'll develop that inferiority and be stuck in this stage. 
for Piaget's um, stages of uh, cognitive thinking, we now move on to concrete operational at age seven. Remember, up until seven, they were in pre-operational, very egocentric concrete. Now at seven to 11, we're moving up to concrete operational. They're starting to think more logically about the concrete events in their life. They understand a few more things, conservation. So like um, if you pour liquid from one cup to another cup, it's the same amount. Um, they're more logical, they're more organized, but they're still very concrete. They have, they're not able to extrapolate abstract situations but they can use just basic logic and reasoning to form like a general principle. So moving, moving on up as they learn throughout their school ages. And social interaction with peers is typically at this point for kids starting to be prioritized over their family. And you see that continue on into the adolescent stage. So adolescence, getting out of our kid range now, almost, almost done with uh, Piaget. Um, and for Erickson, when you're a teen up until 21, 13 to 21, it's identity versus role confusion. So lots of changing in their body. They're starting to ask, you know, what role do I want to play in the world? Who am I? What can I be? And develop that sense of identity. So they'll either be able to develop that and feel proud of who they are, their principles, ideals, and beliefs or they'll fail to identify with that and be confused, is what Erickson says. So developing a strong identity versus confusion. With Piaget, you move into the final stage, our formal operational stage, at 12 years, and then that continues on and for forever. You're cognitively developed, according to Piaget. So in that formal operational stage, you're able to think ex um, abstractly. You can reason hypothetical problems, there's abstract thoughts, more moral, philosophical, ethical, social, and political issues that require all of that abstract reasoning are, are able to be um, accomplished at that formal operational stage. I don't quite know a 12 year old that's totally in that stage, but <laughs> we'll just go with it. You know, it's de develops for forever. Uh, one thing to note for adolescents, of course, is that their risky behavior continues to increase. They continue to prioritize peers over their families, um, and there's a lot to monitor for in that age group. So now we'll move on to continue talking through Erickson's stage. They, that um, it encompasses the entire lifespan. Piaget's kind of ends there. But with Erickson, we move into young adults. Um, that's from 21 to 39. And that stage is intimacy versus isolation. So hopefully they developed a strong identity um, and they become more concerned about companionship and intimacy. They're thinking about settling down, starting a family. What are they gonna compromise to get to these relationships? Um, but there's also probable some rejection. And as they're rejected and figuring out everything in life, pain and fear of that can stop them from finding that in intimacy in the future. So hopefully they're able to develop that virtue and they're re by resolving the crisis of love, um, they'll be able to be intimate and be fulfilled physically, emotionally, um, and feel that love in return is what they need to achieve this stage. Otherwise they can kind of regress into isolation. Then we move on to middle adulthood, 40 to 65, which is what he describes as generosity versus stagnation. Um, so this is um, where the primary concern is leaving a legacy. They want to be productive, make contributions to society, maybe like volunteering, mentoring kids, climbing up the ladder at work. Um, major milestones that happen in middle adulthood is children leaving home, maybe their career path changes, um, finding that new purpose in life and failure to resolve this crisis and feel that you're contributing to a legacy can lead to stagnation. Lastly, we have older adulthood where you find us from 65 plus integrity versus despair is Erickson's stage. 
Um, this is typically people who are retired and their task is to find a sense of fulfillment, knowing they've done whatever it is they've done to be significant and make contributions to the society. And when they look back, they can kind of feel that sense of integrity. If they're not able to accomplish that task, they will experience despair. So that or those are Erickson's stages. As silly as it is, and as much as everybody hates learning them, I really would recommend putting those down on a flashcard, just with the ages, the stage. You know, it makes sense what they mean when you think about it, but you do need to know who's in what stage because they will ask questions about it. Okay, do we have any growth and development questions before we move on? Just about 15 minutes to speed through isolation, restraints, the basics. Um, and then we are on a break before we start part two. <clears throat> Alrighty. I think you guys probably know this stuff, but we're just going to round it out because this is a safety concern and I can guarantee you that you're going to get at least one question somehow involving isolation. So, of course, we start with standard isolation. Everybody has to be on standard isolation. Uh, even if there is no other infection, this is kind of the basis for all of our patients moving forward. It just means hand hygiene, if you expect you're going to be exposed to bodily fluids, like you're putting in a chest tube, you need to put on your PPE. Always disinfect patient equipment and follow safe injection practices. So that means you use one needle and one syringe one time is what that means. So this applies to absolutely every patient that you ever have ever. And then from there, we move up depending on the disease that people have. Contact precautions. So this is going to be used for diseases that um, are transmitted via contact with, um, you know, like holding hands, touching somebody's forehead, any contact with a surface area. Um, MRSA, for example, is a common um, disease that we get put on contact precaution for at the hospital. Contact precautions mean you have to wear gloves and you have to wear a gown. You also have to have dedicated disposable equipment like a reusable stethoscope that stays in the room. You don't bring yours in and then bring it out because then you could be carrying that MRSA germ around. So that is contact precautions. And of course, cleaning your hands before going in the room and when leaving the room, because you're gonna do that for every patient every time. All right, next up up from contact. Oh, I think we're gonna go over a little bit more. PPE, gown and gloves, like I said, disposable everything, stethoscope, blood pressure cuff, thermometer. You wanna limit how much you transport them around the hospital. If they don't have to go down for an x-ray, if they can come up and do a portable, that's uh, preferable. You wanna place them in a single room. If you don't have a single room, um, same infections should be grouped together. And infections that require contact, MRSA, VRE, and diarrheal illnesses all require contact precautions. So next moving up, we have a droplet precautions. This is the sign you will find on the door. Droplet precautions at my hospital have changed lately to include uh, this face mask. And I think that's probably here to stay. So the PPE the CDC requires us to wear is a mask and eye cover, which can be goggles or a face shield. So you need to have your eyes and mouth covered. Again, you want to limit transporting that patient. And if you do have to transport them, put a mask on them to limit the spread of those droplets. You also wanna teach them to cough into their elbow so that if they do have droplets that they're um, containing them. Appropriate placement, again, a single room if possible. If you have to have shared rooms, you should be grouping like infections together. And then there's tons of infections requiring droplet precautions. It's typically going to be your respiratory illnesses and viruses that are spread via those droplets. The flu, pertussis, mumps, RSV, rhinovirus, adenovirus, so, 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 so many of them require droplet precautions. Next, we have airborne precautions. So if we have a disease that is spread and through particles in the air, we have to step it up a little bit. Droplet won't work, so we have to go up to airborne precautions. 
PPE in an airborne precaution room. You can't just wear a surgical mask. It needs to be a respirator. So that's either an N95 that has been fit tested or a PAPR. You also need your gown and gloves. Airborne isolation room should have positive pressure and definitely be a private room. It's not appropriate to be grouping these uh, diseases together uh, because, you know, airborne diseases travel through the air. So we really, really, really want them in a private room. Appropriate healthcare personnel should also be considered. You should try to limit how many people go in that room. You should try for it not to be susceptible people that have immunodeficiencies or are pregnant. And you should try to limit that patient being transported if at all possible. If they do have to leave the room, you have to put a mask on them to contain those droplets. So some of our infections requiring airborne precautions are TB, measles, chicken pox, disseminated herpes zoster. And of course now COVID is also an airborne disease that we are um, doing even more special precautions for. All right, I'm sure you guys already knew that, but I will say it's especially important to know which infections require which type of isolation. I would add that to your list of things to make flashcards for. You might get questions about which infections you can put in the same room together. The rule is that like can go with like. Um, you do not want to put like droplet precautions with a patient who is neutropenic or is requiring protective isolation. And you do not want to put different diseases in the same room, even if they both require droplet precautions. Um, if I had an RSV and an adenovirus, then they could both end up with both RSV and adenovirus. Um, and Jocelyn just asked if COVID is airborne only. So in my hospital, and I know this is changing all the time, it's like we're calling it special airborne is what we're call calling it. The nurses all call it COVID precautions. Um, and what I'm doing is I wear an N95, a face shield, a gown, two pairs of gloves, shoe covers, and hair cover, and they're in a positive pressure room. Um, so to be quite honest, they're kind of making that up as they go. <laughs> I can't tell you what it'll be like tomorrow. Things are constantly changing, but special airborne is what my hospital is calling it right now. We'll see kind of in the future where things go, but, um, I think it, at least airborne with those additional few PPE items. Will there be COVID-19 in the NCLEX? Absolutely not. We do not know enough about COVID for that to be in the NCLEX. NCLEX questions are written very far ahead. They go through extensive testing and review to make sure they are fair. They're tested on multiple batches of students before they make it to your NCLEX. They have not had time to write any NCLEX questions on COVID. You will definitely not see that. Unless it's a... a you know how some of the questions are um, not scored, they're just for research purposes. I would be shocked if they already had research questions, but I guess don't put anything past them. It certainly wouldn't count against your score. Yes, thank goodness. I mean, we've had too much to deal with this year already. All right, last um, topic of part one. You guys are so close. We're just gonna do a brief uh, review of restraints. Nothing too crazy to review, but there are a few points that, you know, safety wise, you really, really do need to know. So when is it appropriate for you as the nurse to use restraints? Is your patient a danger to themselves or others? That is really the main question you want to ask yourself when you're about to put restraints on or if you're about to pick that as an answer choice. If the patient is trying to harm themselves, if they're trying to harm team members, if they're pulling out any of their lines, tubes, or drains, or an airway that could compromise their care. If they are delirious, they don't know where they are, they're at risk of harming themselves, then it is appropriate to use restraints. Really, that first question is pretty much all you need to ask. If they're a danger to themselves or others, it's appropriate to use restraints. But you always, always, always want to try everything else first. If you can reorient, redirect, sedate, make more comfortable, do anything else to avoid restraints and de-escalate, of course, do that first. And you always want to get them off as soon as possible. If your delirious patient is sundowning and delirious at night, 
but then in the morning, they're perfectly appropriate. Take those restraints off in the morning. You don't need to leave them all the time if the situation changes. So always be reevaluating to try and get them off ASAP. I'm just going to go through the few different types of restraints so you're familiar with what they look like. Um, and yes, Jocelyn, restraints should absolutely be the last resort. So if you have an NCLEX question that asks, what would you do first? Least invasive first is always what you're going to try. You're going to try reorienting. You're going to try maybe sedating them a little bit, maybe decreasing stimulation or trying a different activity with them. And if they're still harm, trying to harm themselves, harm you, then you would escalate to restraints. But always choose that last. Um, you also do need a doctor's order to apply restraints. There's some very specific orders and documentation requirements, and we're going to go all through that as soon as I show you the types of restraints. We've got a whole slide about that. Yes, it is not, not um, a nursing decision to put on restraints. You have to get a doctor's order, and there's some very specific things about that order. Um, so the one we see most often is here on the left, soft wrist restraint. Those can be used wrist or ankle or all four. You can have four point restraints. Mitts right here. These are one of my favorites for somebody who is maybe confused and at risk for like pulling out their IV, but they're not trying to hurt anyone because it just goes over their fingers like a boxing mitt. And it takes away their ability to like pull at their lines and tubes. If they're actually trying to hurt you, like hit you or escape, these myths are going to do nothing. But if it's just a confused, sweet grandma who doesn't know why she has an IV in and is at danger of pulling it out, these myths can really, really help and they're much less invasive. A couple of other ones that you'll see in pediatrics, we use this posy bed that's over on the left. For kids who we still want to be able to move around, but they're hurting themselves trying to get out of the crib. And then I have actually never seen this vest used in real life. I still train nurses on how to use it to keep a patient in bed, but let them have mobility of their arms. The issue is if they slide down in bed, that vest can actually choke them. So you have to be really, really careful if you ever decided to use the vest. It's really, really not common anymore. So now let's go over exactly what you guys were talking about, the order and the documentation, which is the bread and butter of restraints and is definitely what you're going to get an NCLEX question about. Because at the end of the day, it's a safety concern and we have to prove that not only did we try all of our other um, options first uh, before we went to restraints, but that we were safe when we applied the restraints. Okay, so things that you need to document. Start and stop times. The reason that the restraints are indicated. The plan of care regarding the restraints. What are you going to do to try to get them out of restraints? And most importantly, their assessment. It is especially important to check for skin breakdown under those wrist restraints. You want to be able to get two fingers under there. Look at all the skin under the restraints. Note any redness. Put preventative measures to protect the skin and document, document, document. In my emergency department, if I get an order for restraints, I have to document every 15 minutes. And let me tell you, if there's anything that makes me want to get my patient out of restraints, it's so that I can stop charting every 15 minutes on their dang restraints. Um, so documentation is absolutely essential. You have to have a doctor's order. That doctor has to actually come and evaluate your patient face to face. So you can call them and say, um, you know, Miss Sally Joe is delirious. She's trying to pull out her breathing tube. I need restraints. They can go ahead and put that order in and they have four hours to get to you to actually put eyes on Miss Sally Joe. They can't just write it and never come evaluate her. Face to face, the order, the provider ordering your restraints needs to come see your patient. And that order is only good for so long. It's different at different facilities, and it's different depending on the age group. The younger the kid, the order is good for only a shorter amount of time. In my facility, under two years old, the order is good for an hour. Under, I want to say, five, it's good for two hours. Greater than that, it's good for four hours. In some facility, adults can have a restraint order lasting up to 24 hours. I've never seen longer than that. They expire quickly because the physician has to come reevaluate the patient 
and see what else we can do to de-escalate and get them out of restraints. So yes, got to have a doctor's order, got to document, got to check skin breakdown. And Jennifer asked what state I practice in. I practice in North Carolina, but I have a compact license um, that is good across like 30, 40 some states. So um, most of those um, policies regarding restraints and such are going to be more like facility by facility, um, but hopefully similar uh, because we all should be going off of evidence-based practice. So hopefully there's some continuity there. Um, all right, any restraint questions? I have one last NCLEPS question in this section, and then we're gonna take a break. So let's see, which is the following represents an appropriate time to put restraints on your patients? Select all that apply. Oh, Golda asked a good question. Golda, I'll answer that as soon as we do this NCLEX questions. Good job, guys. Yes, A and D. A and D are correct. When they're trying to pull their lines, tubes, and drains, and when they are a danger to themselves, those are the appropriate times to put restraints on your patients. Uh, for B, a family, family member requested it. They're allowed to request it, but it's not necessarily an appropriate um, thing to initiate it. You should really explain to the family member okay, yes, I know your mom is very confused. This is what we're going to try first. And if she's a danger to herself, then we can reconsider. Um, it's perfectly fine to give the family that education to let them know what you're trying to do and when it is appropriate to initiate restraints. And then for C, just because you think they're necessary doesn't mean you can initiate it. Like you all caught asking if you need a doctor's order, you do have to speak to that healthcare provider. Um, if it really is an emergency situation, like they're about to hurt you, um, obviously you want to be calling for assistance. A lot of times I'll have somebody getting the doctor and somebody getting restraints at the same time. So if the doctor comes to the bedside and is like, yes, put restraints on, let's do it. It's going to be a team effort. Trust me, you're not doing this by yourself if they're about to hurt you. Um, that's usually the fastest way to um, kind of initiate that. So a couple of really good restraint questions before we end. Um, let's see. Can LPNs assess skin restraints on patients? Awesome question, Wilda. And tomorrow we have a whole section on LPN scope of practice, prioritization, delegation. You've got to know your core concept before we get to that delegation. But long answer short, no. LPNs cannot assess. Um, and then Mirasol asked, the four railings of the bed are considered restraints. It depends on your facility. Yes, in my facility, if all four rails are up um, and it's not for the patient's request, it's because uh, of restraining them, then I do need to get an order. The documentation requirements are a little bit different. Again, that's going to be facility protocol. Um, but there is, if you have all four railings up, an option where you can say, a light patient request because if the patient wants them up it, it's fine so that really depends on the patient and why you're putting them up um, as always check your facilities protocol because that's really going to be the driving factor here all right all right you guys made it through the hardest part of the course that is the end of part one you have done the bread and butter of the core content that you need to build on moving forward so we're going to take a break. Um, let's see. We're going to break for 10 minutes. So we're going to come back. At, it's 2.30. We're going to come back at 2.40. And then we're going to go into cardiac. We're going to do cardiac, take a break, respiratory, take a break, neuro, and be done for the day. I hope, hopefully, I can get us done by uh, 5.30, I'm thinking. Um, each of those sections has like 40 to 50 slides. We're going to go through some anatomy and physiology and then hit the highlights of what diseases and disease processes and treatments and interventions the NCLEX likes to ask about. I am absolutely not going through every single disease that you learned in your med surge um, course or textbook. You already went through nursing school for that. 
you don't have time for that. And you don't need to do that to ace the NCLEX. But there are certain systems that you really have to go over. So that's what we're going to hit on and talk through and make sure you get the anatomy and the why behind those different things for each system and disease. So take a break. Let's come back at 240 and we'll hit the ground running with cardiac.
Oops. All right, guys. We are nearing the home stretch. Get my computer all ready. Whew. Glasses back on. All right. So who loves cardiac? Me. <laughs> you guys are really going to see my love for pediatric cardiac tomorrow when we talk about congenital heart diseases because that is my jam. All right. So let's get started. Like I said, each section, we're going to start off with like the basic anatomy physiology that you need. Um, just got to do it. And then we're going to go into all of the different disease processes and treatments and things that uh, the NCLEX loves to ask about. So cardiac anatomy and physiology. First thing that we have to go through is blood flow through the heart. The first thing you need to know, normal blood flow is moving forward. Backwards is bad. We don't want backwards flow. Second thing, red blood is oxygenated. Blue blood is deoxygenated. Blue blood's coming back from the body to the heart, goes out to the lungs to get its oxygen. And when it comes back to the heart, it is red blood and it is oxygenated. So that's what you see on all the pictures. Let's trace the blood flow of blood together because if you cannot do this with your eyes closed, you're not ready to move on to any of the other concepts we have to talk about. So I'm gonna talk you through it and then you need to talk through it and then you need to teach it to a friend and be able to say this forward and backwards. All right, here we go. Blood is returning from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava to the right atrium. This is deoxygenated blood returning to the body it enters the right atrium, goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle ejects blood across the pulmonic valve through the pulmonary artery to the lung. Now in the lung, we give away our CO2, we get our oxygen, our blood is now oxygenated and returns to the heart via the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. The strong left ventricle ejects blood through the aortic valve into the aortic and out to the body where the body gets all the oxygen and nutrients it needs, extracts the oxygen, gives it its carbon dioxide, and blood then is deoxygenated and goes back to the heart. Awesome. Say it 10 times fast. I'm so serious. If you can't trace the blood flow through the heart, you're going to have a really hard time figuring out all this different stuff we're about to talk about. So I encourage you to return to this slide, do whatever it is that you need to do to learn this physiology. The next thing we're going to talk about are some different hemodynamic terms and parameters that really help make a lot more sense of the different heart diseases we're going to talk about. Hopefully you've heard these before, so we'll just go through their definitions. Number one, preload is the amount of blood returning to the right side of the heart. All of that deoxygenated blood that returned to the heart from the IVC and the SVC into the right atrium, that is the preload. The afterload is just the opposite. That's the pressure against which the left ventricle has to pump to eject blood, essentially your blood pressure. Compliance is a little harder to measure. That's just how easily the heart muscle expands when it's filled with blood. So if it's real stretchy, it's easy to fill with blood versus if it's tight, sclerotic, scarred, and it's not easy to stretch, that's poor compliance. Contractility, that is the strength of contraction of the heart muscle. How hard can that muscle squeeze to eject blood out and get blood to the body? Stroke volume, stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out by the ventricles with every single contraction. So you've got that heart rate, heart con contracting, it's got good tractility, it's squeezing that blood out. How much blood is squeezed out in one contraction? That's your stroke volume. And then that contributes to your cardiac output when we look at the amount of blood the heart pumps through the entire circulatory system in one minute. So I'm sure you know the magical um, formula for cardiac output. And we're going to talk about how all these things are related when it all boils down to because cardiac output 
is the most important hemodynamic parameter that you will ever need to know. It really is a compilation of all these different factors. Poor cardiac output leads to disease, good cardiac output heals disease. So we need good cardiac output. And that magical formula that I'm sure has been drilled into your head, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. And that makes total sense, right? If cardiac output is the amount of blood the heart pumps through the circulatory system in one minute, and stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected by each um, contraction, and heart rate is the number of times the heart beats in a minute, well, then if you multiply how much blood is ejected in one contraction by the number of contractions in a minute, you get the cardiac output. So it makes total sense. But why is that cardiac output so stinking important because of tissue perfusion how much blood is getting out to the tissues is end organ function if we don't have good oxygenation of our tissues our tissues die our cells die they can't do what they need to do there's not delivery of those oxygen and nutrients to each and every cell of the body we do not function as human beings so poor cardiac output leads to a whole host of complications a decreased level of consciousness because we're not getting enough car um, oxygen up to the brain chest pain weak pulses angina because there's not enough blood flow through the heart the heart needs blood itself that's in the form of blood coming through the coronary arteries you don't get enough there ischemia angina weak pulses uh what about the lungs they need perfusion via the uh pulmonary arteries right not enough blood to the lungs you're going to be short of breath crackles, rail, edema, all those horrible breath sounds. Um, what about the skin, the largest organ in the body? It needs perfusion, and it's easy to tell if the skin isn't perfused, right? Cool, clammy, mottled, delay cap refill, all of those things, poor cardiac output. What about the kidneys? They need a huge amount of blood flow. Renal blood flow goes down, decreased urine output, urinary retention, all of those bad things. So let's go back to hemodynamic parameters and talk about how all of these different things are making up that cardiac output now that you know how vitally important it is to our body. Well, our preload is the amount of blood coming back to the right side of our heart. More preload, more blood coming back, more stretch, more contraction. That's called Frank Starling's law. You don't need to remember that for the NCLEX, but what I need you to remember is increased preload, increased cardiac output. Now, what about afterload? Does an increased afterload decrease or increase your cardiac output? It's the pressure against which the left ventricle has to pump to, de to eject your blood. So if you've got increasing afterload, increasing blood pressure, the heart is working really hard to pump that blood against that afterload, the cardiac output goes down. That's right, guys. So increasing afterload, decreasing cardiac output. That's the relationship you need to remember. Those two are pretty easy. What about compliance? If the compliance increases, does that increase cardiac output? To a degree, um, if the heart muscle can easily expand and fill with blood and then eject all of that blood, it will increase their stroke volume and increase their cardiac output. But what if our compliance goes too far? We get too compliant and too stretchy. Think about like a an old hairband, right? So if this gets stretched out and stretched out and stretched out, it's not going to return to its um, normal shape very easily. It's going to be harder and harder for it to snap back. So compliance is a good thing to a degree. Too much compliance, we're too stretched out, we have an old saggy heart muscle, it's going to be hard for it to contract and get back to its normal shape and eject that blood. Contractility, again, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. We want strong contractions to force blood out of the heart. Too much contractility, too much muscle is actually going to limit the amount of space we have in the ventricles and limit the ability of blood to flow into the ventricles. So if we have hypertrophy and super increased contractility, like in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then we can actually have decreased cardiac output. So you see this can get very complicated, but they are all related to each other. The big ones that for your NCLEX success you need to know are increased preload, increased cardiac output, increased afterload, decreased cardiac output. Those are very, very important. So 
all boils down to why cardiac output is so important. And let's look at some other causes of either increased or decreased um, cardiac output. We already talked about some when we went through our hemodynamic parameters. So now you should kind of get the gist of this. There's a whole lot more things that decrease your cardiac output than increase it, of course. But things that decrease it, bradycardia. Since of course, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Heart rate goes down, cardiac output goes down arrhythmias, if we're in SVT and we're not allowing our atria to really fill with blood, um, or AFib and we're atria are just quivering and not filling with blood, that's going to dramatically decrease your cardiac output. All of those arrhythmias, pulseless VTAC, BFib, asystole, SVT, we have horrible cardiac output in all of those arrhythmias. Hypotension, because if we have such decreased afterload that the heart is really not moving things forward effectively, um, that's not to say it's because of high afterload. Hypertension would be high afterload, but hypotension is going to decrease your preload because blood's not going to be getting back to the right side of the heart. Decreased preload, decreased cardiac output. Myocardial infarction, cardiac muscle disease, all of those things that impair compliance, contractility, and so on and so forth can, of course, decrease your cardiac output. Now, on the flip side, what can increase your cardiac output? It's mostly things that we're going to do to the patient. And some of them only sometimes are really going to work, right? If we increase blood volume, uh, we try to increase their preload to a degree that's going to work. Increased preload does get us increased cardiac output. But if we give them so much blood flow that we then also increase their afterload, kind of a wash. So it depends. If they're very hypovolemic, giving them back some volume can increase preload and increase cardiac output. Tachycardia, if we increase our heart rate because cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate, tachycardia can sometimes increase our cardiac output. But if we increase it too much and where heart is beating so fast that it doesn't have adequate time for the atria to fill, we then decrease our preload, which can decrease cardiac output. So we've got to be careful with those two. Luckily, we have some pretty good medications that can help us increase cardiac output dependent on the patient. Okay, so we've got ACE inhibitors like enalapril, ARBs like losarin, and nitrates. Those are all vasodilators. So that's going to um, vasodilate the um, arteries to help decrease afterload, increase the efficacy of the left ventricles pumping, and get more blood out to the body. We also have Inotropes. Now, those are things that improve contractility. Inotropes are things like dopamine, dobutamine, and milrinone. All of those help the heart squeeze a little harder to move a little bit of blood forward. Now, we also need to look at if our cardiac output is decreasing and we want to increase it, we should look at why it was decreased in the first place to figure out the appropriate intervention, right? If it's hypertension, maybe some vasodilation, decreased contractility, maybe an inotrope. What if the heart rate is too fast? We're in SVT. We might need to get them out of that rhythm, maybe give them some adenosine to break SVT or amiodarone if we need to control a sinus tachycardia. What if they just need some rate control like a beta blocker? Maybe propranolol could get them back into nor uh, a normal um, rate. So we have lots and lots of options. Cardiac glycosides like digoxin can also help contractility and to some degree compliance, compliance depending on the patient. So we have lots of medications when it comes to cardiac. I know most of those we went over in farm, the inotropes we didn't really touch, um, but all you need to know is they help squeeze the heart harder and get more blood moving forward, which is what we want when we have poor cardiac outputs. All right. You've got to understand those concepts to understand all of the diseases that we are about to talk about. So if you have any questions, let me know right now so I can address them and make sure to go back and review this, talk it through with a friend so that you can really understand these hemodynamics. Because I'm telling you on the NCLEX, once you understand the why behind signs and symptoms, you're going to be able to get every question right, whether we've specifically reviewed it or not. That's why we have to put emphasis on the why and the anatomy here.
So we're going into our diseases now. The next one is coronary artery disease. Um, one second. Okay. Coronary artery disease is the first thing that we are going to talk about. So what is coronary artery disease? Well, there's two common types, either chronic stable angina or acute coronary syndrome. That's a myocardial infarction, which we'll talk about more. First, we're going to talk about the chronic stable angina. That's caused by narrowing of coronary arteries and plaque building up. So you can see that right here in this picture. Artery narrowing, plaque building up. That causes insufficient blood flow to the heart. Remember, those coronary arteries are the um, arteries on the myocardium actually perfusing the heart itself. So when there's insufficient blood flow, decreased blood flow to the heart muscle, that leads to decreased oxygen, ischemia, and that ischemia causes chest pain. The chest pain is known as angina. So what treatment can we give patients who live in this state of chronic stable angina? And now I think it's important to say what we mean by chronic and stable is that this is a recurring experience for these patients. It happens regularly, but it's stable in the sense that their blood pressure doesn't tank, they maintain their perfusion, and they don't they experience relief with the treatment that we are providing them. If they don't experience relief with the treatment that we're about to talk about, then we're unstable. So the treatment is nitroglycerin. All right, let's talk about that. Nitroglycerin, we just talked about with a way to increase our cardiac output, is a vasodilator. It dilates both venous and arterial vessels, which decreases afterload and increases cardiac output. We give it sublingually right under the tongue, and you're going to give just one pill every five minutes for up to three doses. Now I have to talk about here whether you're inpatient or outpatient because the education is gonna be a little bit different. If you have a patient who is in the hospital and you're administering this nitroglycerin, you give one pill, you wait five minutes. If no relief, you give another pill up to three times before we do anything else. If you are educating somebody who's going home with nitroglycerin, they're an outpatient, you want them to take one pill, wait five minutes, see if there is any relief. If there's no relief after five minutes, they can take the second pill and call 911. No relief after five minutes, you want them to call 911. You don't want to delay them getting a second and a third dose, you just want help in route while they're doing that. If their symptoms are relieved after one pill, that's okay, they don't need to go to the hospital. Some other things to know about this medication are is that it cannot be swallowed, it has to be given under the tongue and let it dissolve. It needs to be kept in a dark bottle in a cool, dry place. Otherwise, the light will inactivate the medication and it won't work. And then a another thing that's really important to tell patients is that we do expect them to get a headache. Remember, this is a massive vasodilator. It's causing a lot of vasodilation, including in the carotids, where you're going to get a rush of blood to the head and a headache. We know that's going to happen. They don't need to call the doctor. They don't need to come to the hospital because of that headache. It will go away. Some further things to educate the patient about are just all of the different possible ways to decrease that workload of the heart. So you want them to rest. You don't want them to overeat, have small, frequent meals. You don't want these patients having caffeine and smoking. You want them to avoid temperature extremes. If they're nice and cozy by their fireplace and they walk out into the snow without shoes on, that can cause a vasospasm leading to narrowing of the coronary arteries, leading to ischemia and leading to angina. So avoid those temperature extremes. Try to encourage them to lose weight, reduce stress, eat healthy, quit smoking, all of those positive things that help us decrease the workload of the heart. So that is chronic stable angina. Now I said if it's unstable, if the treatment does not work. So if they take that one pill, after five minutes, they don't have relief, they're calling 911. At this point, we're having unstable angina, which progresses to a myocardial infarction. So what exactly is a myocardial infarction? All of these three names up here are synonyms, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, 
unstable angina. So the terminology is very confusing. Of course, you're going to mostly hear myocardial infarction, but they all mean the same thing. It means there's decreased blood flow to the heart, leading to decreased oxygen, and not only ischemia, we had ischemia with our stable angina, now we're progressing to necrosis. Tissue is actually dying. Heart tissue is dying. So we need to act quickly and try and limit the damage so that we get them back as much function as possible. What are these patients going to look like when they're presenting to you, probably in the emergency department, maybe you work in a heart unit, they're going to have chest pain that's usually described as crushing. Sometimes it radiates to the left arm or jaw, and sometimes between the shoulder blades. Some patients present with epigastric discomfort or indigestion. Women are much, much more likely to have these GI symptoms. They might be having fatigue or shortness of breath, and they might be vomiting. Again, more likely women to have that GI symptom. Your patients who are diabetic are less likely to feel these symptoms due to their neuropathy. Um, so you want to educate them about all of the different things they could experience and make sure they are on high alert for even minor changes that might indicate that they need to come in. Now, we talked about troponin and heart labs earlier when we did labs, but let's talk a little bit more about exactly what that is and what you're going to be doing as a nurse. Troponin is the one I want you to put a star by and remember for forever. It's a cardiac biomarker that increases when there is myocardial damage. Troponin is specific to the myocardial tissue, which helps us make the specific diagnosis of a myocardial infarction. We have some other biomarkers too, a CPKMB is also a cardiac specific isoenzyme that increases with damage to cardiac cells. But it's harder to pick up on than troponin. We get more false negatives with CPK and Bs. And with myoglobin, well, that's protein in your muscle cells, and it's going to increase with damage to actually any muscle cell in your body. So if you have, you know, a damage to your calf muscle and some breakdown there, your myoglobin could be increased, not just your heart muscle. So if we get a negative myoglobin result, that can be useful for helping rule out an MI completely, um, but positive results aren't specific to the heart, whereas troponin is. Troponin is specific to the cardiac cells. You're often going to do serial troponin, so you'll get a baseline, a one hour, and a three hour to watch the trend and see when they spike, and that will help you determine if the patient is in fact experiencing a MI. So what do we do for these MIs? How are we going to treat them? The goal is to get them to the cath lab within about 90 minutes of them showing up to the door for what we call a percutaneous coronary intervention. You see that in this photo over here where the interventional radiologist or cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, whatever they call themselves, has snaked a balloon or stent. Usually they've entered in the femoral groin, uh, the femoral artery through the groin. They've snaked this up to the blocked artery, and then they deploy this balloon, extend it, place a stent so that blood flow is restored. That's really important to help limit the damage to the heart tissue and get them as much function back as possibly can, because that's going to limit long-term side effects. So door to cath lab in 90 minutes if you recognize a um, NMI, especially if there is ST elevation, meaning it's a STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, other, um, other interventions, maybe it's not quite so serious, maybe it's not a full-blown MI, maybe they don't need to go to the cath lab. What are some other things we're going to try? All of these things are to decrease the workload of the heart, increase oxygenation to the myocardial tissue. I always learned the mnemonic MONA, morphine, oxygen, aspirin, nitroglycerin. So morphine helps decrease the workload of the heart, relax, and causes some vasodilation. Oxygen increases oxygenation to the muscle, obviously. Aspirin helps with some decreased platelet aggregation, and nitroglycerin help with vasodilation as well, decreased afterload, increased cardiac output, increased oxygen to the heart. So all of those treatments can help, 
but the ideal gold standard is getting them to the cath lab for that PCI. All right, so then we have some education to talk about because we have to educate these patients post MI or they're going to come back with another one. Quit smoking, gradually increase their activity. We actually want them to be doing more aerobic things like walking, swimming. Uh, we want to avoid isometric activities like holding a plank or weightlifting so that we don't put too much stress on that muscle. And then we have to talk about their diets. It should be a heart healthy diet, which you guys know is low fat, low salt, and low cholesterol. So you want to teach them what types of food that is, less red meat, more fruits and veggies, um, no salts, you know, avoiding things um, like processed foods, canned foods, lunch meats, et cetera, which a lot of people have a hard time accepting. So you have to do your due diligence to be patiently explaining to them the appropriate diet choices. All right, MIs are super important. So we're pausing to do an NCLEX question. Here you guys go. Good job, guys. So this is just a choose one. There's no select all that apply. All righty. Let's keep on rolling. The correct answer here was A, increase oxygenation to the heart and reduce the heart's workload. Um, obviously, if the client is showing signs and symptoms of the myocardial infarction, the priority is going to be increasing that oxygen delivery to the heart. So B, uh, that was incorrect. Confirming the diagnosis, of course, we're going to do that. But the client is already exhibiting signs of reduced myocardial oxygenation, that chest pain. Um, so we need to prioritize getting oxygen to them. You know, they're running those troponin labs. That takes a little bit. You're not going to withhold oxygen while you wait for the troponin to result. For C, um, that was also incorrect. It is our responsibility to help with their anxiety. We want to work on that. But oxygenation trumps anxiety. That's the same rationale for why D was incorrect. Oxygenation trumps pain. Pain never killed anybody, so that's not your priority. You are going to hopefully give morphine to help um, with some decreasing workload of the heart, and that will also help with pain and anxiety, so triple threat there. Um, but when you think about simply what your nursing priority is, absolutely oxygenation. All right, we're going into our next diagnosis, heart failure. So what exactly is heart failure? Quite simply, I always like to call it pump failure because it is just the inability of the heart muscle to pump enough blood forward to meet the body's needs for blood and oxygen. It's often a complication of other diseases. And the number one cause is actually hypertension. The patient has had so much hypertension and high afterload for so long that the heart muscle itself just starts to wear out. Other causes are cardiomyopathy, endocarditis, and myocardial infarctions, anything that damages that myocardial tissue. And we have two types. We have left-sided heart failure and right-sided heart failure, depending on which side of the pump isn't able to move that blood forward. So first, let's look at left-sided heart failure. You do need to be able to distinguish between the signs and symptoms for the two of these for your NCLEX questions. So left side of the heart can't move the blood forward to the body. And this is really important for remembering the um, flow of blood through the heart that we talked about in the very first slide. The left side moves the blood forward to the body. And if it can't do that because it's becoming so weak, where is the blood backing up? The lungs. So left 
lungs. We see symptoms, pulmonary symptoms with left-sided heart failure, since that left side is failing and it's backing up in the lungs. So what do we see? Pulmonary congestion. That's, I mean, edema. There's lots of backed up blood flow in the lungs, making them sound wet. Crackles, crackles, cough. It's hard to breathe because there's no so much fluid building up in the lungs. Dyspnea, blood-tinged sputum. They might have that third heart sound, S3, because they're fluid overloaded. Orthopnea, when they lay down at night, they can't lay back because they have so much fluid. They have to prop themselves up on three or four pillows. Um, all of their pulmonary pressures are going to be high. They might start to be cyanotic because their blood isn't moving forward to the body and bringing the oxygen that the body needs. All of those things are signs of left-sided heart failure. So remember, left lungs. On right-sided heart failure, we're going to think right body because the right side moves the blood forward to the lungs. And when it's not doing that efficiently, blood is backing up in the body. So right body, we start to see a whole lot of fluid build up in the body. We have JVD, dependent edema, hepato and splenomegaly, that really enlarged liver and spleen. Sometimes you can palpate that liver. You really should not be able to palpate the liver. Ascites, that buildup of fluid in the abdomen, tons of weight gain due to that excess fluid. They're very tired and they're really not hungry. They have a lot of anorexia and GI distress because of all of that ascites sitting around in their belly. I mean, who would want to eat when you're carrying around that much fluid and feeling that miserable? You can have a combination of right and left sided heart failure. Uh, the most common uh, cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. Patients have hypertension, their left side fails, blood backs up in the lungs, right side of the heart stops being able to move blood forward to the lungs, and then it backs up in the body. So it's really a chain reaction. And what do we do for these patients? Well, decrease the workload of the heart. That's the name of the game when it comes to these cardiac disorders. Your primary strategy for heart failure is decreasing that afterload so the pump can more easily and more efficiently move the blood forward. You can do that with ACE inhibitors that cause the arterial dilation, ARBs to decrease the blood pressure, you can try giving cardiac glycosides like digoxin to increase contractility, and you can also diurese your patient to help get rid of all that extra fluid that's building up due to their heart failure. Lots of educational points that you need to know when it comes to heart failure. If your patient was prescribed diuretics, which almost all of them are, you want them to take them in the morning. It's kind of mean to give somebody like Lasix at 9 p.m. because you are be waking up every couple hours to pee. You always want to monitor those electrolytes while on diuretics, especially that potassium if they're on a loop diuretic. Help them learn about a low-sodium diet to help decrease that fluid because remember, water follows sodium. So low sodium, low fluid. Increase the head of the bed to try and help continue getting some diuresis. Do their daily weights, same things we talked about earlier, same time, same scale, same clothes. And you want to teach them to report to their healthcare provider any increase in weight of like two or three pounds in a day. That much increase is almost surely fluid and an acute change in their fluid retention is directly related to their heart failure. Fluid retention equals heart failure. So monitoring their daily weight is really the best way to monitor that fluid retention and figure out if something is going on. So important to teach our patients about that. All right, we said hypertension was the number one cause of left-sided heart failure. So let's talk more about hypertension. Very common in our society. We have to know a good deal about it for the NCLEX. First and foremost, knowing your normal values. 120 over 80, of course, is like your textbook picture perfect. 120 to 129 is considered elevated, but not a diagnosis of hypertension. We hit that diagnosis when we're at 130 over 80. And then we are considered at a hypertensive crisis when we are greater than 180 over 120. That hypertensive crisis is necessary to do something very, very quickly to reduce that blood pressure. Okay, so 
causes of hypertension, and risk factors for hypertension. Some of these are what we consider modifiable, meaning we can change them, we have some influence, and some of them are non-modifiable. It's just what we were born with and we might be more at risk for it no matter what we do. So your family's history of hypertension. People of the African-American race are more prone to hypertension, unfortunately. As we increase in age, all of us, unfortunately, are just more and more at risk. Obesity is considered modifiable because we can try to help patients lose weight. Um, high density lipid proteins, um, if we have a high amount of those, remember those are the good cholesterol, that is a negative risk factor for hypertension. Um, CAD, coronary artery disease, is a risk factor for hypertension. Stress, smoking, high salt intake, and caffeine are the ones I want you to focus on when you think about modifiable risk factors. Those are things that as a nurse, we can help teach patients to avoid or change or in some way, shape and form alter to decrease their risk for hypertension if they're not hypertensive and help their hypertension be managed if they already are. So stress, smoking and eating lots of salt all really do contribute to hypertension. And our patients can be asymptomatic until our hypertension gets really, really, really severe. Once we get into that crisis mode where we're like 180 over 120, then we can start to see some crazy changes. Vision changes, they're dizzy, they have horrible recurring headaches, nosebleeds, shortness of breath, chest pain, angina, because there is so much pressure in all of those vessels. Their vessels actually rupture in their nose. They have those nosebleeds. Their head is just throbbing from the pressure. And at that point, we're really in a crisis situation where we need to acutely manage their hypertension. It can lead to some serious complications when we talk about the chronicity of hypertension. Stroke, heart attack, renal failure, heart attack. Uh, sorry, I said heart attack twice. Heart failure and myocardial infarction or heart attack and vision loss. All of these are due to the really, really, really high pressures of blood going to the brain, to the heart, to the capillaries behind the eyes, to the kidneys. Because of those high pressures with hypertension, we see these serious long-term complications. So we need to educate patients about that when we're trying to change the course of their disease, right? Treatment and education includes their medication, their diet, and their lifestyle. These are things you absolutely have to know for NCLEX education questions. So their medications, their ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics are all commonly used to combat hypertension. It depends on the patient and the severity, what is used first and, and, and how much, sometimes in combination with each other. The diet is a really important one for you to know. And of course, the lifestyle, less sitting, more walking. I have a better picture of the diet right here. This is like the cardiac diet. So you want to encourage low salt, four to five servings per day of fruit, fat-free or low-fat dairy, four to five servings of vegetable. We want whole grains instead of enriched uh, white grains. Uh, less meat, more fish. Seeds and nuts are really good not very many sweets, and not very much fats and oils. Those are all the things you want to talk to them about. And they are not going to be happy with it. So you're going to, you're going to have to get some practice with educating these patients. All right, let's do a hypertension practice question. I can all but guarantee you'll get at least one on the NCLEX. Because it is just so prevalent and we have so many patients dealing with it. So this wasn't something we specifically talked about. You'll have to use some therapeutic communication. And then we'll talk about these herbal substances because this does seem to pop up on the NCLEX a lot now. Kind of what our job as a nurse is when we're talking to these patients. And when you have this question that says, what is the most appropriate response? You just can only pick one answer. Yep, good job, Jennifer. 
Yeah, you guys are getting this one. Awesome. If you're good on these therapeutic communication questions, you are going to get a lot more of your NCLEX questions right. You definitely should do some practice with these types of questions. So for this one, the answer was B. Although the use of herbal substances may have some beneficial effects, we know that they're not all safe. And so we want to educate our patients to talk to their doctor about them. There can be some pharmacological effects, interactions with the medications they're on. Um, they can have unintentional side effects. You never want to pick an answer that just outright shuts your patient down. Um, like um, tell the client they are unsafe and should never be used. In general, I like to say if a, if a question says never or always, that answer choice is probably wrong because very rarely are we a never or always. Um, we would just want to encourage her to talk with her physician. Um, teaching her to monitor her blood pressure every 15 minutes, that's super excessive. No one's going to do that. Um, and although it is true that if she takes herbal substances, we are going to have to monitor her blood pressure closely, that's really not doing anything to address the need of the client. And furthermore, we cannot give her counseling on those herbal substances. She needs to talk with her physician. So B was the most therapeutic response. All right. We're in the home stretch for cardiac before you guys get a break. The next subject that we're talking about is one of my favorites and very important for the NCLEX, shock. So what is shock? We're going to go through the physiology and the different types and treatments that you need to know. Shock is essentially a state where the vital organs are not receiving adequate oxygenation. This lack of oxygenation causes organ damage and forces the cell to switch to anaerobic metabolism to create their energy. Anaerobic metabolism produces lactate. Our body does not like when we make lactate. It is not good for us. We are usually in a state of aerobic metabolism because we have oxygen to make our energy. And when we don't have that oxygen, we have to switch it over to anaerobic. We make that lactate and we are in a bad place. So now we're going to kind of talk about the types. To understand that, I want you to understand that the cardiovascular system, in essence, is made up of three parts. We've got the blood, the vasculature, and the heart. The heart is the pump, the vasculature are the tubes, and the blood is the fluid in the tubes. Any disruption of one of those three things can cause a lack of oxygen delivery to the organs and lead to shock. So any broken component, we end up in a bad place. Here's the three types. These are the major types that we're going over. Hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and distributive. And this is just showing you those three components again. We've got the heart, the pump, the blood, the fluid, and the uh, tubing or the vasculature that carries the fluid all around. Any disruption is going to cause major issues. So first we're talking hypovolemic shock because this is number one most common and number two easiest to figure out. So here is our pathophysiology for hypovolemic shock. Low blood flow, loss of circulating volume, there's not enough blood, not enough blood entering the heart, decreased preload, decreased cardiac output. So the body's trying to compensate, it's trying to vasoconstrict, it's trying to increase its heart rate, but we're just running out of flow. So this is where the blood is the missing link in the chain. The pump's working, the tubing's working, but there isn't enough fluid in the tubing. What can cause that? Well, I gave you some foreshadowing there, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, hemorrhage. We have traumatic injuries where we lose large amounts of blood and burns. I don't want you to focus too much on burns today because we have an entire burn lecture tomorrow. But essentially, when we have third degree burns, we have increased capillary membrane permeability, which allows fluid to leak out of the tissue into the third space or out of the vasculature into the third space. So we end up losing a huge amount of fluid. And anything where we lose a huge amount of fluid can cause hypovolemic shock. It might sound dramatic to say vomiting and diarrhea can lead to hypovolemic shock, but you would be surprised how quickly that can happen, especially in infants. Very, very quick, they can end up in hypovolemic shock if they're not tolerating their feeds. So you've got to watch out for it. What are those patients going to look like? Well, 
as they're trying to compensate, they'll look weak and pale, but they're going to be tachycardic. Their heart's going to be fighting that, trying to get their blood pressure up. They're going to feel really anxious because they feel that low amount of oxygen. In general, if you have a patient who is anxious and restless, I want you to be worried that they are hypoxic. The brain doesn't get anxious and restless for absolutely no reason. If you had a stable patient who is acting normally and they start to feel anxious and think something's wrong and they're restless and they're picking at the sheets, I want you to think hypoxia because the brain is, is struggling without that oxygen and it struggles quick. Now, once they start to fail, their heart is trying to compensate, but they just don't have enough fluid to get oxygen out to the body. Then we start to see the blood pressure drop, weak pulses, their decreased level of consciousness. Um, make sure my computer's plugged in. We don't want that to die. Um, the pale, cool, clammy, that perfusion to their tissues is really struggling. Their decreased urine output because we're not getting enough blood flow to the kidneys with that decreased fluid. So very, very serious, very quickly. Treatment, um, we want to fix the cause of whatever caused their hypovolemia. So are they vomiting and having diarrhea? We need to stop that. If they're bleeding and this is traumatic injury, we'll probably repair that in the OR. Um, we do want to replace volume as quickly as we can for hypovolemic shock. Our fluids of choice will be isotonic fluids because we do not want to cause a fluid shift. So either normal saline or lactated ringers. If it is hemorrhagic, getting some blood products quickly is a good idea. And then lastly, if we're not able to support their perfusion with giving them back volume, we need to start some vasopressors to squeeze their blood vessels to get that blood pressure up and deliver some oxygen to the tissues just as quickly as I can. So that's hypovolemic shock. Again, most common and I think the most easiest, the most easiest, <laughs> the easiest to kind of follow along and understand the rationale. Next, we talk about cardiogenic shock. So in this, the heart is the broken link in the chain. There's enough fluid, the vasculature or the tubing is bringing it to the body, but the pump is not sufficiently getting that blood out to the organs. So this probably sounds a lot like heart failure and severe heart failure can cause cardiogenic shock. Something stopping the heart itself from getting the blood out without that sufficient blood to the body, there's inadequate oxygenation and a lack of oxygen impairs normal cellular metabolism. So what can cause cardiogenic shock? We just talked about uh, severe heart failure, also a myocardial infarction that severely damages tissue. Cardiac tamponade and pulmonary embolisms are examples of a specific type of shock called obstructive cardiogenic shock. In obstructive cardiogenic shock, the heart is failing to move blood forward because there is a physical obstruction, obstructive shock. It makes sense, right? So in a pulmonary embolism, that clot is stopping. In cardiac tamponade, we have that, uh, um, that pericardium filling with fluid, physically compressing the tissue of the heart itself and making it unable to squeeze and contract and move blood forward. So for all of those re reasons, whether it's obstructive or non-obstructive, in cardiogenic shock, we just can't move that blood forward to the tissues where it needs to go. So what we see is quite similar. There's decreased perfusion, hypotension, weak pulses. They are cool and pale and clammy. Their skin isn't getting enough oxygen. Their decreased urine output because their kidneys aren't getting enough oxygen. Their decreasing level of consciousness because their brain isn't getting enough oxygen. But they also have volume overload because that heart can't move the blood forward, so it's backing up in the body. So we see a lot of those same signs and symptoms that we saw with right-sided heart failure. JVD, crackles, shortness of breath, muffled heart sounds. S3, they might have that gallop because of all the extra fluid, right? So tons and tons of fluid building up in the body, but we can't move it forward through the heart to get the oxygen where it needs to go. So what do we need to do treatment wise? All of these are serious medical emergencies and it depends on the cause. If it's caused by a myocardial infarction, we need to get them to the cath lab for that PCI. 
if we can't do it in the cath lab, open heart surgery and a uh, bypass will be necessary. If it's due to a PE that's obstructing the heart, well, then we probably need thrombolytics to bust up that clot. If it's due to cardiac tamponade, we need to do what's called a pericardiosynthesis. Take that needle to needle decompress, pull the fluid out from that tamponade and allow the heart muscle to expand and contract and refill with blood, sending oxygen to the body. Other things we can do to support or improve contractility by giving dopamine and dobutamine, decreasing the afterload with vasodilators, diuretics, and then we have some other very intense ICU level options over here, an intraortic balloon pump, an LVAD, or even transplant. I'm not talking about the ins and outs of those today. You do not need to know that for the NCLEX. The things I want you to remember are why cardiogenic shock happens, what the causes are, and I want you to remember these bullets over here. Am I? We want to get to the cath lab for a PCI. PE, thrombolytics, tamponade, pericardiosynthesis. Those are your buzzwords you need to know for cardiogenic shock. And that brings us to our very last type of shock before we break, okay? Distributive shock. Now, I think this is the most interesting of the three, and we do see it pretty commonly. In this, the vasculature or the tubing that's carrying the blood to the body is what's causing the break in the chain. Something caused an immune or an autonomic response that altered vascular tone. We have a massive amount of peripheral vasodilation happening. So when our tubes or our arteries, our veins should be this big, all of a sudden they're this big. And there's the same amount of fluid in there. So our blood pressure has dropped dramatically. With all that vasodilation, the blood pressure is no longer adequate to actually get the blood to the vital organs. So without that sufficient blood, there's inadequate oxygenation and that lack of oxygen impairs the normal cellular metabolism. We switch to anaerobic metabolism, we produce lactate, and we are in full on distributive shock. We've got a few different causes of distributive shock here. And I think this is probably where people get confused because you hear anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, septic shock. All of these are different types of distributive shock. There are different reasons that that vascular tone is altered and there's so much vasodilation. In anaphylactic, it's because of an allergic reaction. In neurogenic, it's because of a spinal cord injury that has altered vascular tone. And in septic shock, it's because of systemic infection that has caused the release of inflammatory cytokines. Those cytokines cause massive inflammation and vasodilation We've lost our tone. We've lost our blood pressure. We're no longer getting oxygen to the tissues and we are in a state of shock. So all of these are just different ways that we end up in distributive shock. Distributive shock is shock where we're not able to distribute the fluid out to the tissues like it needs to be. Assessment is going to be similar, but there are very specific findings depending on the type of distributive shock, right? In general, we've got the decreased oxygen, the hypotension due to that vasodilation, the tachycardia and tachypnea as we try to compensate. Distributive shock, though, is what we call warm shock because we've got fluid. We've got a full tank. It's and we're, are, we're super vasodilated. So we're getting all of this into the surface, but it's, it's not going to the core where it needs to go to those organs. So these patients have warm, flushed skin. Whereas cardiogenic shock and um, hypovolemic shock, we had cool, clammy, pale skin because we weren't getting that fluid out to the tissues. Um, we also have a decreased level of consciousness. You see that with all of your types of shock due to a lack of oxygen to the brain. But that warm, flushed skin or warm shock really sets distributive shock apart. So specific to our different types or our different subsets of distributive shock, with anaphylactic, of course, you've got the hives, the rash, the swelling, the wheezing. With neurogenic, you've got spinal cord injury. Um, and the, then priapism can be a very specific sign of that spinal cord injury. And with septic shock, they become hyperthermic. I once had a patient whose temperature, core temperature was 42 degrees Celsius by the time he made our way, his way to our ICU. 
in fulminant septic shock, and you have a positive blood culture, a positive infection. You can't have septic shock without sepsis, and sepsis is a um, infection in the blood. So that is a prerequisite to having septic shock. And treatment-wise is also going to depend on what type of, sept of distributive shock or why we are in distributive shock. For an anaphylactic reaction, as you guys know, pretty straightforward, you give epi, you use the EpiPen, corticosteroids, like we talked about, to decrease that inflammation, and bronchodilators to open up the airway. For neurogenic shock, we're going to focus more on supportive care. That spinal cord injury is likely irreversible. There may be some surgical options. We can also do cooling to help preserve the part of the spinal cord left. And then for septic shock, we need to treat that sepsis with IV antibiotics and IV fluid. We're going to aggressively fluid resuscitate these patients. Our vasculature is so dilated that we need so much more fluid to get in there to raise the blood pressure. And a lot of them do also need inotropic support. Super important in that warm shock because we're really, really going to have a hard time getting that blood pressure back with just fluids when we're so vasodilated. All right, I know that was rapid fire for shock. I love shock, it's very interesting to me. If I went too quick for you, please review this lecture um, after we have finished, go through it again and again, so that you can understand the why behind those signs and symptoms, and you'll get every shock question right, I guarantee it. Let's break for five. I've got 340 just about. So let's come back at 345 for respiratory. I'm going to step away to refill my water. You guys refresh, do some jumping jacks to wake up. We are in the home stretch. Two hours to go, my friends. Respiratory and neuro. You've only got 85 slides less for the day. And then we are done. So 345, we're going to come back. And uh, we're going to hit it hard with respiratory for about an hour. So I will be back after a quick water break. Feel free to let me know of any questions in the meantime, and I'll pop back to answer them, okay?
you're going to get so much more training on respiratory. So let's go over some of the basic anatomy and physiology first. You have to build on. Cardiac has the most A and P, but respiratory and neuro still have a little bit of, um, of topics that are important. So let's work, let's look at just the basic anatomy first. I think sometimes we forget to really review that. Um, we breathe air in through our nose goes into the nasal cavity. And then we've got a layer of nasal mucosa in there that acts as a filter. It traps all the pollutants, all the harmful things, um, as, act natural um, immune defense there. And then it's gonna move into the pharynx, okay? So that's the back of the throat, that gray little part right there. It um, is the intersection between that esophagus and the larynx right there, your voice box. Um, and at the opening of the larynx, you have that epiglottis, which isn't drawn on here, but that's what covers your trachea um, when you swallow. Oh, it's this right here, this little green tube. That's your epiglottis. So that's going to cover your trachea when you swallow to protect your airway and direct food down the esophagus and into the stomach. Um, that you blah, blah, blah. Um, From the larynx, you move into the trachea right here where air moves down to the intersection of the left and right main stem. And that intersection is called the carina. And if you ever work in an ICU where you intubate patients, you'll learn a lot about the carina because we want our ET tube about one centimeter above the carina. That branches into the right and left main bronchi. Remember I said that right main stem is a little bit bigger and sometimes we can intubate the right main stem by accident, which we don't want. Um, then they break off into the, so those are the primary, the left and right primary bronchi. They break off into secondary and tertiary bronchi that branch and branch until they're in small airways called alveo, uh, called bronchioles. So now we're going to zoom in on this little duct over here. You've got your little bronchial right here. It's branched and branched from the primary and secondary and tertiary bronchi. And then they connect to the tiny little alveoli. Now these alveoli are fat, packed full with all these capillaries where gas exchange actually occurs. So this is where the carbon dioxide is exchanged for oxygen and can then return to um, the left side of the heart as oxygenated blood. So that is the basic anatomy of the respiratory system, which I think we don't go over quite enough. It's very important. Um, some terminology that you just have to know, ventilation versus oxygenation. Ventilation is air actually moving in and out of the lungs, the movement of it. And then oxygenation is oxygen in the bloodstream. So when that oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide and brought back. So ventilation does not always equal oxygenation and vice versa. If we don't have good air movement, we can have oxygenation all day long, but we're not getting it out to the tissues. And if we have good um, ventilation, air is moving, but something is impaired with gas exchange at the level of the um, capillaries, well, that's not doing us either, any good either because the air is moving, but it doesn't have the oxygen. Lastly, we have perfusion, which is oxygen getting to the actual tissues. So remember when I say we have good perfusion, our nursing assessment is good pulses, warm, uh, nice and pink, uh, brisk cap refill. And that's telling us that that blood with oxygen is actually getting to the tissues. So all important components. Um, brief picture right here of the order you want to auscultate your lung sounds in. We're gonna start on the front and move to the back. We usually start in the upper right, move over to the left, down, and work our way such as you see here. Same with the posterior view. And then you wanna auscultate those bases of the lungs right there, kind of by the armpit areas in the back to really hear um, if there's good air movement in all planes of the lungs. All right. So next, we're going to talk a little bit more about the physiology of gas exchange. Okay. Let's see. Just open this up. All right. Hmm. 
missed some messages. Okay, guys, thank you for hanging in there with me. Physiology of gas exchange. So very important to understand this. The delivery of oxygen from the lungs to the bloodstream and the elimination of carbon dioxide from bloodstream to the lungs. That's occurring in those alveoli that we just looked at. And it occurs through passive diffusion. Very important to remember passive diffusion, okay? So that oxygen in, carbon dioxide out is what helps facilitate the oxygenation of the blood that can then be um, sent out to the tissues. Last thing anatomy-wise I want to look like, kind of anatomy, kind of a, a assessment, is just some basics about lung sounds because the NCLEX really does emphasize those lung sounds. Um, and you want to be able to know kind of what they mean. What I want to emphasize in particular is strider. Okay, that is upper airway noise over the trachea, and it's usually indicative of a foreign air, of a foreign body airway obstruction. Something is stuck there, or maybe there's so much swelling or inflammation that we have obstruction of that upper airway up in the trachea. So that's an emergency. We definitely, definitely need um, to uh, do something to address that concern. Okay, now the other ones are more common. So wheezing, you're gonna hear kind of in the middle lobes of the lungs because it's affecting those primary bronchi. There's some constriction and the air is trying to pass through those constricted bronchi and bronchioles. And that's what's causing the wheezing. Wheezing is typical of asthma. I want you to think asthma when you hear wheezes. Now bronchi, bronchi and rails can get a bit confusing, but bronchi you're gonna hear in the upper lobes, Rails, you're going to hear more in the lower lobes. Rails are kind of crackles in the small airways, and we think of fluid being in the lungs, like all the way down in those alveoli. So you hear that with fluid diseases, like congenital heart failure, where fluid's backing up. I said congenital. Congestive heart failure, excuse me, when fluid is backing up. And pneumonia. Pneumonia is a disease where we have lots of fluid building up in those alveoli. So that's why we hear the rails in the bases of the lungs, because it's in those smallest areas. Bronchi we hear up here because it's obstruction or fluid accumulating in those larger airways, those primary bronchi. So we hear that more with COPD. You can also hear it with pneumonia as well. So those are there are more lung sounds, of course, but these are the big four and the different types of things that cause them that I definitely think that you should know. All right, so now let's go through a few of the very important respiratory diseases for you to know for the NCLEX. Um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is a huge one. And I know you guys have probably heard of it, but we're going through it. It's actually a group of diseases that block airflow and make it really hard to breathe. Remember, we just looked at those uh, lung sounds. The bronchi is what we hear in COPD because we've got obstruction of those larger airways. Um, it includes diseases such as emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. Those are all considered obstructive pulmonary diseases, okay? Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The damage is not usually reversible. Once we have this chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it typically is there to stay and we just have to manage the symptoms. So if you see in the photo here, you see that healthy airway is nice and open. The mucosal layer is relatively thin and air can freely pass through that bronchi. Well, <clears throat> down here in an airway that has COPD, there's lots of inflammation, lots of mucus plugging up that airway. So our lumen is much more narrow and we're going to have turbulent airflow. And that obstruction is what causes all of that difficulty breathing and those signs and symptoms. Excuse me. <coughs> Talking for 10 hours will, will really get you. Um, different causes of COPD, smoking, air pollution, it is sometimes just genetic. And we tend to have a productive cough, lots of fatigue, lots of shortness of breath, discomfort and dyspnea, because it's just hard to move the air through the system. 
Um, there are a few different categories I want to go over that I just mentioned, those different types of um, obstructive pulmonary disease that we see. Emphysema is specifically the destruction of alveoli due to chronic inflammation. So we have less surface area of the alveoli available for that participation in gas exchange. When we destroy those alveoli, we destroy our, destroy our spot for gas exchange, and that really, really causes a lot of obstruction and discomfort. Now, chronic bronchitis is chronic inflammation, and there's also a productive cough with lots of lots of sputum. Chronic bronchitis is very uncomfortable, and that sputum really decreases the lumen where air can move through and causes that obstructive pulmonary disease. Lastly, asthma, a lot of people forget that that is an obstructive disease, but that's marked by both spasms in the bronchi of the lungs that cause difficulty to breathe and chronic inflammation of those bronchi and bronchioles. We also tend to have excess mucus. So there's lots of narrowing and plugging that make the airways obstructed and harder to get air through. That's what causes the characteristic wheezing of an asthma exacerbation. So no matter what category of obstructive pulmonary disease we have, assessment will look relatively similar. We're going to have a barrel chest after a long time, and that's a key word for COPD. So in our normal chest, you see the transverse diameter is longer than the AP diameter here. Transverse is side to side, AP anterior to posterior. In a barrel chest, this man has had COPD for many years, they're actually equal or the AP diameter is even a little bit greater. So it's more shaped like a barrel. And then um, in this person that has a normal um, transverse diameter is longer than their AP diameter. Because of all of the difficulty moving air through and the obstruction, we have accessory muscle use. I call all of these things work of breathing. There are retractions. We might be tugging. Our muscles pull in as we try to use everything we've got to breathe. Nasal flaring, a tracheal tug, where this skin right here actually pulls in as you try really hard to breathe. Very congested, all those lung sounds that we talked about, the rails, the ronchi, the wheezing, depending on the subcategory of COPD. We also have abnormal blood gases in these patients since they have a very difficult time moving air. They tend to be acidotic because they're retaining a large amount of CO2. And remember that CO2 is an acid. So if they're not blowing off all that CO2, they tend to become acidotic. That also means they're hypercarbic. They have too much um, carbon dioxide. And they do live pretty hypoxic because it's just difficult to have sufficient gas exchange in those alveoli and their oxygen levels tend to be low. So treatment wise, what can we do here? <clears throat> A big one is chest physiotherapy, chest PT. You can see in this little illustration that mom giving her little boy chest PT kind of Really, you're just banging on their back, you know, trying to move the secretions and get stuff out of their alveoli so that we can move it on out and increase the area available for gas exchange. We also want to encourage fluid intake. These, par these patients are typically dehydrated and they're uncomfortable and they're not taking enough fluid in. And you want to be careful with oxygen administration. Now, this is an important concept to remember for the NCLEX. In the normal patient, we're gonna have hypercarbia stimulating your body to breathe. A lot of people think it's when you're hypoxic, but it's not. Low oxygen levels tell your body nothing about if they should take a deep breath. It's when we accumulate CO2 and become hypercarbic that the brain says, oh, oh my gosh, I need some oxygen. <gasps> and it stimulates your body to breathe. But in the patient with COPD, they've chronically been hypercarbic for a long period of time. So hypercarbia is not going to be stimulating their respirators anymore. For them, hypoxia is now the driving force. When they have low oxygen levels, that makes them breathe. So if we give them too much oxygen, we're totally saturating them. They're 100%. Their body's like, oh, I'm not hypoxic. I'm good. I don't need to breathe. And they will go apneic on you. They will stop breathing. So you really want to be careful giving too much oxygen to your COPDers. Now, 
if they are super, super hypoxic for them, you want to know what their normal is, but they are below it. They're in the seventies. They're turning blue. It's not wrong to give them oxygen. You don't want your patient turning blue. I just said, be careful with the oxygen and don't overshoot it. Tricky. You got to walk that fine line there. We'll talk about a similar thing tomorrow with heart defects. Now, other treatment options are giving bronchodilators to open up their airways, corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation. There's a couple things we can teach them to do. We can encourage pursed lip breathing. That helps them totally breathe out all of the air, deflate the chest a little bit. And we want to encourage small, frequent meals instead of super big meals that distend their belly and kind of, you know, further um, increase, impede their ability to, to move their diaphragm and, and breathe appropriately. So Marisol asks, what's the appropriate flow level to give? That's an awesome question. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer because it depends on the patient. The flow level is talking about liters per minute of oxygen uh, of flow that we're pumping into their body. So we could be giving them 100% of FiO2 of oxygen level at one liter, at two liters, at three liters, up to like, I think I've given a patient like 50 liters. That's just how fast it's flowing into them. And that flow level will totally depend on the patient. How big are they? What's their physiology? How long have they had COPD? The older, bigger, and more chronic their disease is, the higher level of flow rate that they are going to need. And itty bitty baby, you might just need a couple liters. In 200 kilogram papa that's been a two pack a day smoker and had COPD for 20 years, you're going to need a lot more than two liters to really get him some oxygen. Same with the FiO2, whether you're at 21% room air or up to 100% FiO2 depends on the patient. Be very, very careful going up to that 100% FiO2 in your COPD year because that hypoxia is their driving force to breathe. That's really what I wanted to emphasize was the FiO2 and using your discretion and with the help of the physician and the respiratory therapist to not overdo it. So Rochelle asks, what about the mask use for oxygen delivery? That's perfectly fine. The method of administering it via nasal cannula or a face mask is fine if they need oxygen. It's just about the percentage of FiO2 that we're giving them. We don't want to give them too terribly much. And Mirasol asks, if the administration of oxygen does not improve, on what level will we report to the physician? So if administering oxygen to your COPD or does not help their respiratory status or help their desaturation, um, you want to immediately let the physician know. You don't want to sit around and wait and wait and wait. If you're putting oxygen on, oxygen is a drug that requires a, an order. So you want to go ahead and put that oxygen on your patient. You don't want to let them be desaturated to the 60s and 50s and, you know, oh, well, let me just go walk away and find the doctor. No, you want to put the oxygen on your patient, but then you need to immediately be calling the physician to notify them so they can come evaluate the patient, make a plan with you and order the um, oxygen. Because remember, oxygen is a drug. You can't just decide to give that without an order. Um, you can give it while a physician's on the way to save your patient though, okay? Um, and as a general rule, we're gonna toss, talk about this in test prep tomorrow. If you have a question and you have an answer choice that says administer oxygen, administer Lasix, whatever, 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 you can assume that you have an order for that. You don't need the answer choice to say, call the doctor for an order for oxygen. If you have, if it's in an answer choice, you have an order for it as far as test prep goes. Stacy asks, when giving meds, what do you give first, bronchodilators or corticosteroids? Great question. In my experience, we give bronchodilators first to really increase the diameter of that airway and try to get them some more flow before we then give corticosteroids. I will say a lot that are ordered pretty quickly. Um, I don't know that it would rapidly alter their course if you did bronchodilators versus corticosteroids first or second. They're going to be given 
pretty concurrently. Um, but in my experience, we are giving the bronchodilators pretty quickly. A lot of those are nebulized. So as you're giving the oxygen with a face mask, your respiratory therapist is putting that bronchodilator on. Uh, again, that might be different at different facilities. I doubt you would get an NCLEX question where it asked your priority and you had to choose between a bronchodilator and a corticosteroid. Your priority, if acutely desaturated, is to give them some oxygen with discretion and stabilize them before you make a plan. If you had a select all that apply that asked about appropriate interventions, all of these would absolutely be appropriate interventions. Awesome, awesome questions, guys. COPD is pretty complicated. It's, it's a chronic disease that has a lot of give and takes to kind of figure out. So good critical thinking, really thinking through those interventions. Next, I want to talk a little bit more about asthma specifically because we get so many Let's see if I change it to. What about now, guys? No. Oh, better. Yes. Now it's working. Weird. OK, so sorry, guys. I don't know why it just cut out for a minute. Again, I told you technology is not my fancy. So thanks for helping me out, friends. All right. Let's dive into asthma since we get so many asthma questions um, so that we can just fine tune our responses to this to make sure you guys get all these questions right. So again, it is a chronic pulmonary disease, um, but it's characterized by those spasms, the inflammation, and the excess mucus. So triple threat. Asthma really, really is a bummer. Um, and it's often the result of either an allergic reaction or hypersensitivity. So we see a lot of kiddos that have allergies, eczema, and asthma. They kind of get like a trifecta of all these hypersensitivity um, reactions. So let's go over the specific pathophysiology to asthma. Um, first, the airway is abnormally reactive, so heightened sensitivity. Two, trigger. Something causes a response for them, and we'll talk about all those triggers on the next slide. So something triggers them, and then we get inflammation, and then we get excess mucus, and then we get bronchospasm, and that decreases the airway diameter. So with all of that, inflammation, mucus, bronchospasm. Now our airway is obstructive. And after many, many asthma reactions, that airway remodeling starts to occur, which causes scarring and changes to the lung tissue. So it's a really chronic disease. And we have super serious um, symptoms that often require emergency room visits. So I said you have to have a trigger that causes this response. They're abnormally reactive, but we have to have a trigger is to help remember some of A for allergens. That might be seasonal, uh, like pollen, an animal, pet dander, a certain food, a peanut allergy. Um, and then S for asthma, um, S for sport or for smoking. So it could be an exercise intolerance. Uh, you know, they're running and they're unable to keep up. Or if there's a smoker in the house, even if they themselves don't smoke. T is for temperature change. So that's when the season changes, it gets cold, our asthma typically gets worse in the winter because that cold can cause more bronchospasm. 
H is for hazards. That's chemicals, different toxins, air pollution. If you have really bad asthma, some of those kiddos have to check the air quality on their weather app before they go outside because if they have a lot of air pollution, that can be a trigger. M is for microbes. So by that, I mean an infection. Um, any infection can uh, trigger and trigger an alert, um, an asthma um, reaction. And then A is for anxiety. When kids get really worked up or even adults that have asthma into their adult years, although it's much more common in pediatrics, that asthma can, that anxiety can end up triggering an asthma attack as well. I want to talk for a second about how we diagnose asthma. Hmm. It can be a little bit hard to diagnose <laughs> because how do you see the bronchospasm and the mucus plugging? How do you, see, you can hear the wheezing, but how do you know what's happening in there? So two different tools that we use to both kind of diagnose and evaluate asthma as we treat it. They're really helpful. And the NCLEX asks a lot about this peak flow meter. So I would make flashcards on these green, yellow, red down here. Spirometry is used to assess lung function and it measures how much air we inhale, we exhale, and really importantly for asthma, how fast we can exhale it. They usually do this once a year at first to diagnose and then yearly to assess kind of their progress and their response to treatment. And then the peak flow meter, that's something that we discharge patients home with and it evaluates the amount of air they can exhale in just one second. So they take forceful exhale, the biggest inhale that they can, and then in one second, total exhale. So we establish their baseline when they're in a healthy, good spot following their medication regimen. And then if they start to have an exacerbation, they can use this peak flow meter to establish where they are. So if they're at 80 to 100% of their personal best, they're in the green, they're good to go, they can go to school. If they're in the yellow, we want them to be careful. We might want them to use their rescue inhaler, make a PCP appointment, uh, be cautious, try again later after they've done some of their treatments. That's when you're 50 to 70% of your personal best in the yellow. Now, if you're in the red and only able to exhale less than 50% of your personal best, you need to call 911. That is an acute asthma exacerbation, and the patient is at risk of losing their airway. The thing that's happening is they're unable to forcefully exhale enough air, and their air is getting trapped in them, so they're not um, they're not ventilating. They're they're air trapping, and it's really hard to actually get oxygen out to their body, and their airway can totally close up. So assessment wise when they are in these acute, ex acute ex asthma exacerbations, they're very, very short of breath. They might be unable to speak, and one of your nursing assessments can be evaluating exactly how many words they can say before they have to take a breath. Are they speaking in complete sentences, or do they have to stop every couple words to take a breath? They have a cough, all of those increased work of breathing signs we talked about, the retractions, the tracheal tug, head bobbing is another one in kids where when they breathe, they're bobbing their head forward because they're trying to suck in air and they're using all of those muscles. The wheeze like we talked about, the prolonged expiration because they're air trapping, they can't get all the air out. Now, if you cannot hear any breath sounds, you are in trouble. That means there's complete obstruction. There's no movement of air. That patient needs to be intubated or an emergency tracheostomy needs to be completed ASAP to get air moving because they're losing time. Their airway is closed up and they're not getting any oxygen out to their tissues. So as if things weren't, weren't bad enough with that assessment, that's quite dismal. A complication of asthma that we have to talk about is status asthmaticus. This is an asthma attack that is not responding to our treatment. We're going to talk about our treatment on the next slide. If we've done all of the treatment things and they're not responding, we're in what's called status asthmaticus. It leads to very severe respiratory failure and it can progress to death if untreated. These patients usually end up intubated. And look at this poor baby. This is all the signs of respiratory distress, flared nostrils, retractions, both sternal and intracostal, um, super, super um, 
bad retractions there. You can see his chest totally tugging inward as he tries to struggle for a breath. It's very hard to watch um, when kids are in this state. They really need to be intubated. So we talked about how bad it looks. These asthma attacks really can get awful. So what do we do? Well, follow your priorities of airway, breathing, circulation. So number one, if that airway is obstructed and they don't have a path for airway, get them an airway, get them intubated. If they do have a patent airway, but they're struggling with the breathing, they're wheezing really bad, well, then we can focus on helping with that by giving beta adrenergics agonists to open the airway up, and that's albuterol. So Louis Dean asked, do we give albuterol first? Albuterol is absolutely going to be one of the first things you do for your asthma patient. You want to go through the ABCs. If they don't have an airway, getting them an airway is priority before albuterol. But if they do have a patent airway and they're struggling with their breathing because of the bronchospasm, then giving them that albuterol, which is a beta adrenergic agonist, to open that airway up is absolutely your first priority. So that opens the airway up. Corticosteroids, again, to reduce inflammation. Albuterol is going to be your priority in the asthma patient to kind of open that airway up, usually given via nebulization. Um, Irpetromium bromide is another type of nebulization treatment. It's also called Atrovent. It's sometimes in combination with albuterol, and we call that a duoneb. So a lot of patients will get a duoneb instead of albuterol, and it's, it just contains both. Um, another thing we can do is magnesium sulfate. We talked a little bit about this in farm that relaxes smooth muscles and helps with bronchodilation. And of course, for circulation, giving them oxygen administration to um, meet their oxygen demands is really important as well. But that comes third. First, get them an airway. Second, facilitate the movement of air so that they're breathing. And third, worry about their circulation. Oxygen falls under circulation. Really, you're going to be doing all of these things in tandem very quickly for an acute asthma exacerbation. The thing is, once you discharge your patient from the hospital after acute asthma exacerbations, we need to talk about their long-term control because this is a chronic disease. And then we had one more question going back to um, the uh, acute treatment. Marisol asked, can we give epinephrine instead of albuterol? No, we will not be giving epinephrine in the case of an acute asthma exacerbation. You want to give epinephrine for an allergic reaction. Um, albuterol is going to be your standard drug of choice for the asthma exacerbation. I have never given epinephrine to an asthmatic. So long-term control, um, you're going to look at medications and inhalers that these patients are going to take daily to help prevent these exacerbations. Inhaled corticosteroids like bunosamide and flucazone are very, very common. Um, Beta adrenergic agonists, like we talked about, the albuterol and the terbutaline that relax the smooth muscle and stop bronchospasm, they will almost always go home with an albuterol inhaler. That's going to be considered their rescue inhaler to take if they're um, needing some relief. Another thing is the leukotriene modifiers. We mentioned that Monte Lucas very briefly in farm. What it does is kind of block the leukotrienes, those white cells from overreacting to those triggers, from over-responding and having that hypersensitivity oh. reaction. So those are another medication that we take preventatively daily to try and help stop an acute exacerbation. And then lastly, one of the biggest educational points is allergen control. So um, why is this patient having so many exacerbations? Are they allergic to dust? Do we need to, minim to get rid of a pet? Um, do we need to clean out mold from a house? Is there a smoker in the home that needs to quit smoking? Any of those um, environmental factors where we can control triggers are really important for long-term control. So let's do an asthma question because I promise you're going to get at least one on the NCLEX. They really are quite prevalent. Here is a good practice one. This is not a select all the ply. You want to pick what is most concerning to you. What can kill your patient first from these options? Oh. 
Oh, good job, Susanna, Jan, Golda, Mirasol. Awesome, guys. Awesome. Man, I thought this was tricky, but I cannot fool you guys. Silent chest. Absolutely. I remember if you don't hear anything, no air is moving. So that is absolutely your most concern. Expiratory wheezing. That's concerning because they're having an asthma exacerbation, but they're moving some air. A cough. You're going to expect that in an asthma exacerbation. That's lower on the totem pole. And head bobbing. I mean, that's pretty bad. I think as a nursing student, I would have been confused between D and B because head bobbing is who they're really working to breathe. They're struggling. They're having a hard time, but they're breathing in silent chest. They're not moving air. So that is your number one concern. Really smart guys. Really smart. I have another NCLEX question here. I'm going to skip. We can come. I think that one's in the um, cumulative test in the end tomorrow. So I just want to make sure to get through all of our respiratory modules and we can do more and more questions tomorrow <clears throat> so ARDS is our next respiratory disorder that we want to go through acute respiratory distress syndrome what is that an acute condition characterized by bilateral pulmonary infiltrates and severe hypoxemia in the absence of cardiogenic pulmonary edema so that is just a complicated way of saying we have junk in both lungs, low oxygen levels, and there's not a cardiac reason for it. So something, the lungs are really, really sick for some reason. Healthy alveoli here are nice and empty and open for the gas exchange. In ours, they are full of fluid. They're unable to do gas exchange. The body is low on oxygen, hypoxemic. And we've got these bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. I want you to remember bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, underline that. That is a key word for ARDS. So let's talk about the exact pathophysiology here. We've got an inflammatory response in the lungs. There's injury to the capillary endothelium, basement membrane, in the interstitial space, and the alveolar epithelium. So lots and lots of damage in the pulmonary system. Something has just wrecked the lungs. And all of that damage causes the increased capillary membrane permeability, which means fluid is just pouring into those alveoli. And the alveoli should not have fluid in them. When there's fluid in them, we can't do gas exchange like we need to do. So all of those products of cell damage also form something called a hyaline membrane, um, which further prevents oxygen exchange. So we're full of fluid. We've got this membrane. Gas exchange is just down the toilet. We are not oxygenating. So we get respiratory acidosis, right? CO2 is building up and up more and more acid. We're acidotic. Uh, we're probably bumping a lactate at this point. And the damage to the lungs that's happening because of all of this cannot be reversed. So ARDS, super, super intense. You are in an ICU likely being put on a ventilator. Many patients get put on ECMO because of ARDS. Look at the comparison of these lungs. Healthy lungs over here, we see nice pulmonary markings, lots of open space for ventilation. The lungs of these ARDS patients are almost whited out. We can barely see any opaque spots. There is no room for ventilation. These lungs are very sick. And anything that causes an intense inflammatory reaction can end up causing ARDS. Um, a couple of you just asked it's, if it's okay to log out. Absolutely, of course. You're going to get these videos after tomorrow when we're done. So if you're just like done with me for the day and you need to check out, you need to go to an appointment, that is A-OK. -okay. You're going to get all of this content, all of these slides. I'll make extra sure that you guys know how to get them at any point in time. So if you need to check out, you check out. That is totally fine. I want you to grasp this content when you're ready for it. Okay, I'm gonna keep on trucking for those of us who are staying live for the long haul. Um, so anything that causes inflammatory reactions in the lungs can cause ARDS, sepsis, trauma, burns, aspiration pneumonia, an overdose, a near drowning event, we have inflammatory reaction. It goes into overdrive. We produce those inflammatory mediators. The cell membrane opens up. The alveoli fill with fluid. All of these things cascade. And then we end up with lungs that look like this. They're totally whited out. They are not participating in ventilation or perfusion or oxygenation. And this patient is really, really sick. So what do they look like? 
I told you, diffuse bilateral pulmonary infiltrates or white it out. That's what you're going to see on your chest x-ray. That's your buzzword if, you're, if the NCLEX gives you a, you know, you see bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, ARDS. ARDS is what I want you to think. Um, so it's just white it out like you saw. And they're going to be very hypoxic, which you're going to see all throughout their body. The major thing is low oxygen levels. Their oxygen is going to be very, 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 very low. And you're going to see that reflected mainly in their skin. Pale, cool, dusky, mottled. All of that, they're not getting enough oxygen to their skin. Treatment is pretty intense. And it's hard to really delineate because we've got to treat whatever underlying condition brought them to ours. Was it near drowning? Was it infection? Are they septic? Whatever that is, we need to treat that to really get them out of the woods. In the meantime, though, we've got to do something to heal these sick lungs. They're going to be intubated on mechanical ventilation with high PEEP. PEEP stands for peak end expiratory pressure. They're getting lots and lots of pressure forced into their lungs at the end of their expiration to really try and open those alveoli so that we can get some gas exchange going again. We also prone a lot of these patients. Proning them, like you see this man here on his belly, can really increase pulmonary blood flow and help get things moving again. It's incredible the changes you can see in some of these patients after they're prone. They're going to be um, intubated and mechanically ventilated for a long time, so we need to prevent infections. Ventilator-associated pneumonia is a common infection that we need to prevent, and prevent barotrauma. That's trauma caused by pressure. And that pressure is our peep. So it's a fine line because we need that peep. We need that end expiratory pressure to open their lungs up. But if we blow too hard, you can pop an alveoli open and really cause some trauma that's irreversible. So prevent the barotrauma, prevent the infections, and try to give those lungs time to heal. Like I said, a lot of these patients do end up on ECMO. ARDS is no joke. All right, last we're talking about pulmonary edema. So also very serious. What is pulmonary edema? Simply put, a buildup of fluid in the lungs due to blood backup in the pulmonary vasculature. So unhealthy alveoli, fluid backing up, fluid leaking into the lungs. Healthy over here, they're nice and clear. So similar situation like we had with ours. We do not want fluid in our alveoli and with pulmonary in there. Both blood pulmonary veins. There's increased, increased pressure in the pulmonary veins. Increased pressure causes the fluid to shift from the capillaries into the alveoli and into the interstitial space. Fluid starts to build up in those alveoli, impairs the gas exchange. And that leads to the hypoxia, the hypercarbia. The hypercarbia leads to the respiratory acidosis. So all of that to say, similar pathophysiology to ARD, when we have that fluid backing up in the alveoli, we end up in really bad shape. Causes can range from decreased cardiac output and heart failure. Remember, left heart failure, we see lung symptoms because that left ventricle isn't moving fluid forward. It's backing up in the lungs and we get the pulmonary edema. Also can be due to pulmonary hypertension. We'll talk about that more in our pediatric lectures because we typically see pulmonary hypertension in kids. But that can be really detrimental and cause pulmonary edema in any patient with really, really sick lungs. Their assessment will look relatively similar to that of a really sick pneumonia or really sick ARDS patients. They're going to be breathing quick, struggling to breathe, tachycardic, diaphoretic. You hear those adventitious lung sounds. Their lungs sound wet, you'll hear people say, because there is so much fluid backing up. They've got crackles, cough. Um, sometimes they even cough up like some pink tinged sputum because there's so much fluid building up in there. And their chest x-ray itself looks wet. You see how it's whited out like we had with that ORDS patient. Now with, um, with this, you do not have the bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. Pulmonary edema is more of a wet chest x-ray in general, not those bilateral infiltrates. That would be um, indicative of ORDS itself. 
So treatment wise, what can we do specifically for pulmonary edema? Well, we want to support their oxygenation. We can do that ranging from a nasal cannula or a face mask all the way up to positive pressure and intubation. Of course, you watch their ABGs to see how they're doing. You monitor their perfusion, their skin, their pulses, their cap refill. And then we give them medications to help get that fluid off. Diuretics are going to help remove excess fluid from the body. Nitroglycerin is going to vasodilate to decrease preload into the heart. We want to decrease the preload because we actually want less blood going in there. And ACE inhibitors are going to decrease the afterload to make it easier for the heart to pump blood out and clear up that backup in the lungs. All right. Next up, we have a pulmonary embolism. I know we talked about this very briefly in obstructive cardiogenic shock, but there's just a couple points that you really do need to know as far as respiratory goes. And that's specifically about chest tubes and positioning. Positioning is very important for new nurses, so we do have to talk about this. What is a pulmonary embolism? Life-threatening blood clot in the lungs. It can be caused by an embolism from a vein entering the lung or maybe a clot during surgery. Anything that causes a clot, if the clot goes to the lungs, we've got a PE. That clot decreases perfusion. That decrease in perfusion causes low oxygen, hypoxemia. And it can, in fact, lead to right heart failure if it obstructs the flow of blood from the right ventricle out into the lungs. We can end up in that obstructive cardiogenic shock. And the signs and symptoms we'll see with that are very acute. It's a very fast change when you have a PE. Very anxious, dyspnea, chest pain, hypoxic. They feel like impending doom because all of a sudden there's this big clot in their lungs stopping blood from moving forward. You'll heal rails. They'll be sweating. They might be coughing up blood due to this clot in their lungs. It's really rather dramatic and they are at risk for sudden death. So the thing that I need you to remember for the NCLEX 100% are these positioning nursing interventions. I know people get tripped up on this, so let's go over it carefully. Positioning. First, we'll do positioning. If there is a blood clot in the lungs, a pulmonary embolism, we want to position the patient in high Fowler's. That's going to promote maximum lung expansion and help them with their breathing. Now, the thing people get it confused with is the air embolism. Air embolisms are very rare. It's a horrible complication of a surgical procedure, and it can cause super, super serious harm and death. And it's the same concept as the blood, as the pulmonary embolism as far as a blood clot, but it's an air clot or a section of air that gets lodged in the lung instead. Um, so what you want um, to do if you have an air embolism, if you're removing a chest tube and get one, a central line placement, a surgery, if any of those things happen and you think you get an air embolism, you do something called Durant's maneuver, which is placing them in left lateral Trendelenburg, like you see this illustration over here. Left side, leaning head down for Trendelenburg. What that's gonna do is hopefully stop the air embolism from lodging into the lungs. Um, hopefully that's going to trap it in the right side of the heart until that air can dissipate and be reabsorbed by the body, which happens relatively quickly. But if we don't put them in left lateral Trendelenburg and that um, air embolism gets shot out of the right side of the heart into the lungs, it lodges in the lungs, then we have obstructive cardiogenic shock because it's really, really high pressures and it's hard to move blood forward, blah, 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 ends up being really serious. So that positioning is really, really key for the NCLEX, and I know it gets confusing because they're both emboli, but a blood clot is different from an air embolism. So you need to know what you're dealing with to know the positioning. Other interventions for blood clots are anticoagulants and thrombolytics, like um, uh, alt place or TPA to help bust up that clot and get it moving. All right, our last respiratory disease to go through, if you've noticed, we've kind of worked from upper airway all the way down to lower airway. We're at the lowest point where we are dealing with our alveoli, and that is pneumonia. So in pneumonia, 
we actually have inflammation of the lung affecting the alveoli, those tiny little sacs we've been talking about. And just like with ARDS and pulmonary edema, they're becoming full of pus and liquid. And by now you totally know that any alveoli filled with pus, liquid, or anything is not participating in gas exchange to the fullest and is having a really difficult time oxygenating our patient. Different causes of pneumonia depends on um, it's an infectious disease, usually a viral, which means it's caused by a virus like RSV, adeno, or influenza. It can also be bacterial, and then we would be putting our patient on antibiotics. It can be fungal. That's quite rare. It can be due to a chemical irritation, or it can be aspiration pneumonia. When foreign bodies like food or secretions end up entering the lungs, then we have inflammation and infection that also leads to pneumonia. Remember when I showed you that chest x-ray of the patient who had an NG tube accidentally inserted into the lungs? <sighs> that was a horrible case of aspiration pneumonia. Any foreign body in the lungs, definitely going to lead to an infection and pneumonia. We want to be really, really careful with that. So we can look at an x-ray again of that pneumonia. Look at how patchy and yucky that is. Patchy infiltrates is what we see in pneumonia. That's your buzzword for pneumonia, patchy infiltrates. We're also very likely going to do a sputum culture to identify if there's a bacterial source. So we're going to take that culture, send it off to the lab, see if any bacteria grow. Assessment wise for pneumonia, one thing that's really going to set it apart from ARDS or pulmonary edema is that high fever because this is infectious, especially if it's viral. Man, that fever is going to skyrocket. They'll still have a cough and be tachypnic, the crackles, the work of breathing, all the things that we've been talking about for these pulmonary diseases. But the high fever is definitely specific to pneumonia and treatment as well. Um, is really going to depend on how they're doing. We want to maintain, you know, ABC. So do they have a patent airway? If they don't, what do we need to do to get them a patent airway? Breathing, are they working really hard? Do they need support? Do they need some oxygen? Maintain their circulation. Are they dehydrated from being so tachypnic? Do they need IV fluids? We can also do the chest PT that you saw with the emphysema or the asthmatic. If they are due to an infectious cause, it needs to be in isolation. And we treat their symptoms. We give them Tylenol for their fever, Motrin for their pain, a cough suppressant to help with that irritating cough, expectorants to help get the mucus out, stop plugging up those alveoli. And if it is due to a bacterial cause, we need to get them on antibiotics ASAP to help clear that up. All right, let's do our last respiratory NCLEX question before we move on to neuro. We're going to take a break before neuro, though. You know the NCLEX loves to talk about teaching and what point. What point would you tell your patient? <sighs> I'm trying to awesome so fast. In general, you should be able to do these questions in one to two minutes. Remember, this is a timed test. If at first you're not there, don't worry. But with practice, hopefully you'll get quicker. Awesome job, guys. Ludine, Susanna, Marisol, Rochelle. Man, really, really awesome. Okay. Most of you got that one right. The answer is A and B. You want to encourage you drinking lots of water? And you want to make sure they know to take that full course of antibiotics, even if they start to feel better. We all know that's an important teaching point nowadays because a lot of people ignore that uh, advice. Um, C was calling for tan sputum. We're totally expecting that. It's normal. They're going to be expectorating some sputum, so they don't need to call. If that changes to like a green, it smells bad or something like that, they would need to call because that's suspicious for bacterial pneumonia and they might need to be started on antibiotics. And then for D, we really don't want to be giving ibuprofen if the child have, just has a fever. Um, it's... Plus or minus if it has some antipyretic properties, but we should encourage acetaminophen, which is the drug of choice for um, fevers in really, really anyone. 
Um, so that is that. All right. You guys are so close to the halfway through this course. We're going to take a break before we do our very, very last lecture of the day. Let's just take five minutes. Let's come back at 445, and that should get us out of here by 530 so that I have time to answer any questions from you guys, and hopefully you guys can log off early and get a good night's rest. So back at 445. Awesome work, everyone. And remember, if you need to take a break from me and log off, go ahead. This is recorded. You're going to get these slides. You're going to get these videos. If you need to just not hear me talk to you anymore today, I totally understand. I would also like to not hear me talk anymore today. So we'll be back in five, guys.
All right, guys. <clears throat> Are we ready? <clears throat> ready to go to neuro? So neuro just has about 40 slides. Hopefully we can get through that in about the next 45 minutes. Have plenty of times for any questions. And you guys can just go ahead and log on off early to get dinner. Relax with your families and have a good night rest <clears throat> before we finish this thing off tomorrow. So a few anatomy and physiology points to go over for neuro. This is another one where I think we don't talk about the A&P just as much as we should. So for neuro, we've got the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In the central, we've just got the brain and the spinal cord. So that's your, uh, your orangey color right here, right? Whoops. And then in the peripheral nervous system, we've got a whole bunch going on. We've got cranial nerves, spinal nerves, peripheral nerves out, all the way out here. And all of those nerves have both sensory and motor neurons. So very, very complex system here. So let's look at the CNS versus the PNS here. I think this drawing is so cool because it really shows you all of this fancy dancy stuff localized in the central nervous system. But then look how extensive the peripheral nervous system is out here in all every single nook and cranny of your body. You have these nerves and they are incredible. All of the things that they can do. So let's break the peripheral nervous system down even farther. Obviously, you know, CNS got the brain and spinal cord. OK, we'll talk more about that later. Central and peripheral. But peripheral, we have a lot of different categories to talk about. And the NCLEX really hits on these a lot. So it first divides into autonomic and somatic. The autonomic nervous system is what communicates with your internal organs and glands. That's I like to think about it as like automatic. Like it happens without us thinking about it. We don't control our autonomic nervous system. Our somatic nervous system, however, is what communicates with your sense organs, your voluntary muscles and things like that. So somatic, I think of like soma means body and we control that, you know? Oh, am I frozen still? Glory said I froze. Hopefully I'm still going. It looks like I'm going over here. You guys let me know if I'm not. Um, all right. So from there, both the autonomic and the somatic system branch off again. I told you this gets really complex. So for that autonomic nervous system, it communicates with the internal organs and glands. We have both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. And I know you guys have heard of sympathetic and parasympathetic, but it's important to know where it originates from up here. So that sympathetic is what drives us up. It's arousing. And that parasympathetic is what calms us down. In the somatic nervous system, remember, that's what we control. That's our sense organs, our voluntary muscles. We have both sensory and motor. So that's what sends out the signals and what receives the signals, the motor or the input and the output. So because we get so many questions about sympathetic versus parasympathetic, uh, we need to talk a little bit further about that. Sympathetic and parasympathetic right here, guys. First, let's go over all of the sympathetic systems. So remember, that is arousing. That brings you up. We have dilated pupils. It's, remember, fight or flight. So this is getting you ready to go. Dilated pupils. Um, we're not excreting saliva because we're, we're um, focusing on all the things you would need to fight or flight. You're going to relax the bronchi to open up your airways so we can get more air. Heartbeat going faster. We're not going to be doing any GI peristalsis or secretion. That's not the priority. Um, we're going to be stimulating glucose production and release, though, to get our sugar going, to get the energy to the cells that they need. Secreting epi and norepi, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Inhibiting bladder contraction because we don't need to be going to the bathroom right now. We're getting ready to fight. So that's sympathetic. Parasympathetic is exactly the opposite of all of this. Our pupils are constricted. We are stimulating saliva. Bronchi are constricting and we're slowing down our heartbeat. 
peristalsis and secretion is happening is happening we're resting and digesting Bile's being released to break down fat, bladders being contracted to eliminate urine, all of those rest and digest functions. So that's parasympathetic. Now, the other thing I want to talk about, that's kind of the nervous system breakdown here and there as far as gross anatomy. The other thing is looking on a smaller scale at how impulses are transmitted and neurotransmitters, because that plays a huge role in pretty much all the diseases that we're going to talk about. So first we have the neuron body. That's right here, that sending neuron. And we get an impulse going down its axon right here, that long little uh, thread that's you know sending it from nerve to nerve. Right here is the terminal of our axon. So we're gonna zoom in on that. Here's the, termo, the terminal of our axon. And this cleft between axons, between synapses, or between uh, ax um, um, axon terminals is our synapse, our synaptic cleft. And this is where the magic happens. This is where neurotransmitters go from one place to another, from neuron to neuron. And that's how our nervous system communicates and sends things around to us. So neurotransmitters are released from one and then re-uptook and collected by the next neuron to pass their signals on. I have another picture coming up here because I think this is just so phenomenal how it happens and so intricate. So what we've got, um, the vesicles right there, there's the synapse, the receptors, and the neurotransmitters in the middle. And I think this picture just so shows so well how those neurotransmitters fly over the clefts and go into the next neuron to transmit their signals. That is how our nervous system works at a gross level. So we need to also talk about a couple of different parameters and how those will be affected in our nervous system so that we're ready to talk about our different diseases. Intracranial pressure is first and foremost the most important thing to talk about when it comes to um, neurology and the diseases of neurological organs. So intracranial pressure, very simply, what is it and what is normal? It's the pressure inside the, col the skull. Intracranial, inside the cranium, pressure. Very straightforward. Our normal is 5 to 15. So um, that's another flashcard for you. Put it with your normal lab values and therapeutic drug levels. ICP 5 to 15 is where we want it. Now, there's an important physiological principle here that I'm sure you guys remember, the Monroe, Monroe Kelly hypothesis. So this states that the skull is a rigid container and it is filled with blood, brain, and CSF, three components. If any one of those three things are to go up, something else has to go down because it's a rigid container. So anytime one of those three things goes up, um, it forces the others down and it causes that increase in ICP. So it could be a tumor, which is basically an increase in brain mass. It could be bleeding, an increase in blood. Hydrocephalus, an increase in CSF fluid. Edema, another increase in either CSF fluid or brain if those cells are really swelling up and causing cerebral edema. All of those can cause increased intracranial pressure. And what are the signs and symptoms going to be? Here's a little picture to show you guys what these symptoms are going to look like. Well, we're going to have changes in level of consciousness. That is always the first thing you want to think about when you think neuro. What is happening to our level of consciousness? Seizures, headaches, changes in their vital signs, vomiting, um, when you have an infant and they have those fontanelles, you might be able to feel it bulge and their head circumference might increase. They also have a very high pitched cry, which is very typical of a neuro baby with increased ICP. Uh, they might have some changing motor function, posturing. Their eyes might have papilledema, pupillary changes. All of these things happen to some degree when we have increasing IC ICP based on how severe the ICP is. ICP affects our other parameter when we talk about neurological changes, which is cerebral perfusion pressure. 
Cerebral perfusion pressure is very simply put the amount of pressure available for perfusion to the brain. We calculate it based off the blood pressure and the ICP. CPP equals MAP minus ICP. So pressure in the body minus pressure in the head is how much pressure we have available to perfuse the brain. We want that to be greater than 70. That's another flashcard for you, CPP greater than 70. If it's less than 70, there is simply not enough blood flow going to the brain. So those are all the parameters to think about when we move forward to talk about the different logical diseases. We're going to start off with neurological injuries. That is super, super common in our emergency departments. One of the major things that we see in car wrecks, in children being admitted after traumas, are these neurological injuries. And there's some really important points to talk about. So for skull injuries, we can have an open fracture where we've torn the dura on top and you can actually see brain matter, or we can have a closed fracture where that remains intact. A specific type of skull fracture that you'll need to remember is a basilar skull fracture. So the fracture on the basilar bone at the base of the skull. And there's a few specific signs and symptoms that you need to know. Battle sign is bruising over the mastoid process behind the ear, like you see right here. Raccoon eyes is this periorbital bruising around the eyes. And those both indicate bleeding inside the skull at the base, showing a basilar skull fracture. The other thing is you'll want to monitor for cerebral spinal fluid in the nose. So rhinorrhea that's running out that looks kind of clearish and that you think could be CSF, you want to test for CSF. Um, you can do that two ways. You can do the halo test. You drop a little bit of that CSF onto a white piece of paper. And if it gets a little rim, a little halo around it like that, that is the CSF separating out from the blood. So that's positive for cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid will also be positive for glucose. So you can do a glucose test to see how high the sugar is. One very important nursing action the NCLEX loves to ask about is inserting an NG tube in a patient with a basal or skull fracture. That is a no-no, and I'm going to show you why in this x-ray on the next slide. So if we have a basal or skull fracture, right about here, we've got an opening into the brain. You can see it right here in this x-ray. So we insert the NG tube into the nose, and guess what? It can go into that basal or skull fracture and actually enter the brain. That can cause very serious damage and is obviously not something that we want. So with a basal or skull fracture, never an NG, you can place an OG tube, an orogastric tube, which is exactly the same as an NG. You just put it in the mouth instead of the nose. All right, so that's it for fractures. Now we have a couple types of hematomas to talk about. First, we'll talk about an epidural hematoma. This is also called talk and die syndrome. It happens when there's a rupture to the middle meningeal artery, and it's a very fast bleed under high pressure. This green right here you can see is the dura, and the epidural bleed is happening above the dura, epidural hematoma. So typically, somebody is injured, hit their head, they lose consciousness, and then they wake up. And then on the way to the ED, they're talking, they're fine, their body's compensating. Everyone's like, oh, okay, he's good to go. They get to the ED, their body's unable to compensate anymore, and then we start to see neuro changes. They might get agitated, they might get restless, their pupils might dilate or be unequal bilaterally, and then all of a sudden, unconscious. That's why we call it talk and die syndrome because they seem to be fine and then all of a sudden they're not and treatment here is a burr hole so we want to actually drill a hole in the skull to allow that pressure to release um, reduce their icp and hopefully preserve neurological function so this little characteristic injury loss of consciousness recover is what is characteristic story for the epidural hematoma 
Now, your other type of hematoma is called a subdural hematoma. And that's the blue over here that's below the dura. That's a venous bleed, so it's much slower. There's not as much pressure. And it's commonly seen in chronic geriatric patients. They have a little tumble, bump their head. They get a small bleed, but at first, it doesn't seem like anything. And over time, it gets worse and worse, and they start to see neurological changes. By that time, it's a pretty substantial bleed, and we usually need to do a craniotomy to relieve the pressure. So that's subdural hematoma. It is important to be able to differentiate between the two. Epidural, arterial, subdural is venous. So next we'll talk about strokes, another very common thing in our geriatric population. And I think it's important to define a stroke for you. So a stroke is a disease that affects the arteries leading to and within the brain. It's actually the fifth leading cause of death and disability in the U.S. And it occurs when a blood vessel that's carrying oxygen and other nutrients to the brain gets blocked or it bursts. So that's the two different types of strokes. Hemorrhagic is when it bursts. Ischemic is when it clots off. Either way, somehow there's a lack of oxygen to the brain causing ischemic damage. It's the equivalent of a heart attack to the brain. So let's look at the pathophysiology, both hemorrhagic and ischemic. For a hemorrhagic stroke, I told you that's when a vessel ruptures, blood starts to accumulate, it increases pressure in the brain, and um, that causes the, uh, the decreased level of consciousness, all the neuro changes, and eventual ischemia to the brain tissue. Um, it can be caused by a lot of things. Number one, hypertension. Rupture vessel is weakened over time. You can have an amnurism. Um, and the typical statement that you hear people say when that vessel ruptured is worst headache of my life. So if somebody ever gives you that phrase, you do need to take it seriously, get a CT immediately so that you can evaluate for a stroke. The other type of stroke, ischemia, also causes a lack of oxygen, but it's due to a blood clot. So there's a loss of blood circulating to that specific area which causes neurodeficits specific to that part of the brain, of course. So our assessment is going to be dependent on where either the hemorrhage or the clot is occurring, but the typical assessment findings that you really want to remember are fast. The facial droop, you can see this guy over here's facial droop. Arm drift, they put both arms up and one inadvertently drifts down. Speech problems, they're slurring, they're not making a lot of sense. And last, the T is for time. You need to call 911 ASAP. Time is brain cells. Every minute that goes, there's brain cells dying is function that could have been lost. Let's go through, through some other specific signs that can be um, indicative of a stroke. Aphasia, that's speech difficulty. It could be either expressive where they can understand what you're saying, but they're, it's really hard for them to express what they want to communicate. Or that can be receptive aphasia, where they can tell you what they want just fine, but they are not understanding either spoken and or written words. And then with global aphasia, global aphasia, you're actually losing both expressive and receptive language. Next, we have apraxia, which is the inability to perform physical tasks. So like they don't remember how to comb their hair or brush their teeth. And those just, they know what they want to do, but the neuromotor connection is, is lost. Uh, they might have a loss of vision, like um, unequally dilated pupils. Hemaniopia, which is blindness in just one half of a visual field. And dysphagia is very typical of our stroke patients. They have a really difficult time swallowing, and they are therefore at really, really high risk of aspiration. So we'll need an SLP consult before we put them on a diet order. Here's another mnemonic of these fast face, arm, speech, time. You want to educate patients about this so that we can try to get patients here and to interventional radiology to get that plot out or address that hemorrhage just as quick as we can. Now, what is our treatment options? I just alluded to getting them to the cath or um, to IR if it was an ischemic stroke. So let's talk about that first. Um, if it's ischemic and we have a clot um, blocking perfusion to the brain, our first line therapy is going to be TPA to try and break up that clot and restore blood flow. 
but it has to be done really quickly. Uh, door to TPA needs to be 60 minutes or less. If it's longer than that, we've missed our timeline for efficacy and we can't give TPA. Um, the other option is percutaneous thrombectomy. So when I said get the patient to IR, that was what I meant. Go to interventional radiology so they can do, it's similar to a PCI that we talked about for an MI. They're going to snake a catheter through the femoral artery up to that clot and suck it out. So surgical removal of that clot to restore perfusion to the brain. Another strategy that we'll use is permissive hypertension. So we'll allow the patient to be slightly hypertensive to make sure we're getting good blood flow up to that brain. We typically at every facility have timeline goals about how quickly we want to get patients to something. As soon as they prevent, present with stroke-like symptoms, we want to get them to a doctor in 10 minutes, determine their last known normal, and call a stroke code within about 15 minutes. We want to get them into the CT scanner within about half an hour and get them TPA within 60 minutes. The faster we do this, the better response we have, the more function they gain back, and overall better for the patient. For a hemorrhagic stroke, it is going to be managed differently. We can't take them to IR and pull out the clot. They're hemorrhaging, not clotting. So what we need to do instead is get that bleeding under control. If it's caused by an aneurysm rupturing, a weakened vessel that's burst, they can coil or clip it, either an IR or the operating room. And that's just um, kind of sealing off that vessel and stopping the hemorrhage. If it's bad enough, they might need to do a craniotomy, open their skull up and relieve that pressure. And they might need to put an EVD, an external ventricular drain, where we actually put a tube into the ventricle and allow the fluid to drain out into a collection reservoir to reduce their ICP level. So lots of stroke info. Let's do, uh, let's do a quick stroke question before we move to our next neuro topic. Here's a, here's a stroke question. You guys are doing great. We've only got um, less than 20 slides to go. So we're definitely gonna be able to finish up early. You guys are troopers. Awesome. Gay Susanna, good job. Yes, Kamchana, that's right. Mary Saul got it. Louis Dean. You guys are rocking it today. So you guys were right. A, B, and C. Those are your right answers. Awesome, Golda. So let's talk about why. So according to the AHA, what our immediate general assessment and stabilization should, should include is assessing those ABCs and vital signs, giving them oxygen if they need it, getting an IV, checking their glucose if they're hypoglycemic, treating that, performing an essential neuro screen, and activating the stroke team. That means we're going to order a CT or an MRI right away. We're going to get an ECG. It's all part of that stroke code protocol. So they, we try to do that within 10 minutes of the arrival. Obviously, that requires a major team effort. And yes, Jocelyn, so we always check a sugar because hypoglycemia can mimic the signs and symptoms of a stroke. So we want to rule out a hypoglycemic episode before we're taking them to IR and snaking a catheter up to their brain. Of course, hypoglycemia is a little easier to manage. Um, so we're deciding whether or not to give TPA based on the results of that CT, the last known normal, and if the pr provider determines that there's no hemorrhage. If there's any hemorrhage, TPA is obviously contraindicated because we're already bleeding, so we don't need to further cause any anticoagulation. Um, so yeah, excellent job. You definitely will get some stroke questions. Again, a really high priority for patient um, for hospital like satisfaction is getting those timelines in. So the NCLEX likes to uh, ask a question or two on TPA or stroke management. Uh, so seizures is up next. Seizures are complicated. And what exactly even are they? They're not a disease themselves. They're a symptom of an underlying disorder. So a lot of people think of epilepsy. 
um, as being seizures, but they're not one in the same. There's lots of disorders that can cause a seizure. Remember, we talked about hyponatremia at the very beginning of today, like nine hours ago, um, and said that um, sodium levels less than 125 could put the patient at risk for seizures. So it's a symptom, not a disease itself. Epilepsy, the technical definition here, is a neurological disorder marked by sudden recurrent episodes of sensory disturbance, loss of consciousness or convulsions associated with abnormal electrical activity in the brain, and very important here, there is no other underlying disorder. So when there's recurrent seizures and no other way to explain it, then we have a definition of epilepsy, epilepsy, excuse me. But seizures in themselves can be a symptom of many, many things. And there's tons of types of seizures. We have partial and general. So partial is limited to just one area of the brain, whereas general, you're going to get the whole brain involved. It's not focal. With partial, we can have either simple or complex partial. When we have a simple partial, the patient doesn't lose consciousness. When we have a complex partial, we can impair, we have impaired consciousness, and it could be they're just confused. It could be totally non-responsive. So a wide range for those complex partial seizures. Now for generalized, it could be many things. It could be tonic-clonic, which is those phases of tonicity and spasm. It could be myoclonic, which are just sudden and brief contractions of groups of muscles. We could even have absent seizures where there is a loss of consciousness and they're staring off into space. Those can be really hard to recognize, especially with kids. Their teachers might just think they're daydreaming a lot in class and really they're having seizures. So and there's tons more than this, but these are the ones you need to know for the NCLEX. You don't need to be a seizure and um, a seizure expert to ace your NCLEX. You just need to know the general terminology, partial, generalized, simple, complex, et cetera. Um, and mainly you need to know the nursing interventions and um, protective measures for seizures. Let's talk more about treatments. We talked about anticonvulsants in farm. You've got those rapid acting like lorazepam, Ativan, and then you've got the longer acting like phenytoin that we talked about. Phenytoin is likely going to be prescribed daily or multiple times a day to get them to that therapeutic level of 10 to 20. And they're going to be on that for a long period of time to prevent seizures. And then if they have an acute seizure that lasts longer than five minutes, or has vital sign changes, they're going to get a rescue dose of this lorazepam to help depress the CNS and stop that seizure. So very important to monitor those therapeutic levels of their phenytoin and never, ever, ever stop taking any anticonvulsant suddenly because that drop in level absolutely can cause a very, very dangerous seizure. Now, the number one thing I want you to remember for the NCLEX seizure-wise are the seizure precautions. This is super important for your safety questions. So let's go through your checklist. You should always have oxygen and suction available and working at the bedside. Available and working is a key word. I can't tell you how many times I've come into an emergency working with the Children's Resource Unit, and they've been you know, trying to set up suction in the middle of a seizure, and this guy is on the side having secretions and choking on his vomit and afterwards I'm like why didn't you already have suction and he said well I saw it was set up but I didn't check that it was working and it wasn't working so check that it's working it doesn't take that long always check that it's working you do want to provide privacy you want to put those side rails up and you want them padded so that if they flop around on the bed they don't hit their head and hurt themselves you want them side lying so that they don't throw up and aspirate. Um, you want a pillow under their head so if they're thrashing and hitting their head, it's padded. And you want the bed in the lowest position just in case they somehow fall. It's the lowest fall possible. You also want to loosen their clothing so nothing is tight and constricting them. Cords and stuff should be out of the bed. Any object that could hurt them should be out of harm's way. They should always be in an empty bed. Nothing sharp or hard around that they could hit themselves on. Those are your basics. You really, really need to memorize those precautions. And, you know, just have common sense when you get that um, NCLEX question about what to do for your seizure patient. Don't put anything in their mouth. Don't stick your hands in there. No tongue block. That's 
that's been out of practice for a very long time. Um, so just, just use your common sense. Don't let them aspirate and keep them safe and never leave your patient while they're having a seizure. You can call for somebody else to bring you out of bed. You want to stay by their side and keep them safe. Have somebody call the doc, et cetera, but never choose an option that means leaving an unstable patient. If they're seizing, they're unstable. So let's do an NCLEX question, question practicing that because I think you're definitely going to get one. I know they show up all the time. Good job, Susanna. That's right. Awesome, Ludine. Good job, hey. Good job, Kamana. Awesome, everyone. So <clears throat> this is an example of a not question. So you're seeing you're they want you to identify which nursing interventions are not appropriate. So things that you would not do for your patient. So if you don't read carefully, it can be really easy to accidentally pick the interventions that you would actually do. So read carefully and B and Z were correct. So padded side rails should remain up while they sleep. They can have a seizure while they sleep. And if you lower those side rails, they might be able to fall out. Um, four point restraints, that was D. That is not necessary for the seizing patient. It could actually really injure them. If they're restrained down in seizing, they could pull on it and actually really hurt themselves. Restra seizures are not an indication for restraints. A, C, and E, um, ensuring the side rails are padded, removing sharp objects, um, wearing a falls wrist bracelet, all appropriate interventions that you would do. So they were incorrect answers. Really good jobs to those who got that right. Good job carefully reading the question. Always make sure you answer what the question is asking. Okay, guys, just one or two more to go. We've got spinal cord injuries to talk about next. Remember, we talked about spinal cord injuries very, very briefly um, when we discussed distributive shock because a spinal cord injury can cause distributive shock. Um, so what is exactly a spinal cord injury? It's damage to the spinal cord that causes permanent changes in strength, sensation, and other body functions, all below the site of injury. So what signs and symptoms we see are super going to depend on where the injury happens. Symptoms totally depend on the location, and the higher up it goes, the more function you lose. So all the way up here for your cervical nerves, if you have injury up here, everything below goes. Thoracic here, lumbar here, sacrum here, coccyx here. So the lower the better in the case of spinal cord injuries. Anything above T6 at this level right here, we need to monitor for this funky complication called autonomic dysreflexia. Hopefully you've heard of this before. This is a fan favorite for NCLEX test question writers um, because what it is is a syndrome that occurs with spinal cord injuries above T6 where there is sudden severe hypertension. So it's one of those things that can kill your patient. So the NCLEX wants you to know about it. What happens is we have irritation below the point of the spinal cord injury. So maybe it's an overfull bladder. Maybe it's a cold draft in the room on that part of the spine. And it sends nerve signals up the spine. Those nerve signals are blocked at the, spite, at the site of the spinal cord injury. So say we've got it at L3, we have an overfull bladder. It sends those signals up. Well, at, a, at T3, those nerve signals get blocked and the blood vessels tighten and blood pressure shoots sky high. So that's where we get the sudden and severe hypertension. Then the brain sends signals to lower the blood pressure because it's like, whoa, this is hypertensive. But all of those signals get blocked by the spinal cord injury going down. So they start sweating. They have a severe headache. Their nose gets stuffy, they're flushed, their vision blurs from this acute severe hypertension. They're really anxious because it feels so horrible. And it's really, really, really hard to control. So really almost any stimulation, anything below that level of their spinal cord injury can put them at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. 
a blister on the foot, being dehydrated, an impaction, a broken bone, a UTI, full, full bladder, a pressure injury, getting really anxious, clothes that are really tight. If their socks are on too tight, their belt, their shoelaces are tied too tight. Any of those stimuli can cause that impulse to go up, get blocked at the site of the spinal cord injury and shoot the blood pressure through the roof, which is really, really, really dangerous for these patients because it's hard to get it back down. So treatment is going to be revolved around trying to control that blood pressure. You want to sit the patient up and help lower their blood pressure. Find whatever the cause is in order to do that. Is their bladder full? Cath them. Are they constipated? Remove the impaction. If they have a pressure injury, get them off of it. There's a painful stimuli going on, remove whatever that is. Loosen the belt, untie the shoes, change the temperature in the room if it's too cold. And if any, if none of that is working, you're treating the cause, they're sitting up, their blood pressure's not coming down, hydralazine is going to be the drug of choice for an antihypertensive and autonomic dysreflexia. Hydralazine is an arterial vasodilator that works almost instantly to help drop that blood pressure. So we don't like to give hydralazine. We don't have to, but this is one of those emergency cases where we'll have to, because if we stay in that hypertensive crisis for too long, it can cause other horrible things like a hemorrhagic stroke. So we don't want that to happen. So make sure to watch out for that. Your spinal cord injury patients, it's one of those weird off asides that the NCLEX loves to ask about. Last topic for today, guys, we're going to talk about meningitis. That'll wrap up the major neuro points that I want you to know. So meningitis is inflammation of the spinal cord or brain. It can be viral or bacterial, but our bacterial meningitis is far more dangerous. And the assessment findings that you need to remember for the NCLEX are nuchal rigidity and photophobia. So really tight neck pain and eyes really hurting when you're in light. They're also going to have a fever, be sleepy, vomiting, joint pain, a rash, could even have seizures, but a lot of those aren't specific. We've talked about those with tons of different disorders today. Nuchal rigidity and photophobia are very specific to meningitis, and if a patient comes in with those symptoms, you are going to be working them up for meningitis very quickly. If we discover they have meningitis, which is diagnosed with a lumbar puncture to see if there are bacteria in the cerebrospinal fluid, then we need to proceed with treatment. Steroids to decrease the inflammation along their spinal cord, analgesics to reduce the pain, antibiotics if it is bacterial in nature. If our lumbar puncture doesn't show us bacteria, if we're suspecting a viral infection, antibiotics will do absolutely no good. So only if it's bacterial. We definitely need isolation precautions. If it's just viral, um, contact is okay. But for bacterial, if you even have a smidge of suspicion that it's a bacterial meningitis, they need to be on drop of precautions because it is very, very contagious and it's a medical emergency. So immediately put them on droplet precautions. And if any healthcare employee has been in contact with them, you got to let them know. You got to let them know so they can go get worked up and self monitor to make sure they don't have it. So contagious. And then the other key thing for you to know about meningitis that they love to ask about is prevention. Now that we have the Hib vaccine, hemophilia influenza B, it is so much less common for us to see meningitis. We recommend getting that vaccine for anybody living in close quarters. So a common time is when um, kids are going off to college and they're going to live in the dorms. They're in close quarters, they're at higher risk, and we often go ahead and give that Hib vaccine. Incidence is way decreased, and one of the best educational points you can do when teaching people about how to prevent meningitis is recommending that Hib vaccine. So those are those are your buzzwords. Those are your must-know NCLEX topics for cardiac, respiratory, and neuro. You did it. Day one is done, guys. Oh almost exactly 30 minutes early. I know this is an incredibly long day. Those of you who are still hanging with us are such troopers. Just remember that if you didn't get something the first time, you're going to get these videos and you can watch them as many times as you need. I highly recommend going over those areas that you need more help on 
over and over until you can teach it to a friend confidently yourself. Just to review where to find these slides, if you guys go over in your GoToWebinar panel, um, you should have a little drop down that says handouts. And we have four handouts in there. The first is the syllabus. Then you have um, the outline of the entire course. And then you have um, a cumulative test and the test with the answers. Oh, oh, the, yeah, the, hand, the hands out is all of the slides, rapid prep handouts. So it's super duper long. I think it's like 300 pages. Save it as a PDF to your computer so you can take notes on it. Print out the parts that you really need help with so you can jot down um, notes and highlight and all of that good stuff. I always have a better time writing. So if you are somewhere where you can print that out, print it out, but at least save it so that you have all of these slides for the future in case you didn't catch any of this, in case you need to review. All right, tomorrow we're jumping back in at 8 a.m. Central Time. We're gonna start with GI and GU. The way tomorrow will work is we'll lecture for about 50 minutes We'll go through a system and then we'll take a 10 minute break. So we'll do GIGU, we'll do HEMID, integumentary, endo is gonna be in two parts, we'll break in between, we'll have musculoskeletal, and then we'll break for lunch, and that is the end of part two. That's system by system. When we come back from lunch, we're gonna go through specialties. So we'll do mental health, we'll break, we'll do OB, we'll break, we'll do PEDS in two parts. We have a lot to talk about for PEDS. And then lastly, we'll quickly do oncology. There's not too much specialty oncology knowledge that you need, just a general amount. Um, we'll finish that up about 4.30 or 5. And from there, we'll spend the rest of the evening on prioritization, delegation, and test strategies, going over how to read these questions and get them right every time. With any remaining time, we'll do a cumulative NCLEX test at your own pace. You've got the questions and the answers, and I'll be here live to review those questions with you and help you think through the rationale so that you can practice getting them right. Don't worry, we're gonna go over all that tomorrow. I just wanna know what you have in store. So thank you so, so much for bearing with me. Have a great rest of your evening, um, and we'll see you back here at 8 a.m. Central Time. Good night, guys.